Neyse o ya. Bize link, bize linki göndersin Rıcası. Ee, o şeyin içinde var. Ha, tamam anladım. Sa one two three. Hey, 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 uh, say, uh, 
Hey, bir, iki, se.
4, B2, 4 açıldı. Merhaba, B2, 4. Günaydın. Duyuyorum ben.
Günaydın. Günaydınlar. Good morning. Good morning. I wish a very, very good morning to you all. And please allow me to declare the regional conference open. Mr. Ebu Bekir gives the guitar, the Honorable Deputy Minister of Agriculture and Forestry of the Republic of Turkey. Mr. Sadi Karimzoda, Honorable Minister of Agriculture for the Republic of Tajikistan. Honorable FAO Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for Europe and Central Asia, Mr. Vladimir Rahmanin. Honorable Secretary General for the Economic Cooperation Organization, Mr. Ambassador Husra Nuzuri. Honorable First Minister for Agriculture of Kyrgyz Republic, Mr. Nudin Sharif. Honorable Deputy Minister for Agriculture of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Mr. Tabavik. Honorable Deputy Minister for Agriculture and Environmental Protection of Turkmenistan, Mr. Bekmurat Atayu. Honorable FAO Representative in Turkey and Sub-Regional Coordinator for Central Asia, Mr. Vyaral Gutu. Dear press members, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all and greet you all deeply. My name is Delara Kochak. I am a dietitian and I am the volunteering supporter of FAO and Save Your Food campaign. And it is my pleasure to address you all on the occasion of regional conference on food loss and waste reduction in Europe and Central Asia, enabling the change, jointly organized by FAO, the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of the Republic of Turkey, and Economic Cooperation Organization Regional Coordination Center for Food Security, with the support of the Ministry of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality of the Netherlands under the FAO Turkey Partnership Program on Food and Agriculture, funded by the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of the Republic of Turkey. So I welcome you all to this regional conference organized jointly by these distinguished agencies and organizations. Food loss and waste affects the whole world, not just the Central Asia. And around the globe, we know that 820 million people are going hungry. They are com combating hunger every year globally. However, on the other side, food continues to be lost and wasted, placing a great burden on our environment, economy, and society. The recent Food Waste Index report by the United Nations Environment Report revealed that nearly 931 million tons of food were wasted globally in 2019, a striking figure. FAO has been working to address the problem of food loss and waste at all levels involving various stakeholders and partners. Today, we have been gathered together here to examine and discuss the existing best practices and solutions to food loss and waste, as well as the obstacles on the way to progress. Distinguished, we're going to have distinguished speakers and panelists. The experience and success stories that our distinguished speakers and panelists will share will be invaluable and will inspire the present experts, practitioners, and decision makers to advance and scale up their efforts in preventing and reducing food loss and waste. The conference will focus on identifying essential elements of enabling environment and tools, including legislative and business innovations, foodless and waste reduction strategies, and practical interventions that support the transition to sustainable food value chains. The conference will last for two days with five panel sessions 
and an innovations demo session and two panel discussions, allowing us to explore a broad spectrum of recent developments and challenges in the field of food loss and waste in Central Asia and, and Europe, and offering opportunities for interactive exchange of experience and explore potential solutions. Now, for the opening of the conference, let me invite to the floor His Excellency Mr. Ebu Bekir Gizigada, Deputy Minister of Agriculture and Forestry of the Republic of Turkey. The floor is yours, Mr. Deputy Minister. Thank you indeed. Distinguished Ministers, Distinguished Secretary General, Distinguished Assistant Director General of FAO, Distinguished Representatives and Officials, Ladies and Gentlemen, we have been gathered together on the Regional Conference on Foodless and Waste Reduction. And I am absolutely delighted to be here on this occasion, on this occasion today. Because of the pandemic, we have been putting off this conference in the last two years, and I am I am so much delighted to see you in Istanbul on the occasion of this very important conference. Professor Dr. Rahid Kirishchi, Mr. Minister, His Excellency, sent his best wishes to you all. At the outset of my speech, I'd like to thank everybody who has made an effort in organizing this regional conference. I'd like to extend my thanks to Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. I'd like to thank ECHO RCCFS. I'd like to thank the Ministry of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality of the Netherlands. And I'd like to thank all the officials of the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of the Republic of Turkey. I extend my gratitude to all. We are in Istanbul today, distinguished guests. And we are so much delighted to host you in this ancient city of civilizations of Istanbul. Istanbul and food and grain. These are the topics of discussion recently. And we, it is so much meaningful that we are in Istanbul today, considering all those topics of discussions recently. Under the leadership of His Excellency, President of the Republic of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, we have been trying to contribute to the solution of the problem involving grain because of the regional conflict in Ukraine. You know, Turkey took a very important initiative. And in Istanbul, in the city of peace, which is combining con continents, an important, an important transportation grain center was established. And, and the impacts of this conflict, regional conflict on the food supply chains has been alleviated thanks to the mediatory efforts of the Republic of Turkey. And this Black Sea grain corridor hopefully will pave the way for a permanent ceasefire in the future. And Istanbul will be the hub of peace, hopefully, for that. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, very important discussions will take place during the technical panels and, and sessions. We have representatives from the public organizations, private organizations, NGOs, academia. All the speakers and panelists and, and participants will, will have a say in those discussions. And the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of the Republic of Turkey attains the greatest importance to the reduction of food loss, loss and waste. In 2008, we, we started this campaign for the prevention of bread waste. And thanks to the awareness that we have created during this campaign in Turkey, we taught people how to buy um, bread, buy bread as much as they need. And there's this bread campaign has been so much successful, setting an example for the rest of campaigns around the globe. We believe that this has been a very nice and good example, which can set an example for the future campaigns around the globe. Uh, during our presidency of G20 in 2015, in Rome headquarters of FAO, Thanks to our initiative, a technical platform for the reduction and prevention and monitoring of food loss and waste has been established. And in 2018, 
we came together with all the actors of the food supply chain uh, with an approach of 360 degree. So we set out with FAO in order to adopt this 360 degree approach. We started with a TCP, a small project. We sent out all our field level people to the field to take a, s a screenshot of the food, and food loss and waste situation on the field. Then we listened to the opinions of the private sector, NGOs, and public sector. Then we looked at the good practices around the globe, and we drafted, we drafted lots of documents after consulting with 150 stakeholders. And after all these efforts, two years ago, we came up with the strategy and action plan on the reduction, prevention, and monitoring of food loss and waste in Turkey in collaboration with FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And we were advised of the fact that raising awareness was so much important when it comes to reduction of food loss and waste. This is why we designed the National Save Your Food, Your Actions Matter campaign. And we had common wisdom and common sense in all 100 actions that went into the strategy and action plan. And we made progress in almost 60% of the actions that went into the action plan and strategy. And there, there are actions about agricultural food, outdoor outlets, and food banking, and recycling, recovery of food, redistribution of food. And all those actions got the support of the people greatly. And our ministry collaborated with the local governments as well in order to cover Turkey with the visuals of this national campaign called Save Your Food. This way, we try to teach people to buy as much as they need, not to bin their feature, not to throw away their feature into the dustbin. And we also collaborated with the Ministry of National Education of the Republic of Turkey. There is this EBA TV. It is an e-school, electronic school. Uh, project, uh, uh, school TV actually. So in EBA, EBA TV, we reached out to the students. We taught students, explained students how to become a hero of, of food loss and waste reduction. And we also produced this cartoon with the mascot, which is called Jano. And we had lots of activity books that we drafted for the students. And we made use of the social media to a great extent to reach out to almost half the population in Turkey. And we reached out to retailers, Horeca sector, and every actor which can contribute to the reduction of food loss and waste. We drafted lots of guidelines uh, for the retailers, for, for the consumers, and for everybody who has a, uh, has a role in the food supply chain. And we had gleaning activities, harvesting activities, in order to collect those those crops which remained after the harvest on the field. And when we were doing all of these, we had sensitive and aware citizens who supported us to a great extent. And we had also shops and supermarkets who had a big role to play in this campaign. They sold their products at the discounted rates, for example, and they distributed our brochures to their consumers. And I like to extend my thanks and appreciation to everybody that contributed to the successful implementation of the Save Your Food campaign. When we set out for this campaign, we were always advised of the, of the fact that everybody should take ownership of this national campaign, not just the ministry. This is why we were inclusive uh, in our approach. So let me put it that way. According to the analysis conducted around the country in the households, and we saved $80 million in one year in the households. And uh, we increased the number of people who started to conduct planned shopping. And we had many more people in Turkey who were aware of how to conserve food. And we also made awareness, created awareness, when it comes to difference between best before date and use by date. The awareness in this respect has increased by 20% among the consumers. And and this way, people could could learn that they could still consume food after uh, until best before date. And also, people were planning their portions in a wrongful way, and they were wasting their food because of wrongful planning of their portions. And we also uh, reduced this wrongful portioning from 22% to 13%. 
And when it comes to composting, the number of people who were resorting to composting increased from 3% to 6% as a result of the awareness raising campaign that we have implemented. So when it comes to composting uh, specifically, uh, we, had two we have two times more people who are resorting to composting nowadays. And hopefully the numbers will go up with our collaboration with the local campaign, local governments. And every one out of four people are aware of our campaign. This is so much important. And 93% of the people who are aware of this campaign think that this campaign has been significant and important. And 83% of them say that they are paying more attention to reducing food loss and waste after this campaign. And we have broken two Guinness World Record thanks to this campaign. And there was this pledging activity or pledging sub campaign under our national campaign. And lots of people pledged that they would be they would be shopping consciously and they would not be wasting their food. And we made a first in this respect. Uh, Seven hundred and ninety thousand people made a pledge going online in the internet website that is that is called sofranashaipchik.com. And for the first time in the area of environmental sustainability, we got the, we broke the record with the highest number of pledges. And we also broke the record of the highest number of pledge for a campaign with a number of 881,000 people. We have set out with FAO, and we will continue to work with FAO. FAO is supporting us and complementing our work with technical speciality and expertise. And FAO is also contributing to increase visibility for us in the international arena. And Turkey is a donor in this regional uh, in, in this regional event, and lots of activities are taking place in this project in the Central Asian countries. And we have been transferring experience of Turkey to the countries of the Central Asia. And we are following up closely with the developments in the literature. So we are learning about good practices in the literature and also from the international conferences that we attend. And we are trying to implement those good practices in Turkey. We are, try we are also trying to disseminate knowledge and information around the globe on each occasion that we attend. We are telling about our national Save Your Food campaign to everybody uh, in each meeting and occasion that we attend. But we will not get relaxed and we will continue to work successfully, hopefully. We will continue to do awareness raising activities and we will focus more on food banking from now on and food literacy and also livestock feed. We will continue to focus more extensively on these areas. Concluding my remarks, I like to welcome once again uh, the distinguished ministers, deputy ministers, the secretary general of ECHO and the chair of the Agricultural Committee of the Parliament. He is not, he's not here today, but he is supporting us greatly. And I'd like to also thank uh, the Assistant Director General of FAO and Regional Representative for Europe and Central Asia. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you all once again. And let me say, save your food, your actions matter. By the, by the way, by the way, taking the opportunity, let me say that back in 2010, 2011, there was this, these times that we witnessed. You would remember those times in Somalia, in Africa, there was famine back then. And, and small children, they were seeking food in the animal, animal, animal menu, I have to say. We have seen pictures of that back then. Why am I telling this to you? Because back then, some statistics were announced. And we were sad at hearing those statistics. Statistics were saying that we can end hunger with we can end hunger, the, the statistics were saying. And statistics were also saying that we can, we can accommodate the needs of women, the disabled, the children. Actually, we can do. We can do something for the poor, for the hungry people. But we need to be mindful of the reality that the world is bigger than the five. This is why Turkey has been 
has been making the slogan, using the slogan that the world is bigger than the five. Turkey has been hosting m m some five million guests, f five million refugees and migrants. But as Turkey, we're not just feeding those people, those refugees and people under temporary protection. We are serving them in every sector possible. They're no different than the Turkish citizens in Turkey, I have to say. And taking the opportunity, let me make reference to an important text. The text, it also appears in the holy book. It says, eat, drink, but do not waste. This is a statement from the holy book as well. And this, this statement is so much in line with the, with the spirit of the conference today. And you know, justice and injustice particularly brings about waste and waste brings about injustice this is also this is also from a turkish poem po poet the poet also says well the poet says in, in the end, the, the, the poet, poet says there is inequality around the globe that we need to stop. And I wish all the, all the success to you all during this conference. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister, for this very nice speech. Save your food, your actions matter project has been so much successful in the last couple of years and we have made all of us have made so much effort and we are so much happy at hearing you appreciating the project miss ashik is also with us she would appreciate what i'm saying we have worked a lot for this project may i invite to the floor now mr ambassador husran noziri secretary general of echo very kindly to the floor Thank you very much, sir, for being with us today. The floor is yours. Honorable Chairman, distinguished uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed uh, a privilege and pleasure for me to attend this significant regional conference on food, sec on food loss and waste reduction in Europe and Central Asia. Uh, let me extend my sincere gratitude to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of the Republic of Turkey, Ministry of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality of Netherlands, and Economic Cooperation Organization, Regional Coordination Center for Food Security for hosting this important event in the beautiful city of Istanbul and for inviting contribution of the Economic Cooperation Organization to this August event. Distinguished uh, participants, food security characterized as access to safe and sufficient food is affected by economic crisis, driven by conflicts, extreme climate related events such as historic multi-season droughts and floods, economic shocks including the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on livelihoods, incomes, and food prices, and multitude of other threats to human, animal, and crop health, the food secu security outlook for 2022 and beyond is green. This is compounded by the war in Ukraine, which is further exacerbating this already dire situation. I note with grave concern that the newly released 2022 global report on food crisis indicates that number of people facing food insecurity greatly increased from 135 million in 2019 to 193 million in 2021 in 53 countries most in need of assistance and that nearly 40 million people across 36 countries experienced emergency levels of acute food insecurity just one step away from famine. At this point, I would like to underline the importance of the United Nations Black Sea Grain Initiative, an unprecedented agreement on the resumption of Ukrainian great grain exports via the Black Sea, which was signed here in Istanbul, 
thanks to mediation of His Excellency Recep Tayyip Erdogan, Honorable President of the Republic of Turkey. This agreement is a significant step to overcome the global food crisis. In light of the mentioned circumstances, food loss and waste make the current situation worse. The, the fact and substantial amounts of food are produced but not consumed by humans has substantial negative impacts from environmental, social, and economic aspects. According to the UNEP Food Waste Index Report 2021, around 931 million tons of food waste were generated in 2019, 61% of which came from households, 26% from, from food service, and 13% from retail. This indicates that around 17% of total global food production may be waste, including 11% in households, 5% in food service, and 2% in retail. Estimates indicate that 8 to 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions are associated with food that is not consumed. It means that greenhouse gases have been emitted and the land, water, and energy resources, labor, and capital used in the production of food have been wasted for no reason. Food waste also burdens waste management systems, exacerbates food insecurity, making it a major contributor to the three planetary crises of climate change, nature, and biodiversity loss, as well as pollution and waste. Food loss and waste undermine the sustainability of our food systems. The food systems cannot be resilient if are not sustainable, hence it needs to focus on the adoption of integrated approaches designed to reduce food loss and waste. Actions are required globally and locally to maximize the use of produced food. The introduction of technologies, innovative solutions, including e-commerce platforms for marketing, investments in training, better food packaging, and relaxing on re re regulations and standards, redistributing safe surplus food to those in need through food banks, shorter value chains through farmers markets and rural urban linkages, investing more to strengthen infrastructure and logistics, including sustainable cold chains and cooling technologies are key to implementing this transformative change. Food waste reduction offers multifaceted wins for people and planet, such as improving food security, addressing climate change, saving money, and reducing pressures on land, water, biodiversity, and waste management systems. Successfully tackling food loss and waste means increasing the availability and access to food, reducing the environmental footprint of agriculture and shifting towards more sustainable patterns of production and consumption as per the Sustainable Development Goal 12. Distinguished delegates, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals is our blueprint to tackle the root causes of hunger and malnutrition, from conflict to climate shocks to inequality and poverty, Reducing food loss and waste is crucial to achieving zero hunger worldwide and achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, especially SDG 2 and SDG 12. Target 12.3 uh, calls for halving per capita global food waste and at retail and consumer levels by 2030, as well as reducing food losses along the production and supply chain. Economic Cooperation Organization as a regional intergovernmental organization is hence committed to the Sustainable Development Goal to Zero Hunger, the accomplishment of which will lead to greater food security, health, and welfare. Given the magnitude of the above mentioned problems, and while acknowledging that the improvement of the situation globally and regionally requires pervasive and multifaceted action at all levels, ECO Secretariat, in cooperation with ECO Regional Coordination Center for Food Security and FAO, updated and adapted the ECO Regional Program for Food Security according to
to the post-pandemic situation during the seventh ECO ministerial meeting on agriculture held on July 6th in Tashkent and will accordingly make its utmost to facilitate moving towards the implementation stage aimed at improving and enhancing ECO member states' resilience to future shocks and ensuring food security. Moreover, at this high-level meeting, honorable ministers agreed to enhance the institutional capacity of Regional Coordination Center for Food Security, deciding to make it a self-sufficient ECO institution or specialized body. This center will serve as a crucial instrument for the food security of our region. Dear participants, the post-pandemic conditions require strengthened regional and global cooperation. With eight years left to reach targets of sustainable development goals, there is an urgent need to accelerate action to ensure food security and reduce food loss and waste. Exchanging relevant experiences among countries, especially good practices and innovations, for example, in packing, labeling, and marketing, should contribute to the design of global and regional strategies and mechanisms aid aimed at reducing food loss and waste. I am confident that greater collaboration amongst countries, regional and international organizations will lead us to successfully secure our shared objective for sustainable development of the agriculture sector. To conclude, my remarks, I would like to express my firm belief that your active engagement and brainstorming will un undoubtedly contribute to the overall success of this event. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, His Excellency, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Naziri, thanks a lot. And now, Your Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for Europe and Central Asia, Mr. Vladimir Rahmanin. You are kindly invited to the floor to give your remarks, please. Good morning. Dear colleagues, uh, it's really my honor and pleasure to be here and to contribute to this important event. Dear Minister Karimzada, dear Deputy Minister Ebebeker Kilzegider, dear Secretary General of Economic Cooperation Organization, dear Deputy Ministers from Central Asian countries, thank you all for coming and thank you all for joining us at this important discussion. For me, it is an honor and a pleasure to address this distinguished audience. Director General F of FAO, something is not working, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Do you want me to repeat? <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> Thank you very much, I should stay closer, yeah. Uh, Director General, it's important moment when I start to, when everybody start to hear me. Uh, Director General of Food and Agriculture Organization is following our work. He sent his best greetings and instructed me to bring the conclusions of the conference to his attention. Allow me to express my gratitude to our honorable partners in this event. The Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of the Republic of Turkey, the Economic Cooperation Organization and its Regional Coordination Center for Food Security, in the Ministry of Agriculture, Nature, and Food Quality of the Netherlands for their support in organizing the conference and commend their continuous efforts and commitment to fight food loss and waste in Europe and Central Asia. Food loss and waste has become an issue of major concern and it squanders natural resources, water, soil, energy, not to mention human labor and time. Food loss and waste has become an issue for all of us. It contributes to climate change and undermines the sustainability of our food systems. 
And at the meeting last year, at Sustainable Food Summit uh, meeting, it was discussed and emphasized that sustainable food systems is the key to food security in the future. Food loss and waste is also an ethical problem which shall not be tolerated. An estimated 3.1 billion people worldwide do not have access to a healthy diet and some 828 million people go hungry. Food loss and waste disproportionately affects high value perishable foods needed for healthy diet, thus contributing to malnutrition that affects one in three people globally. Actions are required at national, regional, and global levels to maximize the use of food we produce. The introduction of technologies, innovative solutions, new ways of working, and good practices to manage food quality and reduce food loss and waste are key to implementing the transformative change. However, we need to remember that we have only eight years left to implement sustainable development goals targets. So there is an urgent need to accelerate action. Coming together today provides a timely opportunity to take stock of existing good practices, discuss challenges, hindering the progress towards food loss and waste reduction, and explore new solutions. Realizing and enhancing the positive impacts of reducing food loss and waste requires good governance and all players working together in a coherent way. Policy makers shall create an enabling environment, including appropriate regulatory mechanisms where stakeholders in food system internalize the need to reduce food loss and waste and have the tools to change the way in which food is handled for greater efficiency and sustainability and are incentivized to act. The private sector shall play the key role in developing adequate infrastructure and technologies, applying innovative practices and novel marketing channels so that resources are used more efficiently and with social and environmental responsibility. The engagement of all actors along the food value chain will nurture partnerships and enable full-scale action, thereby generating greater impact. With a mandate to, defend, to defeat hunger and achieve food security and good nutrition for all, FAO's leadership role in the area of food loss and waste gives convening power to support the coordinated action needed for impact. FAO is leading the way in generating data on food loss. This kind of evidence is needed to inform policy and decision making and trigger action. With the data, FAO supports countries in formulating strategies and developing capacity to reduce food loss and waste, as well as establishing partnerships and coalitions to achieve targets at a national level. In Turkey, FAO, in collaboration with the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry, have developed a national strategy on prevention, reduction, and monitoring of food loss and waste and an action plan. Minister Kizli Gider was informing us about impressive action taken in Turkey in this regard. And what is important, it was an inclusive process. It was not that the government was instructing what to do. It was coming from the ground, from the grassroots, and embracing the most efficient practices. Very much commended. I also want to add he here that Turkey is a strong supporter of peace and multilateral diplomacy. I learned it from my personal experiences, and I'm very proud to be a partner with the Republic of Turkey and the Ministry of Agriculture as a regional representative of FAO. We very much praise Turkish efforts to achieve peace on all levels. As FAO, we have a so strong partnership with Turkey. Turkey became the member of FAO in 1948. But it is interesting to know that this year, Turkey, is, Turkey and FAO are celebrating 40th anniversary of FAO representation in Turkey and 15th anniversary of subregional 
FAO office working from Turkey. This partnership brings results. FAO is strong by its members, and Turkey is one of the strong supporters of our work for the benefit of all of us, regionally and uh, globally. We are also working in the region of Europe and Central Asia, and we are learning from experiences in this region. And I hope that lessons we learned today and practices we shared in these two days will have a global impact on this important topic of reduction of food loss and waste. In conclusion, I would like to encourage all present here to step up the efforts and work together to reduce food loss and waste for the benefit of people and our planet. Let me wish you all an inspiring and fruitful event. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz Sayın Thank you very much Mr. Rahmanin and distinguished guests. Now the, the Republic of Tajikistan Minister of Agriculture Mr. Sadi Karim Soda is going to take the place to deliver his remarks. Welcome sir, His Excellency, the floor is yours. Добрый день. Good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I am very happy to be present here. It's an honor for me to be here at this regional conference on food loss and waste reduction in Europe and Central Asia. Thank you. Uh, very much to the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of Turkey, to FAO and other organizers of this meeting that are very uh, necessary. According to FAO, three billion people uh, do not have access to proper nutrition. 150 million suffer from hunger, but one billion ton of food is wasted in the world. It is so much we can feed 1.2 billion people with this food. As we see, lack of nutrition, undernutrition is the reason for suffering for three billions of people. So it's quite a big portion of the world population. Besides, it leads to the climate change, to droughts and floods, and reduction of the agricultural harvest, which leads to the food insecurity. Food loss and waste uh, can be observed everywhere, starting from the agricultural system, then in the hotels, restaurants, restaurants in our house, and even we can see it with our own eyes today in the morning in the restaurant where we had breakfast. Uh, as I have already said, the global population is growing, and to satisfy the food needs, we need to introduce a new perspective species of agricultural crops, innovations in order to reduce food loss and waste. And that's why today we have to focus on the key uh, reasons of food loss and waste and thus we can economize the resources, and resources is something that we are losing. So we lose and waste food. We also lose and waste energy, water, earth, capital, human resources. And one of the SDG aims 
is food loss and waste by a reduction by 2030. We can see a great example of Turkey that we have to study and introduce in, our, in other countries. And for today, this issue has become global. So I wish you a fruitful meeting and wish you finding solutions to this crucial problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, His Excellency Mr. Sade Karimisada and distinguished guests. Once again, I'd like to extend my thanks for the valuable opening remarks. And now we're going to give a very short break for five minutes. And now we're going to start with the first technical session of our conference. Uh, 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 in fact, the, uh, those who delivered the opening uh, speeches, the uh, uh, ministers and deputy ministers, Mr. Nazari, Mr. Kizigidar, Mr. Rahman, and Mr. Ali Sherif, Mr. Atayev, and Mr. Gutu. You're all kindly invited to, for a family picture, and then later on there will be the round table meeting next door. So you are kindly invited to take uh, uh, the stage and then go to the next door. Well, uh, in fact, uh, uh, by the way, we will be sharing uh, our Awareness Day video for uh, the year 2022. Thank you very much. Please. The climate change. Today, our agri-food systems are broken. Hunger, food insecurity, obesity, and undernourishment are rising. And yet, the way we produce and consume food is resulting in high rates of food loss and waste. Every year, around 14% of the world's food is lost after harvest and in the distribution chain prior to retail. And an additional 17% of food available to consumers is wasted. Food loss and waste account for 8 to 10% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. In a number of countries, the food supply chain is on course to overtake farming and land use as the largest contributor of greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is generated at every step of the food supply system, from production to handling, transportation, storage, and distribution, regardless of whether the food produced is consumed or not, leaving a significant carbon footprint. In particular, the rotting of food waste in landfills and open dumps is adding considerably to greenhouse gas emissions. Each year producing around 49 million tons of methane, this is a potent greenhouse gas that has 84 times the warming power of carbon dioxide over a 20-year period. Greenhouse gases contribute to an unstable climate prone to drastic environmental change and extreme weather events. These unstable climate conditions negatively impact crop yields, reduce the nutritional quality of crops, disrupt supply chains, and threaten food security. But the impacts of food loss and waste extend beyond this. Across the world, around 3.1 billion people cannot access a healthy diet, and an estimated 828 million people go hungry every day, while the food they need is lost or wasted. Truly resilient agri-food systems must be able to anticipate, prevent, adapt, and transform in the face of any disruption, protecting food security, livelihoods, and nutrition for all. Reducing food loss and waste plays a key role in transforming agri-food systems. It can improve productivity and ensure natural resources are used more efficiently, contributing to economic growth and benefiting society as a whole. It can increase food availability and access, protect the income of farmers and smallholders, and contribute to improving dietary quality. Reducing food loss and waste can also help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's one of the most impactful climate solutions we have today. Everyone can contribute to reducing food loss and waste. Let's all work together to reduce food loss and waste and strengthen every food system for better protection, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life for all.
distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, we're still in the morning. Uh, so welcome to the regional conference on food loss and waste, enabling the change. As you know, this conference has been convened to address common barriers to progress towards food loss and waste reduction in order to identify the necessary enabling conditions and to examine the solutions to food loss and waste. Food loss and weight is a significant problem, as you all know, and we are going to discuss today what we can do to eliminate the loss and waste of large quantities of edible food. Only together we can find solutions to create a better future with improved food security, nutrition and livelihoods for all, not to leave anyone behind. Before I ask our dearest moderators to begin the first session, I would like to remind also to our online participants who are waiting for us in Zoom some housekeeping rules, which means some hips and tips uh, for better online engagement and interaction. So, dearest online participants, on your screens, in your chat boxes, you will see some hits and tips, some housekeeping rules for a better online experience. So, please follow these carefully and apply them while asking questions uh, inside the room, Zoom. So, before I, will, before I give the floor to our moderator, Mr. Robert Van Otterdijk, to take the floor and guide us through the day, I would like to announce the speakers for the first session, which is entitled Creating an Enabling Environment, Policy Legal Framework, National Strategy and Investment. Uh, in this session, we will be together with Luciana Delgado, Senior Research Analyst at International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI. Ms. Margaret Vidar, Legal Officer at FAO. Anne Morgasan, Team Leader, EU Platform on Food Losses and Food Waste, Farm to Fork Strategy. Margaret Wagen, Agricultural Counselor for Turkey at Ministry of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality of the Netherlands. Sam Strong Snyder, Program Manager on Food Loss and Waste Prevention at Wagen Indian Food, a bio-based research. Ms. Zeynep Özkan, Head of Department of European Union Harmonization and Gdanu Koru Campaign Coordinator at Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of Turkey. And finally, Lieke Verhofstadt, Business Development, Global Business Development at Rabobank on Food and Agri Networks. So, dearest Robert, uh, please take the floor and guide us through the first session. Thank you all. Thank you, Roshin. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Maarten and um, uh, Luciana and uh, Zeynep to uh, take the seat here on the, on the stage for this session. All right, sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this session, the first session, uh, is intended to offer a comprehensive review of legal and policy frameworks that support the improvement of food loss and waste management by creating a conducive environment for relevant stakeholders to act, including revising legislation and policies covering agricultural development, uh, waste management, regulation of food donation and food redistribution, food and feed safety and quality fiscal incentives, as well as the responsibilities of the various public and private institutions overseeing these areas. So we have a very full agenda and we are already uh, delayed significantly. And uh, therefore I would like to ask the speakers, uh, of course, what we always ask to keep to the time that uh, has been assigned to you. And I would also like to say that in order to uh, gain back some time, we uh, decided, at least for, for the, the first uh, sessions today, to skip the question and answer uh, sessions that are um, allocated 15 minutes after each session. But instead, we would encourage everybody to submit their questions they have on the Slack platform, which, for which you have been received the, the link or in the, the Zoom chat, uh, if you are participating online, or any other way that you 
um, uh, would be able to, to submit the questions to us, even in, in writing on a piece of paper to me, that would be okay. Then we will look at it and we will provide the answers uh, in due time or so. Then, now I would like to ask uh, uh, Ms. Luciana Delgado, Senior Research Analyst at the International Food Policy Research Institute, to take the floor and provide the first presentation. Luciana, thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, Excellencies, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I want to thank the organizers uh, for the kind invitation. Uh, my presentation uh, will focus on gaining efficiencies in the agri-food system by reducing food losses across the value chain. So, look, why this topic is so important? Uh, it's because we have a triple win. So, it will improve food security and nutrition. Uh, it will improve productivity and economic growth. And it will reduce the use of natural resources and also reduce the greenhouse gas uh, emissions, especially methane, because when food is lost, uh, we are not only lo we are, um, losing emissions that were invested in the production. Uh, and also when food is uh, waste uh, and destroyed, we produce more methane emissions. So there has been a lot of efforts to try to bring awareness on the topic uh, of food losses. The first effort was the idea that there was one third of the food that was produced uh, lost or waste that was estimated by FAO. Uh, but there has been other efforts by other uh, agencies. Uh, but what we know today in terms of the SDE indicators is that there is a, a food loss index developed by FAO that measures losses and <clears throat> goes from on farm post harvest until the uh, wholesaler. And there is a food waste index that was developed by UNEP, uh, which measures waste that goes from the retailer uh, to the final consumer. And up to today, both of the indexes are ready and available. So now why the definition is so important? Uh, because on, in many of the papers that we have looked up, and we have done a several literature review, uh, there is a huge confusion on how to define what is loss and what is waste. And normally, we interchange and mix them. So FAO in the SOFA of 2019 came with a very uh, clear definition, which is depicted in this uh, graph. Um, and the definition said that food losses goes from uh, on-farm post-harvest up to the processing and packaging, including the wholesaler. And food waste uh, goes from the retail to the final consumption. But of course, uh, it's also important to extend this definition and capture also the losses at harvest and at pre-harvest. So now if we, hope, if we focus on the food loss index, uh, if you recall, I said that there were uh, two indexes, the food loss index and food waste index, and my presentation is focused on food losses. Uh, the number calculated by FAO uh, is 13.8%, and here I show the distribution by commodity and by region. So what is important to understand is that uh, by commodity, the level of losses varies, but also by region. Um, so if we look at uh, the losses by type of commodity, uh, roots, tubers, and oil bearing crops uh, have the highest level of losses, followed by fruits and vegetables. And at the regional level, estimates range from 5 to 6% in Australia and New Zealand to 20 to 1% in Central and Southern Asia. Uh, now, the aggregate number that FAO produced is a macro number. Uh, and, it's aggregate, and this aggregate number is based on a model they display and based on a literate review. Uh, but it's important also to improve over that work on more intensive uh, measuring or, or where the losses occur across the value chain. So what we have done at IFPRI is to try to measure and bring a micro measurement strategy to be able to identify across the value chain where the losses occur, uh, to identify what are the reasons of what is the causes of the losses, and also to be able to see what is the best way to capture these numbers? In that purpose, uh, what we did is uh, we calculate and compare the traditional way of collecting the information of losses, which is basically the subjective uh, self-reporting of the aggregate losses, versus a more disaggregate way of measure losses, which we call the attribute method and other two methods. So what we found is that uh, most of the losses occur at the producer level. As you can see, this is the green bar of the graph. And at the wholesaler and at the middleman level, the losses are smaller. 
And this is really important because it will help us to understand uh, how to target the interventions of losses. So, and of course, if you look at the methodology, uh, which we have piloted in several countries and several commodities, and already uh, we are working with FAO to expand it, uh, <clears throat> this also helps us to identify the reasons uh, of losses. So, for example, if we look at, at the reasons at pre-harvest, we have identified that the major reason in most of the commodities are linked uh, to pest and diseases, which is the light brown bar, and also linked to, to the lack of rain, which is the, the green bar. Uh, so when we look at the reasons for left in the field uh, for the produce that have not been harvested for several reasons, we identify that the major problem, which is the orange uh, bar, is a poor harvest technique that doesn't allow us uh, to bring the product to the market. And the second element is essentially the lack of costly labor, which is the dark uh, green bar. So the producers uh, prefer to leave the product in the field uh, and, and, and don't go to the market. So, for example, uh, in the potato market in Peru, if the price goes too low, the producer decides to leave the good quality product in the field uh, because it's more expensive to harvest and transport to the market than the price that they are going to receive. Uh, finally, when we look at the reasons at post-harvest, uh, what we found is that uh, mostly labor damage at the different stages, and this can be fixed by building capacity. Uh, but it's important to see also that the pink bar uh, shows the losses at the storage. So as initially stated, uh, they were three wins. Uh, one is uh, more production and the other is more productivity. But there was also the gain of using the natural resources more efficiently. And food losses and wasting food impacts the current and future availability of these uh, increasing scarce resources like water, land, uh, energy, and labor and capital especially today that we are facing a significant challenges uh, because of the crisis that we are living in terms of higher prices, it's essential uh, we use our resources in an efficient way. So now, also it's important to understand uh, where the reduction should occur and where, the, where there would be the major benefit for the, for the producers or, and where would be the major benefits for the consumers. So if we look where to tackle losses, uh, we can do it at the production level, at the post-harvest, at processing, at wholesaler and or at the consumption level. So what this graph is trying to show is that depending on where we do the interventions, the effects could be different for the, uh, could be different. So for example, if the intervention uh, are being done at the producer level, we will see that will be lower prices because there would be more uh, food that before was lost and that would be benefit the consumers. But if the intervention is done at the consumer level, we will see that the demand shrinks, the production falls, and this will affect uh, the income of the producers. And as I mentioned, uh, also there would be impacts on the, environment, on the environmental side. And here I'm depicting by region how many tons of CO2 equivalent per ton of maize is being, uh, reduced by interventions to reduce food losses. And as you can see, uh, the major returns are at the consumption level. Why? Uh, because the, pro the product have already crossed all the value chain and have arrived to the consumption. Um, so as I have explained, uh, first we have a problem of accurate information and there are major efforts uh, going, like the one I show that we are working and there are many other efforts. But uh, we need to scale up this effort so that we can make the aggregate number compatible with the aggregate uh, micro numbers that allow us to identify where the losses occur. Uh, second, uh, there is only a scarce evidence regarding the source of or causes of food losses. And again, uh, our method uh, try to capture that, and we need to keep improving uh, that. So that's why we have decided with FAO to develop an app uh, that uses this information so that we can cross-source information of this type that we are collecting so we can have more information of more households, and we can clearly identify where the losses occur in the value chain. Uh, third, uh, another major problem that we have found, and I will explain later, why is that uh, still we need to bring better evidence in terms of the cost effectiveness of what activities or what actions could reduce losses uh, that are profitable for the farmer to implement? And fourth, uh, there, are, there, are, there is also an understanding uh, or on what incentives to be in place uh, for farmers to do the necessary investments to reduce uh, food losses effectively. Oh, sorry. So uh, let me give you uh, some examples. So uh, what we know on the storage practices? 
In this figure, I present, uh, based on literature review, all the different type of interventions of storage for citrus. And these figures uh, shows the effects on the storage protectants uh, and these barriers and the interventions uh, that really have, effect, have an impact. Uh, and this is the size of the bar here. You see the lower the bar, the lower the losses in quantity and quality. And in this example, uh, botanical and essential uh, oils and wax coating plus essential oils are the most efficient interventions to be implemented. So another example uh, is we have these papers uh, of starters and others in, on 2020 that systematically review post-harvest losses interventions for 22 uh, crops across 57 countries in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia uh, from 1970s to the 2019. And the authors create a uh, synthesis evidence of the effectiveness of different interventions. And what they found is that the storage technology interventions are the more uh, dominated uh, studies, and maize was the most studied crop, and uh, most of the studies were done in India, while 24 countries uh, had not studies. And this figure presents the result of the impact of different interventions of grain storage in terms of percentage of weight loss and percentage of this color uh, grain losses. So on the incentives, uh, it's also important, uh, and we did two experiments on that. One in, what, in which we compare uh, relative to the traditional uh, deliverable uh, package of seeds and fertilizers provided by the governments, what could happen if we give information to the farmers and, uh, and we lend them a market that will pay an incentive if the farmer comply with the quantity attributes. And what we found is that there is a premium for the higher attributes that, and the impact in Honduras was an increase in the food loss reduction by 6% uh, compared to the typical package, and in Guatemala uh, of, of 7%. So what this means is just giving uh, proper information and incentives and buyers that are willing to pay a price premium make the farmers to do the investment that they need to do uh, to be able to achieve uh, the, these reductions. And the second one uh, was working in Ethiopia and was done by Hugo de Groth, which basically was working on the storage bags, and they find uh, also that an impact on the reduction of quality losses uh, by 9%. So now let me uh, summarize uh, my major conclusions. So first, not all the food losses reductions are created equal in terms of impact, and varies country by country and region by region and commodity by commodity. Uh, second, it's difficult to manage what you cannot measure. So it's very important to measure the level of losses, especially to identify where are the hotspots. And third, food security will be technically cheaper to bring innovations needed in low-income countries uh, to reduce food losses upstream. Uh, that's mean at the producer uh, level. And fourth, uh, innovations important in the nudging uh, the business case for food losses reduction, so broader investment strategy and policy coherence, so that we can have a business case. So it's important to say that if the producer don't have a business case, he won't do the investment. Uh, so for example, uh, if, I, if the producer do an investment to reduce food losses by being a flat toxin free, and then goes to the market, and the market doesn't recognize that change, uh, then why the farmer do this? Uh, so he will prefer not to do it because he doesn't get any, any benefit. So thank you very much. Um, Thank you, thank you, Luciana, for this uh, very practical, concise, and to the point uh, presentation, where you also highlighted uh, a, a lot of gaps, and, and that is exactly what this conference is for, to identify the problems so that we can uh, answer these questions and resolve them together. Um, and probably at the round table, at the end of uh, today, uh, I will bring up a few points that you mentioned and see if other people have some interesting uh, response on that. Now, we have a slight change in the order of speakers uh, because of the delay. Some of our uh, participants uh, online uh, get into time problems and therefore I would now like to invite uh, to make a presentation for uh, Ms. Lieke Verhofstadt. Um, of the Rabobank Business, Business Development, Development Global, Global Food and, and IT Networks. Networks. And uh, she will speak about the role of financial institutions in supporting the action against food loss and waste. 
Uh, Lieke Verhofstadt, um, I hope you uh, can connect well. Oké, okay. the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Robert. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, yes, clear. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much for the uh, invitation. Uh, really honored to, uh, to speak on behalf of Rabobank on this uh, great uh, conference. Um, let me try to share my screen to take you along uh, the foot loss on waste strategy of Rabobank. Um, Rabobank, uh, as some of you might know, is a global food and agribank. Uh, we're uh, based in the Netherlands, but we have offices around the world, as you can see. Um, and we were actually founded by farmers. Um, within Mobile Bank, we have a so-called uh, banking for food strategy, which means we are very much uh, into the food transition and how to finance it. Food loss and waste, of course, is one of the major topics in that uh, banking for food strategy. So I would like to uh, take you along uh, what Rubber Bank is doing uh, on the topic of food loss and waste. So um, our starting point is always to strive for good business cases for our clients, of course. Um, Next to that, we are a commercial bank, so our risk and return is also a very important uh, uh, issue. But uh, Rubber Bank is a cooperative bank, and uh, besides the economic value of uh, our clients and the risk and returns and the, uh, all the money involved, we are very much into societal and environmental impact. So when it comes to food loss and waste, we offer four different things. We offer programs to our clients. Uh, we offer tools to our clients. We offer financial solutions, of course, because we are a bank. And we offer, well, we not offer, but we are very much engaged in several networks. Let me start with some programs we offer for our clients first. Uh, one of those is uh, what we call the Food Waste Challenge. And this is a program for the hospitality industry in the Netherlands, where we help our clients uh, to measure uh, uh, their food waste. Uh, and in an eight week program, we help them with strategies to reduce their food waste. After eight weeks, we measure again, and then you can see the potential savings of that company uh, and multiply it to the uh, savings that, well, the potential savings in a year. This program started in 2020, just before COVID, um, and the results were very, very uh, interesting. So as you can see here, some of the results from the program that started 2019 to 2020, uh, about 100 restaurants participated, and the results uh, shown here are 21% less food waste which is a total of 757,000 euros. Um, we also calculate the emissions that go along with that in this program. Uh, and that was in uh, 2019, 150,000 kgs of CO2. During COVID, of course, it was a bit difficult to, uh, <laughs> to go ahead with this program. But uh, in 2022, we picked it up again, and we are now working on regional challenges. Um, and in every region, uh, about 20 restaurants are participating. Uh, the first one has now uh, ended like one month ago, uh, and the results are even better. So for these 20 restaurants, the res there was uh, measured 54% less food waste, which is 20,000 kgs of food. It's about 175,000 euros that was saved and 40,000 kgs of CO2. So what we aim with this uh, program is of course to help our clients uh, reduce our costs and therefore create better margins. So this is how you see that food loss and waste of course is a triple win. 
it saves you money and it of course it also saves you co2 then another tool we are offering our clients is uh, an innovation tool it's called food bites there are two different parts in food bites there is an innovation challenge uh, like uh, startups can apply and they can pitch their ideas uh, and that's like a physical food bites event uh, next to that we have a digital food bites uh, platform um, and in that platform we offer startups to be connected to large corporates but also investors so as a large corporate or as an investor you can log in and as you can see on the left side you can search for what you are looking for so i filled in uh, i want to look at food tech in the food beverages and ingredient sector and i want to reduce food waste so i'm looking for food waste technology my area is europe and then this system will uh, show you a lot of different startups or innovations in that area and you can click on them watch videos watch their pitch deck and then uh well maybe uh, you want to be in contact with them investors are maybe willing to invest um so this is a relatively new platform that rubber bank is offering for our clients as well and what we see in this platform is that food waste is really really an important issue um and therefore it's um, it's very interesting for startups to be uh, uh, uploaded on this platform. So if you know any interesting, innovative startup, please make them aware of Foodbytes Digital uh, because they can uh, log in for free. Then, of course, our financial solutions because we're a bank. Um, our Rebel Investments in Department uh, invests in promising companies and not only with money, but maybe even more important for some companies with knowledge and network. Uh, within Rebel Investments, we have a Rebel Food and Agri Innovation Fund, uh, which is um, mainly focused on smaller companies uh, and they invest seed and early growth capital, like equity, debt, scale up financing uh, but all in the space of food and agri from farm to fork uh, an example of rubber's investments in food loss and waste reduction is that we recently uh, invested three and three and a half million dollars in full harvest which is um, a business to business platform uh, who connects farmers to uh, large businesses in order to um, sell their imperfect produce. So that's actually the second grade produce. Um, a very promising uh, uh, company based in the US um, and Rubble Investment decided to, uh, to invest with, uh, in them. So of course the investment in money, but we are now working with Full Harvest uh, to connect them to large corporates as well, or to our farmer clients. So as you can see in this example, network is actually as important as uh, the money we have invested. Then we have a specific SDG 12.3 loan. And this is a loan specifically for our wholesale clients. Um, why we are doing that is because we want to motivate our clients to reduce food loss and waste in their uh, operations. So, um, if a company uh, is working on reduction of food loss and waste, we will set targets together with our client. Um, if they reach that target, then they will get a discount on their interest rates. So uh, the KPI we are measuring is based on the SDG 12.3, which is 50% reduction of food waste by 2030. Uh, and the method methodology we use is aligned with the food loss and waste accounting and reporting standard so the food loss and waste protocol um, we've done a few deals uh, in this uh, SDG 12.3 loan one is ecoplaza which is a retailer in the netherlands uh, selling biological foods uh, and the results of this uh, loan are very very good um, 
So uh, this is the specific financial solution Rabobank can offer. Then um, we are working, and I, I'm saying we are working <laughs> on a re, uh, food loss and waste related uh, GHG advisory tool. Uh, and it's still very much under construction, uh, but uh, like every other company, Rabobank is also very much engaged in the road to Paris. We really want to help our clients to reach Paris. And in that sense, we are looking at how we can advise our clients um, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And one of the low hanging fruits in that is, of course, food loss and waste, as it is about 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So um, this could be a very important tool for us to help our clients uh, reduce food loss and waste. Then I mentioned uh, the networks um, and the networks are really an essential part of Rabo's food loss and waste strategy, not only Rabo's food loss and waste strategy, our entire strategy. We always say we do finance, we do knowledge, networks and innovation. So it's one of our main four pillars. Uh, in the space of food loss and waste, we actually uh, describe three different layers of uh, networks. Uh, on top, we have the macro, the landscape networks. Uh, for example, the EU, where we are part of the, um, the EU uh, food waste platform. We are very much working together with the UN on food loss and waste, exa for example, with FAO. Um, and of course, with the Dutch government, uh, we are founding father of the uh, United Against Food Waste Foundation, uh, which is partly founded by the Dutch government as well. Then the MESO networks, we are a champion 12.3. We are a member of the Food is Never Waste Coalition. We work together with the War, uh, Wageningen University. Um, so also on that middle layer, we are very much engaged with our networks. And then on the micro level, we actually create products with our networks. So for example, we are working on a cold chain uh, program together with World Bank and FAO. We are working on a rural food loss challenge together with Food Bites and the World Farmers Organization. So here you can see we have networks in different layers and we use them for different purposes, but they are all equally important. So this is actually what I wanted to tell you uh, from Rabo Bank's side. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a very nice conference. Thank you very much. Thank you too, Lieke. Uh, this was uh, very interesting. I would like to pick out uh, one dimension which maybe sometimes is a bit overlooked because we talk, when we're talking about big companies, they often have what they call corporate social responsibility and they have money set aside for that to com uh, comply with our corporate social responsibility objectives. But here we see, uh, regardless of the, the good, honest intentions that the Rabobank never, uh, uh, undoubtedly has, here we see a clear business model. This, for instance, the first example that you mentioned, these restaurants that you guide in a strategy for food waste reduction in their operations, they are your clients. You and the, and the bank is a commercial bank and makes money through the clients. So it is for the bank's own interest if the clients perform very well. And therefore, uh, it's just an, an, a business model, a very modern, good business model to support your clients in, uh, in their performance and in this respect in food waste reduction. Um, and, and, and I think that many of these examples that you gave could be easily transferred to, to other uh, countries and other uh, uh, relations between the, the food operators, the food businesses and their uh, financial institutions and their banks that are uh, working or other types of uh, support or so. So uh, at a later stage, if it is not all uh, uh, protected information, we may ask Rabobank to reveal a bit of their uh, uh, strategies to, to support these uh, restaurants and other clients in uh, food waste reduction or so. 
Then uh, I move on to the, the next speaker, uh, and that is uh, Ms. Margreet Vidar from FAO. Margreet, thank you very much for uh, giving your, your spots to Lieke Verhofstadt, uh, but now it's your turn. Um, Margreet Vidar is uh, a legal officer at uh, FAO's headquarters in Rome. Uh, she's been extremely helpful in the program that we are implementing in this region in uh, developing national strategies for food loss and waste reduction. And she's going to share with us uh, the legal perspective of the uh, food loss and waste. Thank you, Robert. Thank you uh, for, for giving me the slot. I am delighted to participate and uh, and very sorry that... Uh, that uh, That I was that I was not able to be in person in this in this uh, in this beautiful city. Excuse me a second. I seem to have I seem to have shared the wrong screen. Are you seeing my presentation? Yes. Yes, it's clear. Go ahead. Okay. I will I will switch quickly the 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 display if I can. Hmm. I cannot. Unfortunately, every time I use uh, I use the Zoom with two screens, something different uh, happens. And <laughs> anyway, I let me let me continue with that. Uh, you will you will you will enjoy seeing my notes. Uh, I I imagine on the on the big screen. Now I want to talk about the enabling legal environment for the prevention of uh, and reduction of food loss and waste. And to start with, to start with saying that uh, that in that context, the uh, it is very important to understand that uh, whether or not it is intended, the legal framework always has an impact on food loss and waste, and it may be a negative impact or a positive impact, and that is why it is so important to start with legal assessment and understanding how the legal framework may impact on food loss and waste. And that is what we do in, uh, in our work in the region, as I will get to uh, in, a, in a little bit. Now, in, in terms of what type of legal frameworks can, can be helpful in the fight against food loss and waste, there is a variety of options, and we do not uh, necessarily provide a, a single or the same advice to all countries globally. It really depends a bit on, on the situation of each country. But some countries have found it useful to use a framework clause on food loss and waste to address the, the issue through a holistic approach. Now, what does that look like? It, it means that the legislation may create an institutional framework and ensure institutional coordination. It may also set, set legally binding targets and goals to, to follow. And it may, it may have uh, legal provisions about the, the food hierarchy, as we call it. This picture is taken from the Code of Conduct on food loss and waste that was adopted in FAO by the Committee on Agriculture, which which basically lists what we want to happen to food after it is no longer uh, for sale in a normal a normal marketplace. So going from uh, redistribution of the food to animal feed and down to incineration or landfill, which obviously is the least preferred option. That is not uh, the only thing. Of course, the different sector legislation also have a huge impact. So what we look at in, in, uh, in, in, in looking at the environment as it is, we look at issues with food donations. Is it more expensive to don donate the food than to throw it away? It should be the reverse. Or, or that the labeling requirements are clear, 
so that food food is not being thrown out just because it has reached the best before date when it is still safe to eat. And that brings me to another important aspect of the legal uh, framework for food loss and waste, which is food safety. Of course, food safety and human health should never be compromised and never she should never be risked. And finally, we have identified fiscal measures as very important to uh, to address uh, food loss and waste and to provide incentives and disincentives that uh, that promotes using food to the to the very end and redistributing it, donating it, doing. Uh, what is needed down the down the hierarchical pyramid, so that as little as possible ends up in landfill or being burned. Now, very quickly, I want to show you uh, or show you a little bit of what we have been doing in the region. We have been working with uh, our colleagues in Budapest and in Ankara, in 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 FAO and with the countries and governments in the region to. First and foremost, look at what is in place. So we have been doing the first step. We have been analyzing the legal and regulatory frameworks for food loss and waste with the uh, assistance of national lawyers who understand their own legal system with a view to formulate uh, recommendations based on what is in place and also based on, uh, on other aspects because as we all know, the legal framework is important, but it's not the only tool that is at our disposal. We try to work together with other methodologies, of course, as much as possible. And through this, we have supported the formulation of overall food loss and waste strategies. And further down the line, we may also assist them with uh, reforming the, the legislation or uh, drafting new laws. Now, just to conclude, because I am very conscious that we have a lot of speakers and I would like to uh, move briskly through this, uh, this presentation, I wanted to point out that the Code of Conduct on Food Loss and Waste Reduction, which is available online and should be in, in the conference packages, as well as a new legal brief, where basically what I've just told you is written down in a very accessible way in eight to eight or ten pages with some country examples that could be very interesting to the participants of this uh, of this conference. We are hoping to be able to release the Turkish and Russian versions of this legal brief uh, today, or if not today, then tomorrow, but hopefully today, and we will then make it available. Uh, through the conference secretariat. The English version, as I said, is online and is available. And with that, I would like very much to thank you for thank you for your attention and thank you for the opportunity. I really wish I would could be could be there in Istanbul, beautiful city. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for the attention. Thank you too, uh, Margaret. Uh, we are very happy with your uh, presentation. And uh, now I would like to move over uh, quickly to the next uh, speaker, uh, which will be Ms. Anne-Laure Gassin, team leader of food waste of, and the farm to fork strategy of the Director, Directorate General for Health and Food Safety of the European Commission. Um, Anne-Laure, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. And uh, like Margaret, I really wish that I could be with you, but uh, at least uh, very happy to, to connect today. Um, I believe that you are uploading my presentation for me. I'm not sharing my screen, so yeah, it, it will be coming up. So in, in a way, what I'll be presenting today is a bit of a case study uh, of what uh, an example of what uh, Margaret has just been explaining, um, speaking about how in the EU we are establishing a policy and regulatory environment to both encourage action and support players in taking action. Next slide, please. So. 
if I can have the next, yes, perfect. So um, the Farm to Fork strategy in the EU outlines an ambitious action plan to reduce food loss and waste as part of an integrated food systems approach. And what I'll be focusing on today are the first two actions, which are upcoming legislative proposals from the European Commission to set legally binding EU level targets for food waste reduction, and also to revise EU rules for date marking in order to avoid unnecessary food waste linked to the misunderstanding of the meaning of the dates that we find on food packaging. As part of the strategy, we will also further integrate food loss and waste prevention as part of all relevant EU policies. And you'll hear an example this afternoon from one of our colleagues speaking about the work that we have been doing as regards food hygiene rules, um, attempting to modify them so as to ensure um, to facilitate safe uh, food donation practices. Food losses, in particular pre-harvest, is an area that really warrants further investigation, and we are pursuing this in the context of um, European research and innovation programs and funding, both attempting to better understand why they occur and to, and to quantify them, and scaling up action and mobilizing key players, amongst others, through the EU platform on food losses and food waste. So next slide, please. So under the waste legislation, uh, there, as it was revised in 2018, uh, in the EU, there are new obligations for member states to measure, monitor food waste, and to reduce food waste at each stage of the food supply chain. And that revision of the directive uh, delegated the Commission to develop a common methodology for quantifying food waste. So first, we have to, of course, de define what is food waste. Now, this may seem self-evident that food waste is food which becomes waste, uh, but of course, in legal terms, um, the devil is in the details, uh, and this gets uh, infinitely more complex. But the, the point of departure is is food, as defined in the general food law, which means food and its inedible parts, um, which then becomes waste, be that um, discard by a food business operator or household. Next slide, please. Now, in building the methodology, uh, we had the, the we benefited from um, important work that was carried out through the EU uh, Fusions uh, Project uh, in 2016, which laid down a methodology for quantifying and um, and measuring food waste. And we laid on top of that, if I can have the build, the next slide, the the coverage from EU legislation. So the the. Right, perfect. Thank you. And the 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 most um, the main difference really is that, in accordance with EU waste legislation, materials which are used on the farm, so crops which are plowed back in or used for energy on the farm, are not considered as waste. Um, note also that food which is um, which does not enter the food supply chain for human consumption, but which is then used for animal feed is not considered food waste. And same for the valorization of, um, of non-food products. Um, next slide, please. So what was the general approach laid down for monitoring? And I believe that we are the first region in the world that has implemented um, legal requirements for monitoring of, of food waste across the food supply chain. So each stage of the food supply chain, um, quantification rather than rough estimations or modeling. Um, there are recommended also methods for quantification that are laid down in legislation. It's based on waste policy, so a focus on resource efficiency. We're monitoring total food waste and not only the edible fraction of food waste. Um, practical, meaning that the monitoring is part of existing EU policy frameworks in waste legislation as well as reporting frameworks based on research, as I mentioned before, and compatible with global standards. Next slide, please. So referring to that global standard here now, looking at what is the scope of the EU's food waste measurement and reporting, well, it's annual reporting, it's food and it's enable parts. Um, the destinations are when food is sent for waste treatment, as I mentioned before. Um, so losses pre-harvest are not do not fall in under the um, this uh, monitoring framework. It's food and beverages, and it's reporting at the level of countries. Um, there are also voluntary uh, reporting mechanisms in the laid down or suggested in the legislation. Those member states who wish to report, for instance, on food donation or food going to animal feed, are certainly welcome to do so. Next slide, please. 
Now, the legislation, of course, doesn't explain how to do everything, uh, and the Eurostat office has also laid down more operational guidance, which is available and through the EU platform and its dedicated subgroup on monitoring. This is a subject which on which uh, we regularly share information between members. Next slide, please. So, in line with the Champions 12.3 Target Measure Act approach, uh, we will be proposing EU-level targets based on measurement, based on data, based on, on monitoring. And um, why are we proposing targets? Well, simply because, yes, actions are being taken in the EU, but those actions are not yet at the scale and the pace needed to address um, the risk of the important environmental damage, the climate implications, the negative economic impacts, as we've heard this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, of food waste. So we will be um, proposing, as part of a revision of the Waste Directive, EU-wide um, legally binding targets, and the exact coverage and the target levels are to be decided in the legislative proposal, which will be forthcoming in second quarter of next year. And like all legislative proposals, it, it will be supported. It is supported by impact assessment and by public consultation. We published last year an inception impact assessment where we sought feedback um, from interested parties on the options uh, considered for targets. We ran a public consultation, uh, which finalized in August, and a summary report will be published in the coming weeks. We have carried out targeted surveys, uh, including with food business operators, ran interviews, and as announced very recently by uh, our President von der Leyen, we will also be organizing citizens' panels to help guide our reflection on food waste prevention in the EU. Next slide, please. So the baseline data, the member states have carried out a first reporting of food waste with a reference year of 2020 so that will be the reference year for 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 targets um that was reported into eurostat uh, by the end of june uh, eurostat is currently validating the data and we expect publication of those data in the coming weeks the policy options on which we have sought feedback focus only on how the targets will be defined so the scope uh, whether the targets would cover the full chain or selected stages only how the target would be expressed in absolute values or percent reduction, and how they will be set for member states. And of course, uh, target levels um, indeed is, is a critical part. And all of this will be subject to a modeling and impact assessment, which is in progress uh, right now. So uh, next slide, please. Turning now to the second subject, this is date marking and how can we promote better understanding and, and use of date marking. I think we're all aware of the problem and, and the difficulties that consumers have in distinguishing between these different concepts, the use by food safety, best before informing about food quality. Next slide, please. So as part of the revision of um, the regulation on food information to consumers, which includes also other labeling commitments set out under the farm to fork strategy, we are undertaking to revise uh, the EU date marking rules in order then aiming to avoid food waste linked to misunderstanding of these dates. And again, uh, this proposal, this legislative proposal is supported by impact assessment. Um, next slide, please. So the policy options on which we also sought feedback in the inception impact assessment were the following, a baseline scenario as always, which is business as usual, do nothing, which is always included in impact assessment. What first option to revise the rules of application of the best before date. So for instance, considering whether the list of products which are exempt from best before labeling could be extended to other non-perishable foods, such as grains, uh, pasta, rice, for instance. Second option to revise the rules and abolish entirely the concept of best before labeling. So just keeping the safety date, the use by date. Option three, to improve the expression and presentation of date markings. So aiming through um, different terminology, format, visual presentation to help consumers better differentiate between safety, health, and the quality concept. So these were the policy options which um, have been subject to impact assessment. Um, next slide, please. And um, 
Right. And that impact assessment is also supported, has been supported by consumer research, um, which uh, the objectives being to better understand um, how consumers today use and interpret the current rules and how that affects their decision making, to identify new ways of expressing date marking and, and to see whether some work better than others, to test their effectiveness. And um, there were several uh, phases in that research from literature review to focus groups to quantitative online research in all 27 member states to an experimental study um, to design um, design to assess um, whether certain options could better actually impact on consumer behavior and avoid food waste. Um, next slide, please. So we are really in the final, final stages here. Um, the Commission is preparing its legislative proposal, which is scheduled to, to come out in the coming months, and uh, it will be followed by co-decision procedure, discussions in Council and with Parliament. Next slide, please. And last slide, uh, just to say that uh, for all of those interested in, in keeping informed, but also um, providing information about your activities in the area of food loss and waste, we would invite you to join this digital hub. Any stakeholder active in the area can become a member, share resources, news. You'll find here also dedicated pages uh, for each of the EU member states with information on national policies and legislative developments. And uh, if you subscribe, then you will receive a monthly newsletter online. We have over 2,000 subscribers today. And next and last slide, is just um, some details here if you would like to to stay in touch with our with our activities with that i i stop here and uh thank you very much uh, and Laura, thank you very much for this uh, presentation we are always uh, we have always been very happy with uh, the close collaboration that we have with the european union as well as EU member states, especially with regard to the fight against food waste. Uh, because in, in, in that area, which is uh, of increasing importance in the non-EU countries of Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and we can learn a lot from the, uh, the level of advancement that the EU has taken in order to fight food waste. And when we look at uh, the, the plans to, to set legally binding targets for the EU member states, of course, uh, the non-EU countries are not legally bound to it, but uh, this should be an, an, a good inspiration for those countries to follow this guidance and uh, try to stay ahead of the game as well and uh, reduce the food waste uh, by uh, similar methods as the EU is now uh, applying in the, in the EU member states. Okay, we quickly move on to the, the recording next in progress. We move on to the next speakers, which is a duo presentation from Mr. Maarten Wegen, Agricultural Councillor for Turkey at the Ministry of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality of the Netherlands, and Ms. Sanne Stroosnijder, Program Manager Food Loss and Waste Prevention at Wageningen Food and Biobased Research. Um, so, Mr. Uh, Martin Wegen, he is here, and uh, Ms. Stroosnijder will uh, speak online. Hi. Hi. Martin and Sanne, you have the floor. This is next. Stand okay. And the laser. Okay, perfect, thank you. Good morning, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and we are, of course, very happy uh, as the Ministry of Agriculture, Nature, and Food Quality to not only be present at this event, but also to support it. Um, it shows some of our international commitment to addressing these issues because in the end it's not a challenge which is defined by national borders but it's very much an international challenge of course. Um, the advantage of being a little bit later in this panel is of course that we already had the shown the, the importance of data and statistics by Ms. Del Delgado. We already had the business uh, views uh, from Rabobank. And we just had a comprehensive review of the legislative framework. So uh, that helps me in my presentation because you have more context and I can be a little bit quicker in my presentation. Um, I will do this presentation together with my colleague from Wageningen University um, because 
in the Netherlands, we followed a very much a um, uh, an approach which um, is multi-stakeholder, of course. And we want to illustrate that by also doing this presentation uh, together. So I will focus a little bit on some of the highlights of the Dutch approach in the last 10, 12 years. And then Ms. Troosneider will continue. Of course, the core of this message is that for us, it's very important to create commitment. The second is to adopt a target measure and act approach. And the third one is to do it together, so to work together collaboratively within your country. If I start here, I think already in 2009 in the Netherlands, um, we started with a 20% reduction target. And we started the monitoring and measuring because you can have targets, but without actually monitoring, measuring, you don't know which direction you're going. And we followed that up a little bit later with a global conference which was hosted in The Hague. It was called No More Food to Waste. And um, there actually, within the FAO context, the target um, was increased to 50% in 2030. So already there, we saw that there was more traction for the discussion in a global sense to reduce food loss and food waste internationally. And one of the main outcomes, I think, for us was that the Champions 12.3 coalition, which was already mentioned earlier, which was initiated also by the Netherlands, to increase this target and to also set good examples. After 2015, we went into a national uh, dialogue, let's say, and this led to the um, task for a circular economy in food. And it was driven by Wageningen University actually showing the commitment from the scientific side, together with my ministry, but also the Sustainable Food Alliance, for example. And 25 members of the entire food production chain, including consumers, SMEs, but also big multinationals, uh, members from the public and public and societal organization. And what happened there was that different initiatives by different parties were brought together during this collaboration and this task force. Of course, what happens next if you involve more stakeholders, you do additional analysis, you automatically get more of a systemic approach. You start to understand better what kind of uh, drivers uh, are there for the different stakeholders in this uh, um, in tackling food waste and food loss. And the systemic approach uh, led to the founding of the Food Waste Free United Foundation, which now actually includes more than 100 stakeholders. And then you can see additional drivers coming in, such as the financial support of which Rabobank gave some examples, but also transition management. So you start looking ahead. What are the middle-term goals? What are the longer-term goals? Um, and from a government perspective, which I'm representing here, of course, we get to the legislative part where you have to ensure proper monitoring and reporting. You do things on consumer awareness, for example, through campaigns but also policy initiatives such as the date labeling of which the European Commission just gave a very nice uh, presentation. Very quickly as a government, what we also do apart from the national dialogue where my colleague will go into a bit more after this, um, we're an active member of the EU platform on food waste and food losses. We are, of course, as a member state of the EU, very much involved in the legislative discussions. But we're also part of the Champions 12.3 coalition, where we put a lot of energy because it's dedicated to meet this target. But it's also very important to lead in the discussions on food loss and food waste, but also to showcase uh, and communicate successes, so to inform each other about what works and maybe what doesn't work. And of course, you want to advocate that. And by showing leadership, not just as a government, but as a co broad coalition, 
this helps to gain more traction. Um, I'm here the agricultural uh, counselor uh, in Turkey. Uh, I have another colleagues as well worldwide. And we are also very active on a global sense through the Dutch uh, network of agricultural counselors. And um, we try to set up public-private partnerships, for example. We have some very nice examples in Mexico, in Kenya. And the idea is to share Dutch analysis, experience, expertise, and knowledge in how to gain further traction and advancement uh, on, on, on reducing food loss and food waste. When I look to the future, what will happen and what our needs are, especially, is to have continued cooperation in a global sense with international organizations, but also other countries and EU member states. But it also has to be targeted, which also Ms. Delgado showed very uh, well, by targeting the right sectors and the right products to gain as much impact as you can. It has to be demand-driven, otherwise, if it's not demand-driven, it's, it's, it's a struggle. And we need to have a systemic approach, so we have to take everyone along, and we need a very good analysis. And I think this meeting shows also the importance of information sharing, and I cannot underline enough the importance of actually sharing best practices, because what works in a Dutch context might work in your context might, might not, but to have this discussion is very valuable. So I went from the Netherlands to the EU to the global. I'll now go back to the Netherlands. Um, just to sum up a little bit, the importance of monitoring and impact. Um, it was a re we have a yearly uh, food waste monitor, for example, which gives direct feedback on how the Netherlands is performing. It's at household level, but it's also in the production chain, and it's per sector. So analysis, again, is very important. A second action pillar is joining forces, and I think Rabobank gave a very nice example of how the business community and public-private uh, partnerships can work. Also, we have like, uh, for example, a voucher system where innovations and good ideas can be shared, can be worked out to see if it's scalable to apply in real life. And of course, feasibility studies are done. Um, also to not only reduce waste, but also to reuse waste, for example, in innovative products or other products. So that's where the circular agriculture, circular economy part comes in. Of course, number three, we have to work on consumer awareness. There's a lot of food waste happening there. And the last one I already shared is the government role, but also how do we have a legislative framework, but also a good practices, for example, through platforms. So that was very quick. Um, I will give the word to my colleague, uh, uh, Sanne, who will continue a little bit from a more in-depth look at the Dutch um, uh, uh, approach. Sana. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, and um, thanks for inviting me and really happy to join in this uh, duo presentation. My name is Sana Strausmeider. I work at Wageningen University in Research um, as a program manager of food loss and waste prevention. And from that position, I am part of the what we call the team of Food Waste Free United. So I spent uh, part of my time uh, there. Um, Maat already explained a little bit that this is the Dutch ecosystem uh, on trying to reduce and prevent food loss and waste in the Netherlands. Uh, next slide, uh, please. Uh, and thank you, Maat, for, uh, for assisting me in, uh, in switching the slides. So taking into account what Maat already um, briefly presented, in the Netherlands we have been working on, on food loss and waste prevention already for a long time. Uh, starting with the first governmental targets and monitoring and measuring, which was done by Wur. Um, and we used uh, and benefited from several uh, EU initiatives in research to also form a, a, an approach for the Netherlands that has now uh, come together in a foundation, uh, which is called Food Waste Reunited, or Samen tegen Voedselverspilling in proper Dutch. If we look and zoom into the uh, 
actual food resource use efficiency in the Netherlands, we see, fortunately, a recent steady decline. It has been stable for quite a long time, which also led us to the belief that having policy measurements and focusing on measuring and monitoring is not enough. So in 2017, as Marta highlighted, we started with the first 25 front runners in the Netherlands among uh, Rabobank, uh, uh, to be mentioned as Lika explained, which has now evolved in a proper ecosystem that enables all the four pillars that Marta briefly explained. Yeah? So monitoring, measuring, really looking at how to support companies and entrepreneurs in improving their food resource use efficiency in uh, either their company uh, or in their supply chain. Um, but also looking at targeted approach for consumer behavioral change, as well as looking at not only legislative um, framework, which is really important, as uh, the FAO presenter already explained, but also looking at other barriers that need to be overcome to really be able to, to deliver on our goal, which is halving food waste, of course, in 2030. Uh, next slide, uh, please. So for the Netherlands, um, about one quarter of all the food that is produced for human consumption is being lost somewhere along, along the supply chain. So that equals up to about 2 million tons a year. And halving this would mean to keep to save 100 million tons and keep that in the food supply chain. With the Food Waste Free Foundation, um, uh, which is basically the embodiment of the national approach, in the, um, we really focus at the green part of this reverse pyramid. So a lot of effort goes into preventing food waste, either donating or redistributing that, maybe using it for animal feed or chemicals or biomaterials, all part of our prevention and reduction strategy. But we focus less on the gray and, uh, and, and black area, of course. And what we do see at this moment, uh, due to the geopolitical crisis and energy shortages, is a huge increase in prices for energy, setting a very negative uh, side effect on uh, anaerobic digestion in relation, especially in the Netherlands, towards uh, um, uh, side streams and car products that were being used in animal feed or even uh, valorized on a higher a part of this period but that are now again flowing back into anaerobic digestion and i think this will be the case for many european countries uh, so for the netherlands we now have one quarter approximately which is somewhere between 105 and 152 kilos per person a year which is still significant uh, but we do see this especially steady decline in uh, consumer uh, household food waste and i'll come back to that later uh, next slide, please. So where we started in the Netherlands with that first 25 front runners, um, before that we had the Dutch government represented by Marit and also uh, Wageningen University and Research already involved with many of the sector organizations. In 2008, we started with adding 25 front runner companies and societal NGOs, for example, to the mix. And that has grown now to more than 100, uh, what we call stakeholders, so partners um, into this ecosystem, really ranging uh, from uh, startups and scale ups to small and medium enterprises, but also large corporate organizations, uh, knowledge institutes uh, like where uh, but also uh, uh, NGO uh, organizations. We have a full supply chain coverage. So we include innovative circular farmers up to uh, uh, companies that actually put delicious healthy foods on the shelf or on a plate. Um, and this ecosystem is growing. Um, what we do see in the Netherlands, and that is something that we are working on really hard at the moment, is the importance of uh, involvement of the several diff different uh, ministries of the Dutch government. So this initiative is very strongly supported by the Ministry of Agriculture, F uh, Nature and Food Quality, but 
could be stronger supported by ministries that are uh, involving in, for example, waste disposal, but also climate change, but also uh, the Ministry of uh, uh, Health and uh, th that, for example, uh, has a lot of involvement in food safety regulations. So this is, I think, in many European countries a challenge and something that we are continuing working on in the Netherlands. Uh, we also see that um, we could benefit from a stronger um, uh, sites of representation uh, in addition to consumers. Uh, next slide, please. So we use um, uh, several roadmaps for the different parts of the supply chain to really have hands-on, practical, targeted approach. Solutions that might be needed uh, to improve donation are not the same that it could uh, uh, reduce uh, losses at, for example, uh, a fruit and vegetable production. So we have targeted uh, roadmaps for each part of our supply chain. And this is an example of work that we have been doing with the retail uh, uh, organizations in the Netherlands. Um, this year we uh, published for the second time a retail benchmark uh, almost 80 80 percent of the market uh, and supermarkets are represented in this benchmark really giving us not only a clear insight into how much is wasted at the retail level but also what product categories and giving each re retailer themselves an insight into how they do uh, according to the benchmark and retailers have with this insight into their specific organizational hotspots of waste, which enabled them to take targeted uh, measures, uh, targeted actions. This has really proven to be instrumental for the reduction of, uh, of food uh, waste at retail level in the Netherlands. And I think this is one of the uh, supply chain uh, uh, parts that perhaps would be able to uh, reach SDG 12.3 uh, before 2030, if this is uh, going uh, steadily as has been going right now. Next slide, please. Uh, the second example that I would like to share with you is an initiative that we have been organizing this year for the fourth time, which is the Food Waste Free Week, targeted at consumers uh, with a very strong call to action uh, to not only inspire them, but also to activate them to uh, waste less food. We focus there on a positive social norm and really providing them with practical tips. So this year the theme was uh, leftovers uh, and not wasting them, but still enjoying them. Um, with a combined effort of more than 130 partners, we reach uh, over almost half of the Dutch citizens, which is uh, significant. Um, and we'll have an after move the uh, next week of this year's edition, and I will be happy to uh, to share that with you afterwards. My colleague, uh, Twan Timmermans, who is director of the Food Waste Free uh, United Foundation, will talk about this specific intervention focusing on consumer household uh, food waste uh, tomorrow in, uh, in session five, I believe. So next slide, please. To conclude, uh, because this is the positive news, the best positive news that we can share from the Netherlands is that we see a steady decline in food waste uh, at, uh, at home consumption. And that is uh, very much uh, um, uh, motivated uh, by uh, not only being aware uh, and wanting to uh, prevent food waste, but also by positive uh, uh, pro-environmental beha behaviors in other aspects. On the same time, we also see that there is some uh, competition in these motivations. People also try to stay uh, healthy and eat safely and eat tasty food. Um, but we do see that a positive attitude uh, is increasing, the awareness of the problem and the intention to avoid food waste in the Netherlands in general. What we could do better is awareness of your, their own, your own uh, wasteful behavior and overcoming barriers that are impractical to improve uh, uh, food waste uh, behavior in at the household. Uh, we support that with practical tools and tips um, and give people insights, make it easy and attractive. 
and we hope we've just done a new uh, analysis of the uh, food waste composition and we will have new statistics uh, probably next week so i'm sorry that i'm not able to share those with you but we hope that this uh, um, decrease uh, will uh, continue and that um, uh, we will also be able to share the insights into this uh, specific area, I think, where the Netherlands has quite a lot of expertise, also with a larger group uh, of countries that might benefit from these insights. So this was my last slide. Thank you very much to provide some learnings and insights into the national strategy for the Netherlands. And I hope to be able to connect with you the coming days to share more experiences. Thanks. Thank you, Martin and Sanne. Uh, we see here uh, from the Netherlands an excellent example on, on two aspects which I'd like to highlight. First of all, the, the Food Loss and Waste Program is, has become part of the, the circular, circular economy uh, policy of the, the Netherlands. And it is an important part of achieving a circular economy and sub subsequently getting into sustainable food systems. And secondly, this is an example where the, 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 at national level the government has taken the lead in order to uh, bring together uh, academy, academia, civil society and the private sector in a uh, joint effort to reduce food waste. And this is exactly the approach that we also foresee for national strategies in the countries where we implement our projects. in outside the EU in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. So thank you very much for this, uh, these examples. And um, I, I hope we can uh, follow up on that and, and um, uh, establish some, some more collaboration in that respect. Then now I'm already to the last speaker, but not the least, uh, which is Ms. Uh, Zeynep Oskan, Uskan, Head of Department of European Union Harmonization, as well as the Gidani Koru, campaign coordinator of the Ministry of Agriculture in Turkey. Zeynep, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really sorry that my voice is gone for the last two days. And uh, it only has one life and I'm going to spend it for you. But I also have a backup. Uh, my precious colleague will uh, cover me if, uh, if I'm, uh, my voice is dead on the stage. But it's a pleasure for me to uh, come together with you because we have been dreaming this event for the last two years since the beginning of our FAO Turkey partnership program uh, and uh, since the beginning of this project we dreamed of this regional this international conference but due to pandemics uh, we only could do it today so how am I going to okay so as the, as the other speakers uh, had already framed the global numbers and the other technical details uh, of the food loss and waste problem, uh, what I'm only going to mention is what we had done in Turkey with the support of FAO. Okay, so the food loss and waste numbers in Turkey is that Turkey wastes almost 18 million tons of food in 2020. This, is, this number is from the National Inventory Report, which is submitted to UNFCC, which is a very credible number uh, and which is updated every year. Uh, but the numbers come behind uh, two years. And also, the composition of the food waste in the municipal waste in Turkey is 52%. So almost over the half of the trash, half of the waste in the municipal waste is food. So in order for you to visualize the numbers, uh, this amount of food waste is equal to, equals to almost, six, uh, almost over than 600,000 uh, garbage trucks. And we waste a lot of bread, uh, although it is accepted as holy in the Turkish culture. 
And the highest uh, waste is seen also afterwards in seen fresh fruits and vegetables because they are very perishable. And food waste sector, service sector, also waste and beverage waste is also very high. So what we did since 2018, uh, first we started with a technical cooperation project, thanks to FAO, and we formed a multidisciplinary, within the ministry, a, working, a core working group within the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry. So uh, imagine we have the very different uh, DGs within the ministry, and uh, so we gathered our forces together. And what we did in the first time, because we, we always imagined the kind of a campaign to reach the customers, the consumers to reduce food waste, we already reserved the Twitter, YouTube, and the Instagram and Facebook accounts of the, um, with the Gudana Koro, which means save your food in English. Uh, so we reserved those uh, social media accounts for almost like two years. And then we sent out some pre-made surveys to be sent to the, our 81 provincial directories. Turkey has 81 provinces, and each province has their own provincial directories, which became, which became actually our advantage because we were so powerful with the, within the organization of the ministry. So those provincial directorates get on the field, get on the uh, streets and the, and the farmer's market, and the supermarkets, and the um, uh, imagine every food place that you can imagine. So they filled out those surveys and they came to Ankara and we hold a very big workshop. Uh, so we actually understood better what are the food loss and waste number, not the numbers actually, but, the, but the, um, which points the food is wasted or lost. And then afterwards, uh, as we wanted to have a 600, uh, 360 degrees approach, uh, we hold a second workshop with the stakeholders, which are from academia, private sector, and NGO. So you can see the photos over there. And then, uh, as you can see on the screen, is that what we found out that Turkey wastes a lot of, the, of its fresh fruits and vegetables, and they are wasted before, actually they are lost before they are reaching to the customer due to transport and transportation logistics and storage uh, shortages. And there is also a high rate of uh, waste in food services due to our hospitality manners. Uh, because uh, if you ever came to Turkey, the, you will see in a, sit in a restaurant and uh, even though you don't ask, lots of appetizers free of charge come to your table. And uh, it's all mostly gone waste. And waste differs in income groups. Uh, the low income group also wastes its food, and the highest income group also wastes its food. So everyone wastes their food. And food supply chain, of course, needs to be improved. And uh, we attach so much importance to the food literacy because most of the speakers mentioned the date labeling, which almost 80% of Turkish citizens doesn't know the difference. They think the same or uh, they don't know what, the, what it does mean. So you can see this is a very, uh, I, I believe that you must be very familiar with this uh, reverse pyramid, which is the hierarchy, which is the backbone of our uh, strategic uh, plan and action, action plan of our, uh, to, to us, uh, for us to reduce food loss and waste in Turkey. So our aim, of course, the primary aim is the source reduction. So what we do for the source reduction, we raise awareness. We measure, monitor, and relate, which is a really hard work, actually. And we build capacity of the government, of the NGOs, of the, uh, of the private sector. I will tell you how. And then, if we couldn't, you know, reduce in the source, then we go to the food redistribution, which is the food banking, as you already know. And then afterwards, which we are very proud because we are, uh, for the third stage, we uh, just newly, very freshly uh, published the legislation for animal feed for the former food stuff, which are uh, safe for animal consumption. So, which is a really good uh, step, uh, progress to reduce food waste in Turkey. And then afterwards, of course, uh, recycling of the wasted food. 
So this is our strategic plan and uh, strategic guide and action plan, which you can download uh, from our website, gdanukoru.com, or also you could also receive it from the FAO publications. So it's, what does it have inside? It has a background information. It has our concept, because uh, from the opening speeches, maybe you heard that it began too early than 2018. It began in 2008 with the uh, uh, Do Not Waste Your Bread campaign, and 2015 with our G20 presidency, and then afterwards 2018 with the foundation of the, this campaign, actually. So the, there are goals and targets, almost uh, 100 actions in it, with the players defined uh, mutually, actually. There are players from government, private sector, NGOs, academia, and of course the households. So this is our mascot, Jano. Jano is not a vegetable or a fruit, but it seems that it's a kind of, a, you know, uh, kind of something which could be eaten, but do not eat it because he is he's traveling uh, outside, so for you to, you know, uh, take photos. And um, so we wanted to have a mascot because we wanted to attract children and youth. Uh, because if we have to achieve, have to meet the 2030 goals of uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, we have to educate and train children so that they could change their behavior and they could change the world. So you can see our Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube accounts, and uh, you will see what we do so far for the raising awareness. So um, on the top left, it's our communication toolkit, which is a really great tool. If you're going to uh, run the Cape, I'm going to thank especially to Oksana, because we were not aware of those type of things, but they were very familiar. FAO was very familiar due to World Food Day. They were always doing this type of uh, communication toolkits. This toolkit was amazing for us to reach the provincial directories because it's just a PDF document which has all the awareness materials, from videos to brochures to, to, to strategic document. With one click, uh, all our provincial directors or other stakeholders from private sector or NGOs, they could download it and use it according to the rules, because uh, of course. And it's, uh, it really helped a lot to disseminate uh, the, the materials which we have produced under this campaign. And what you see, oh, I'm sorry that it's in Turkish, uh, it's a brochure for the date marking. It's a very simple brochure with very simple diagrams to tell people the difference between use by and best before dates. And on the top right corner, you say, uh, which means in English, you pledge so you could bring the record because we have broken two Guinness World Records with our campaign. And on the, on the top right bottom, uh, bottom right, uh, you can see our animation movie, again, thanks to FAO. We have a three-minute animation movie uh, with our mascot and, our, and the food heroes, which, which tells the children how the food comes to our home and why we shouldn't waste it. Uh, so it's, it's very important and it's fun uh, so that uh, children will understand it without getting disturbed and irritated, you know. So I mentioned our provincial directorates and other uh, things. We, run the, we begin the campaign officially on 20th of May 2020. So it was the pandemics which started on March 2020 in Turkey. But uh, which didn't stop us. So you could see the people with wearing full face masks and other things. But we were on the field. We were on the streets. Uh, because the food safety was really on top, of, became top of the agenda during the COVID-19 pandemic. So, so uh, our provincial directorates and the municipalities uh, supported us. Uh, and they showed our videos on the metro stations, bus stations. It was mostly all free of charge. They supported us because reducing food loss and waste is not a political or is not a um, is not something uh, which changes with the agenda. It's top on the agenda, and everyone can do something about it. And everyone can come together under this topic, actually. So mostly, they uh, we are very um, ap appreciative for those uh, our partners which supported us almost free of charge for they renting their billboards and showing those because it's an advertisement area. They make money out of it, but they didn't ask anything. And the whole Turkey united 
for this campaign, which we are really proud. So you could see the videos from YouTube. We have recipes, we have uh, chats and other things, interviews with uh, some influencers which are famous in Turkey. You can see our Twitter account and on the right, uh, you can see our Instagram account, which gives uh, the consumers tips to how to reduce food waste. And uh, other activities which we are also so proud, so I'm going to thank again Rushan Hanım because she did amazing things with uh, our other provincial directorates in Istanbul and in Ankara. Uh, they did so much for the, for the youth, for the people. These are the photos from gleaning activities because in Turkey, uh, one of the speakers, uh, I think it was Lucia, I don't uh, recall, mentioned that the, the fresh products, the, uh, the fruits and the vegetables remain on the field because it doesn't cover the cost to, you know, uh, collect them. But what we do is uh, all around Turkey, it begins with Izmir and continues with Ankara, uh, with our, our Altında Provincial Directorate, we gather youth, volunteer youth, and uh, we find fields and we got, uh, we got the gleaning activities and uh, we meet those uh, surplus products with the people in need. It's, it's amazing, I must tell you. I, must, uh, I, I should recommend it to, I'm definitely recommend it to everyone because it's not only gleaning and afterwards those people, those university students, whenever they are, wherever they are, they see the historic places or I don't know, like uh, they see the Ephesus and other things. So it's a very uh, fulfilling uh, experience. It's not only seeing the the fruit on the, getting the fruit on the, uh, I don't know, on the field and giving to people in need, but it's also kind of a cultural activity. So it's, uh, it's amazing. And our, uh, another uh, very fun activity, it's the kitchen workshop, Save Your Food kitchen workshops. We did uh, so many all around Turkey. So I'm, again, I would like to thank those people, uh, my colleagues who organized those kitchen workshops. Uh, they found uh, women, men, high level, unemployed, everyone, children, uh, they gather them, uh, due to pandemics, almost like uh, 10 to 12 people. So we do these uh, kind of activities. We teach them food safety, how to reduce food waste at their home, and uh, they, are, they are learning by doing. And of course, school activities. I mentioned Jano, so uh, he's famous for the, for the children, and it's good for us to reach the children. So we hold so many school activities also because we are so lucky that our food inspector is also obliged to go to the schools and investigate the canteens. Also, while they are going, of course, they could, um, they have the ability to inform people, inform children, the students, to how to reduce food waste at their home. And of course, another thing that we are proud is the guidelines. We published five very important guidelines one is for logistics, the other is for the hotel, restaurant, cafe sector, food service sector, and the other is uh, for composting, the other is for the retail services, supermarkets, and the other is for the consumers, which are already be down downloadable uh, free of charge from gdanakoru.com. Uh, and also I saw uh, some other brochures which are printed versions in the, in the lobby. Not lobby, but uh, no, I, that place outside. So, I mentioned that we have almost like 100 actions which are in our action plan. And almost one third of those actions are related, had to be done within the partnership of municipalities. Because municipalities hold the food markets, they hold the municipal waste, they reach the customers, they are everywhere, they are everywhere. So what we did, again, together with FAO, we um, designed a kind of a menu for them to pick what they could do, given their uh, abilities, what they could, do, they could do to reduce food loss and waste in their cities. And what we had done, what we had achieved in one year. Okay. So I mentioned that uh, we begin the campaign in 2020, May, and then uh, before beginning it, we we hold, as the Minister of Agriculture, we hold a protest because we knew that we wanted to assess the results with the campaign. And after one year, we did the post-test 
again with the consumers. It's a form test from a, a third party independent uh, consultant uh, firm which run this survey. So what we found out that consumers started to waste less, less, and all around Turkey households saved around 80 million United States dollars. Due to these very little and easy tips like shop plan and uh, be aware of the date labels, etc. And we reached a 20% rise on the awareness of date labeling. And 40% decrease in overcooking and portioning because we share so much information on our social media. And then afterwards, uh, I showed you some of our guys on composting. Uh, we saw a 22% rise on recycling of wasted food. They can do composting on their balcony or in their garden. And 93% of the consumers find the campaign useful, and 84% are more cautious about food waste now. And these are our Guinness World Records. One is for with uh, 790,000 pledges, uh, most pledges received for an environmental sustainability campaign, and the other one, the bigger one, which belonged to China, not on food waste, but res responsible cycling, actually. We broke this record for the most pledges received for a campaign with 881,000 uh, pledges received from the, from the consumers. So thank you very much. Again, I apologize for my voice, but I'm also thankful that I survived this uh, presentation. And I'm really happy uh, that I was with you after two years. Thank you very much. Well, Zainab, your voice was loud and clear. Uh, thank you very much. Um, this, what Zainab presented, is an, uh, again an outstanding example how a government-led campaign can make a big differences. Make a big difference because this campaign uh, for, uh, started at national level. It trickled down to municipalities. And from there, it went to the businesses, including the retail, the horeca. And the retail, speci specifically, I think that is something to be proud of here in Turkey, that you managed to get the retail open and active in uh, reducing food waste. Because I remember when we started all these uh, food loss and waste programs uh, about 10 years ago, the, the retail sector was very difficult to get on board and to be open about their, um, their business and, and how, what they can do. And it also focuses strongly on the consumer and their responsibility and also the children. Uh, because uh, to change people's behavior, the best way to start is with children. I have only one concern about the, the mascot, uh, which you said is to at attract children. When I, when I was a child in the Netherlands, I was told, or we were told, that little green men are aliens from the planet Mars. Mostly evil, but uh, maybe that is not uh, not a problem anymore uh, these days. Okay, this uh, brings us to the end of uh, of session one. As I said, because we have lost some time, um, uh, we skipped the question and answer. And I would again encourage you to uh, submit your questions that you have. For example, by giving them to me or to Oksana on paper, or by all means, uh, go on the Slack platform. I think you all have been have received the, the the link to that, and the people joining online they have can see it in the, the Zoom chat. The link to the Slack platform where you can uh, interact with each other and where you can submit your your questions. And if you have, uh, still have um, any problem with that, you can um, contact my colleague uh, Katarina Antanovic who is standing there uh, on the side of the, the room, and she will explain to you how, to, how it works and how to get on, on it and so on. Then now I hand over back to, the, to Roushain, the Master of Ceremony. Thank you, Robert. Extraordinary insights, thoughts, and presentations. So we all should extend gratitude to our panelists and our dearest moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, now we're moving for forward with a 15 minutes of coffee break. Uh, so see you all in this meeting room in 15 minutes. Thank you.
distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Now we are proceeding to session two, which is entitled Action, Food Supply Chain Processes and Capacity of this ballroom. Thank you. Up to you, Robert. Thank you, Roshain. Uh, I would like to invite um, um, Ahmad Soliman, and Nicholas Hamilton, and Ferro Gortes to take a seat on the stage. <clears throat> Okay, I hope you all enjoyed your coffee break and I hope you have observed the surplus quantity of snacks which are there, uh, which are at risk to get wasted, but we are in discussion with the hotel on that and I'm sure that uh, it's going to be taken care of very well. <clears throat> Our uh, first speaker for session two, which is on, um, uh, session two is about action in the food supply chain. Uh, food supply chain processes and uh, food supply chain capacities. And our first uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Bruno Menne. He will join online. Uh, policy advisor at Copa Cojega. Um, Bruno, you have the floor. Perfect. Um, so good morning everyone, uh, thank you, it's, it's a real pleasure to be there with you, it's just a pity that uh, I could not join physically, unfortunately. Um, so to briefly present myself, my name is Bruno Mann. I'm working for the organization Copa Cogeca. And so basically we represent farmers and agri-cooperative at uh, the EU level. Um, so now I will share my presentation when it comes to, to food waste and, and food losses. Um, there we go. So if it agrees to work properly, perfect. So uh, what about farmers and agri cooperative when it comes to, to food waste and, uh, and food losses? So over the years, uh, it has become more and more of a, of a concern for farmers. Uh, can you still see the slides? Because, yeah, okay. Uh, it has become more and more of a, of a concern for farmers, of course. Uh, and there has been some issues with food losses that have been increasing to due to, to climate conditions as well uh, and especially now today with the the covid crisis uh with with the war in ukraine uh, it has a, a big impact on on uh, on food production uh on food availability and if not on food availability on food affordability and for this reason it becomes even even more important to reduce food waste and food losses as much as possible so, as I was saying, for farmers and cooperatives, uh, over the past few years, it has become more and more of an important issue for them. And to reduce food waste uh, to a maximum and, and to some extent food losses, uh, they have focused on different ways to do it. One way is to shorten the, the food chain. Another way is to repurpose, uh, repurposing of byproducts. Another one is food waste diagnosis, and I will explain a bit more what it is exactly. Uh, then, of course, food donation, and finally, the repurposing of food surplus. So, regarding shortening the food chain, why is it a way uh, to to avoid uh, food waste? It's because often one issue that we see uh, that results in in food waste it's the fact that between uh, what the the producer, the primary producer, the farmer produces, and between the the demand of the consumers, there are a lot of actors, and because there are so many actors, sometimes we don't know as primary producers exactly what the consumers is wanting because uh, the the communication between all the 
between all those actors is not always perfect. And because of that, we cannot adapt the production, the quantity produced to the demand of consumers. And we, we sometimes end up in situations where you have perfectly good products that do not find their, their consumers. And this is, of course, a pity. So uh, in that regard, we, we have several farmers across Europe uh, who decided to develop direct sales. This is uh, more and more uh, the case, um, and it's becoming a, quite a strong trend. And so basically, it's really directly the farmers or the cooperative selling to consumers uh, without going through uh, processors and retailers. Uh, we have been, uh, we have seen that this tendency was especially increasing with uh, the COVID crisis because people had more people, uh, more time, sorry, and so it was easier for them to to go directly to to their local farmers, to the local uh, farmers market. But also, we started to implement uh, delivery services directly to the consumer, and we clearly see uh, with that that we managed to reduce uh, food waste. So here is an example uh, in Italy. Uh, so farm groceries, ding dong, a far, farmer at your door. And there it was uh, an initiative of our farmer um, a union in uh, Coldiretti in Italy. And so they were really doing home delivery service uh, throughout the whole country. Uh, they also did it through the Campania Mica network uh, with more and more home deliveries of agricultural food products. And also they started to develop with the Terra Nostra network uh, home deliveries of ready to, to eat dishes. So really uh, the farmer produces, but then also transfers farm and cooked at the farm and then deliver ready to eat dishes. So uh, in over a week now, they uh, they managed to have 700,000 deliveries. And as I'm saying, it's, it's a growing trend. Uh, and also, it's not only about food waste, but it also allows to, to get a, a fairer share uh, for, for the farmer in the sense that you have no intermediaries. And so the, the consumer has a good price, but at the same time, the farmers uh, get paid quite a good price as well. Then another way to reduce food waste and food losses for farmers, uh, it's the repurposing of byproducts. Uh, so basically, uh, when we are talking about byproducts or co-products, it's uh, when you you pro you produce uh, whether it's uh, um, sugar, you you have beetroots, and then you have the pulp of the beetroots, and before you are not doing so much uh, with it, uh, but now more and more for all those co-products, those byproducts, we find uh, new ways to to include them in people's diet or at least uh, in animals' diet. So we use them as feed as well. And so sometimes there were products, co-products that were not used at all before, and we find a way to use them. Sometimes there were co-products that were already used to produce energy, but we manage now to, uh, to use them to, to produce feed, or they were already used to produce feed, and now we manage to use them to produce food for, for humans. And so there is a step up in the food waste hierarchy. So there, it's also a way to, to reduce uh, food waste. And so here, as an example, in Spain, uh, there is uh, the, the company, the plant that is co called Indulela. And basically, this company was created uh, quite a few years ago by a group of 170 co agri cooperatives. And this company is processing, uh, it's a food processing company, and what they are doing is that they're indeed finding new outlets for co-products of foods. So now we are recovering food skins to make fibers, essential oils, sugar, and polyphenols, while before we were just throwing them away. Uh, and so, as I was saying, we are also using new co-products for feed. Uh, and for the, the part that we do not manage to transform into food for human or into feed, in, in De Lula, they are using it as uh, they have a biomethane plant uh, and they produce electricity uh, with it uh, and, and calories uh, to, to make the plant work. So it's, it's nearly self-sufficient in terms of energy. 
Then uh, another way that uh, has been developing over the past uh, five years, it's food waste uh, diagnosis. So agri cooperative too, together with other actors, quite often uh, national institutes or universities, they they develop uh, f food waste diagnosis methods. So basically a way uh, to diagnose on a farm or on a processing plant, how to reduce what is the level of food waste, where it is located exactly and how to reduce it. And now uh, we see more and more, uh, let's say, uh, a mainstreaming of those methods of, of diagnosis and their use on farm and, and processing plants. And this allows them to reduce food waste. Uh, we have especially an example in France where uh, the cooperative La Coopération Agricole, which represents and all the French cooperatives, cooperative, uh, was involved with the ADEME Institute in the creation of a toolbox uh, for waste, food waste diagnosis. And now they are spreading that toolbox all over the country with workshop and seminars to basically uh, give the tools to, to cooperatives even farmers uh, to establish diagnosis uh, uh, of food waste and for we now uh, start to see the concrete results of that and for example there is the bread factory um, which is called Jacques et Brossard which is part of the cooperative Limagrin and thanks to this food waste diagnosis they managed to reduce uh, by 60 tons uh, the food waste they were producing which is about 10 percent of their food waste which man uh, allowed them to save 30,000 euros a year so 10 percent of the the food uh, the cost associated with food waste and also it allowed them to reduce by 40 uh, uh, tons of co2 uh, emissions per year so here we can see the concrete results of those food waste diagnoses. Then, of course, uh, when you are not able to find uh, the market, uh, because as I was saying, there is uh, not a perfect perfect alignment between food production and uh, and uh, and the demand from consumers, or for other reasons. Uh, then one way to, to avoid food waste is uh, food donation by giving the, the surplus that they are close to date or also what we see now with the, the one kid vegetables that uh, are not always uh, wanted by, by, uh, by the retailers. Uh, then it's a way to, to, to find an outlet for them and to reduce the food waste. Uh, there we have examples all over Europe, uh, but uh, in Italy, it's it's quite uh, it's quite developed more and more, but also because they they have national laws that allow them to 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 do uh, food donations uh, uh, more easily, and so they have been uh, campaigning, especially during the COVID crisis, uh, with collaboration with elderly centers, caritas, parishes, municipalities to donate food uh, directly from farmers to to those. Uh, to those uh, places. Um, then, also sometimes you cannot uh, avoid for surplus, and sometimes it's not possible uh, possible to donate it for for different reasons. And then the the question is, what do you do with them? And so sometimes you have to find a way to create new products or energy with those food surplus. So it's not perfect because then you transform what is food in something that is not food anymore, but at least you, you make something out of it. Um, and so one example uh, that we had, uh, especially in, during the COVID crisis, it's because all the restaurants were closed, uh, the consumption of, of wine uh, was decreasing quite a bit. And so we found ourselves with surplus for wine and some of our cooperative and farmers decided uh, to make uh, disinfecting alcohol uh, out of this wine uh, to use as, uh, as disinfecting uh, for, for the COVID-19 crisis. And this is what was quite successful. But of course, this is only happening in extreme cases because we always want to avoid uh, that type of situation. So now, family remarks. Uh, so, what are the the paths that can be explored to further reduce food waste and, and food losses? 
Uh, first, clearly, there is an issue of human and financial resources to spread the knowledge, because we see a lot of initiative happening in different member states in the EU, and I'm sure all over the world. Uh, and so tools that are developed, like the, the, the food, uh, food waste diagnosis I was talking about earlier. But of course, farmers are often very isolated in their farms, and so they don't know about all those tools. And so we need resources to spread the knowledge, to give trainings to people, uh, and this could help us uh, further reduce food waste and food losses. Then there is also an issue with coordination and measurement because, of course, you, you start reducing something if you're able to measure it. And there we need some more harmonization on how to measure food waste, what tools are av available to measure food waste. Uh, now, uh, in Europe, we, we have the food waste and loss platform uh, that is working on that, but, but we need easier and more practical means to, to do it. Uh, then one other way would be to further focus on unfair trading practices. And by that, I mean that sometimes uh, we have last minute cancellation of orders. So basically from one day to another, the farmers find himself with tons and tons of carrots and he doesn't know what to do with them because the retailers at the last minute said, okay, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, buying them in the end. And so, of course, this, this can result in, in quite a bit of food waste. And so if we were able to, uh, to, to make sure that this does not happen anymore, uh, it would help us reducing food, loss, uh, food waste. Then there is also uh, the issue of food losses and uh, and food safety. Of course, food safety is uh, is extremely important, the most important things when it comes to food. Uh, but sometimes we see that food safety requirements become so high that they are not risk based, but they are really hazard based. So they are not focusing on the health risk uh, that is really there for the consumer, but only on the health hazard. And this sometimes results uh, in the loss of, uh, of food that could be that could be eaten. Uh, one example is regarding the mycotoxins on cereals. We have at the moment in Europe very, very uh, uh, strict rules when it comes to the presence of mycotoxins and uh, they have been very efficient uh, because we didn't have any issues with uh, food safety issues with my mycotoxins so far but now we are also thinking of going even further and so we wonder why if there is no health risk why go further and risk having some of that food that cannot reach the consumer or not even the the they cannot even be used as animal feed anymore. Uh, this would be a great loss of, of uh, food. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have food losses due to climate change, uh, especially this summer, the drought was, uh, was very harsh. Uh, and so we have food losses that are directly linked to that. And that means that we need new tools to have more resistant crops uh, to, to drought. Uh, but also with the increasing of temperatures, we see also the development of new pests that we didn't use to have in Europe. So that means that we will need uh, new tools to be able to, to combat those new pests. Uh, and in, in that regard, the new breeding techniques uh, is, is a tool that uh, we should be, we should have available. So you see, uh, there is a lot that is being done to reduce food waste and food losses at the primary production level, but of course we can go, we can go further than that. And I will stop here. And of course, I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions at a later stage. Let me just stop sharing my screen. Here we go. Thank you, Bruno. This was uh, a very interesting insight from the farming sector. And um, I also noticed that although we have an impractical uh, definition of food loss and food waste, where uh, food waste is more related to uh, retail and uh, horeca sector and consumer level and food loss more at farmer level. We also have an old original definition which says food loss is by accident and food waste is intentional. Or so. But in this case you, you really show uh, the risks of food waste, uh, that uh, good food 
fit for human consumption needs to be discarded because it cannot proceed in the chain, uh, that that is uh, an actual problem and therefore needs to be addressed. And I like the, the, that you pointed out also out the challenges that you face, because the challenges that you listed there, I think they can all be overcome if uh, the different actors in the food system come together and contribute to solve them. Uh, and, and this illustrates the need for collaboration, and, and therefore, uh, that is what this conference wants to achieve. That the, the, the issues being raised here are being picked up by uh, other people who have the expertise and the capacity to, uh, to support and to address that or so. And then you can, we can help each other in order to overcome these, these problems. Okay, then now I uh, proceed to the next speaker. Uh, which is uh, Mr. Ahmed Soliman from uh, Quality and Food Safety Design, the Quality and Food Safety Design Director at Danone. Thanks, Robert, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today uh, to present uh, basically uh, our journey uh, that we call Label Better to Waste Less. Uh, I'm Ahmed Soleiman. I'm the Quality and Food Safety InDesign Director for Danone, and uh, today I'm going to present to you uh, this, uh, this journey that, uh, that we started in Danone almost now two years ago. Uh, towards, uh, towards uh, uh, making sure that we, we waste less uh, for our products. So for those who do not know Danone, uh, we are a multi, multinational uh, food operator operating in so many countries, uh, based out of Europe, but uh, operating everywhere and through different categories. So we have the, uh, the we operate in the dairy uh, category, but we also operate in plant-based, we also operate in waters and uh, non-alcoholic beverages, and as well in specialized nutrition. So we we, we have presence across several categories, across the uh, the uh, the food uh, the food uh, categories, which gives us a little bit of a challenge when it comes to uh, the date coding and how to date code uh, in the best possible way, as you can imagine, because we have the full spectrum from what we call fresh to long shelf life uh, uh, products in in our portfolio. So starting from the start, it uh, it's basically starts with our belief. And our belief is that uh, we firmly believe that the health of, of people and the planet are very much inter interconnected. And in such, Danon has developed this one planet, one health vision. And uh, it is very much in accordance with the 2030 uh, uh, goals of, of the UN. And hence, we are fully committed to, to basically reduce our food waste as part of our own category uh, strategies. And, uh, and this was demonstrated by our commitments. So in 2015, we had a commitment to reduce by half uh, our uh, un unrecovered food waste. But then we stepped up this in 2020 uh, through our engagement to, to, to for the sustainable goal of 12.3 uh, to reduce the food, food waste within our operations and, and supply chain. Hence, to make that practical, as we need to implement that on the ground, we needed to understand how and where are we going to do that. And of course, we, we, in order to do that, we needed to do it an end to, with an end-to-end -end solution. So starting from the upstream, passing through the operations, and ending with our downstream. In that, it was very important to identify who are the critical partners that we need to work with, because um, those are the partners that help us to achieve this goal and make, make some practical uh, uh, steps on the ground to make, it, uh, to make it happen. So starting with diagnosing the problem, uh, we saw that 10% uh, of the food waste in the, 10% uh, of the food waste is in the EU supply chain, and a very important part of it is related to what several colleagues have been highlighting before, the fact that Consumers do not know well, how to deal with the product, 
uh, and reading and, co and, and comprehending what is written with the, food, with the food label that they have in front of them. And what does it mean and what is the difference between a use by or, uh, or a best before date and even some other labels that we might be facing uh, apart from, from that. Going a little bit, we also collected some information from, uh, from, our, from our partners that were very, very valuable to us into identifying the course of action. So uh, in, in an impact study uh, from, from one of our partners, we found out that 17% of the yogurt, 17 of yogurt is wasted in Europe each year, out of which from a result in the EU for the UK market, we found out that date label is the top reason why uh, people dis 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 discard this product, even though the product is not even opened. And uh, this almost represents 70% of the waste. The thing is, the uh, use by date is what is most, what was mostly used for the fresh product, specifically yogurt, in the EU. Hence, there is a direct correlation. And last but not least, we found out, I mean, that consumers do care and they really want to save and uh, make sure that they are contributing to uh, uh, controlling the waste uh, uh, as much as possible, specifically after the pandemic, of sure, for sure. So with this data compiled, we, we, we found out that we need to, to compile a position that whereby in our categories, we need to scan them and we need to use the best suited date label, including a shift from UBD to BBD wherever possible in the categories that it allows us to, to do so. But of course, this is much easier said than done because in order to do that, we needed to make sure that we have a clear roadmap and a clear, a clear uh, process that would allow us to do that because I remind you, the idea here was not to do that from a central point of view, but actually to enable the CBUs in order to be able to do that country by country, even SQ by SQ at some points in time. So it was important that we have a methodology by which everybody is aligned and everybody can implement as we are going forward. And hence, uh, we, also, we also find out that this is one step of the way, but another very, very important aspect is how to impact our consumers' understanding and practices, because this is the receiving end. So we needed to create the traction and the demand at the consumer level as well in order to be capable to move forward in the best possible and the most efficient way. Hence, we developed what we call the label better to waste less approach. It's a four-step approach that basically from a, a food and beverage operator as ours, was key to make sure that we are compliant, we are consumer-centric, and we do not jeopardize our food safety. So these are very important aspects that we needed to make sure that we are, uh, we are still uh, fulfilling, even as we are moving into, into our, our, our initiative. So for that, the step one of this process was very clearly checking what are the mandatory prerequisites. And that includes food law requirements and food safety requirements. Then for the step two, uh, what we call setting the stage, it's about consumer quality, it's about the competitive environment scanning and understanding what, are, what is the environment that we are operating in and how can we better uh, uh, utilize it to the, to the purpose that we want. And then last but not least, it's our own capability because lots of food operators might have the good intention to move forward, but sometimes you do not have the capability to do it. And it's important to understand that as part of setting the stage. Then in step three, it's about taking decision. And here governance and deciding on the governance model becomes an important step because as we said, as we are going to, as we are going to move, country by country, category by category, even SQ by SQ, it was important to identify this governance model. Then last but not least, it was about activation and how can we work with our partners in alliance in, and uh, regarding the communication, how to choose our relevant brands, and last but not least, what are the communication platforms that we need to, to go through? Because we discovered that at some point in time, and as I will go through the details, internal communication can be as important as external communication. So going a little bit into details through those steps, what do, what do they exactly mean? So first, as we said, it's a, it's a license to operate step. Step one is a license to operate step, meaning is it legally accessible, what we want to do, yes or no? And is it compliant to the food safety 
decision tree that we have developed internally through our uh, food safety uh, experts. Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in relationship to the, uh, to the food law, it is important to understand what is the, what is the regulatory uh, environment looks like in the different market in which we are operating, and whether a use by best versus best before, are they allowed interchangeably, yes or no? And what do they mean in the, in, the, in the environment that we are discussing? Hence, a legal analysis needs to be done. And, and, this, and this is a prerequisite in order to start the action in the first place. Uh, it is important to note here that if any of those uh, elements are not satisfied, so we have a no to any of those, it means that we are stopping the process and we keep what we have, what we have today. So it's a prerequisite that we need to solve even at some point actively before we start to move into the next, to the next level. When speaking about the food safety and uh, the, the flow, the flow, the decision flow in order to decide whether from a food safety point of view this works, yes or no, uh, we have developed for the different categories different, uh, different uh, decision flows that were, that were communicated and validated uh, first uh, with, uh, with, with not only within Danone but also with our partners, uh, our external experts from food safety in order to make sure that this, this makes sense. But basically not going through the details what it entails as a risk assessment is that it includes what are the target consumer group that we are targeting. It makes a huge difference whether we are targeting babies, we are targeting general population, we are, tar we are targeting special categories like elderly. So it's important to understand what is the target consumer group we are, we are targeting. Second point is what are the, process, the product and the process inherent characteristics, characteristics and whether they allow us uh, to have this as part of the food safety uh, uh, move, as, as we are moving and whether it allows us this food safety protection throughout the shelf life or the intended shelf life. Then there is the what is the shelf life criteria that we need to meet at the end of the shelf life. It is very important to have, to have this in mind as we are going through. And then last but not least, what are the supporting market conditions? Do we have the good supply chain that would, that would help us in order to achieve what we want to achieve. So all of those are, are, are factors that need to be taken into consideration while the food safety assessment is done uh, related to the, different, to the different categories. It would have been, of course, life is not easy. Yeah? It would have been easy to say, yeah, it's, it's not allowed. It's not allowed by food safety, so we go. Or, it is allowed because our decision flow uh, says it is allowed. But of course, we end up with lots of gray areas whereby we really don't know what happens. And in such context, it's important to say that uh, here, we use, we use the, uh, the developed uh, 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 decision flows at the European level in order to build what, what is a compliance dossier. And here, we find out that we need, for example, to collect more consumer data. Uh, we need sometimes to conduct some challenge tests, or we need to know more about the local targets. And with this information, we can, based on a risk-based approach, and I'm so glad that Bruno mentioned that as well uh, earlier, that we apply a risk-based approach in order to reach a situation whereby we provide clarity to those gray cases and we are able to move forward uh, with a decision that is super clear and a decision that helps us to, to, to move forward with the category that we want. As step one is cleared, we, went, we go into step two, and step two is, as I said, we, check, we are checking basically three major areas. First one is quality. So what are the consumer key criteria, and what is the risk of deviation and mitigation levers that we can have in order to move forward? For example, one of the valuable information that we had related to that was what is the average temperature in the, in the, in the refrigerators in the supply chain in France uh, for example. So this is an important piece of information that could help you to take a decision as you're moving forward. The second is, is the potential uh, the, the, to assess the potential impact for the customers and impact on sales and the, and the competitive environment in which we are operating, which is very important. It is not, uh, we found out that it's not feasible to go uh, alone. It's always good to work within partnership 
either with, with partners, but also with other food operators, uh, so that to create this movement, because it will be, I mean, it, it helps to explain better to the consumers, and it helps to explain better to the customers, which is very important. And then last but not least, we need to investigate our own capabilities. Are we capable to do that? Are we capable in our own manufacturing facilities to manage two types of date coding sometimes? And is this, is this something that is, that is feasible and easily managed without any issues to our, uh, to our uh, daily production? Once, once we pass, we go into step three, which is deciding and where is this decided? And in a local One Planet, One Health committee, uh, this, uh, this, this committee is, 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 is the committee that is responsible to take that. We do a final regulatory assessment. We decide which brands are we going to go for. We, we, we start ad, uh, ad hoc advocacy plans, but we start as well uh, communicating with our, with our partners. And most importantly, we start as well in, in, in some internal communication. As we go into the last step of activation, we start, as we said, the activation should be done country by country, in engaging the relevant stakeholders, of course, with a brand activation uh, and an internal communication that is not, as I said, less important than the external one. Because we need the donors at that point in time, we needed all the donors to be ambassadors of the message that we want to deliver to the consumers. And you cannot preach something that you are not yourself convict, convinced with. So in such context, it was very important that all the company is on the same page and aligned on that. Uh, also, a very important part on the activation is how to follow through and how to create dashboards that would help us to, to follow up, but also to measure where are we on the performance. So starting with organizing multi-stakeholders events, uh, it is important to, to make sure that we are, we are clearly uh, understanding and gaining knowledge from other expertise in the, in the, uh, with, within, within the industry and, and from NGOs, from uh, regulatory bodies, and from other, other players in the market in order to gain this experience, but as well to team up with, uh, with, uh, with NGOs who are working and helping us to, 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 to realize this. As we said, with Too Good To Go, for example, uh, the, best, the, the best before dates and the logo uh, for that helped us a lot in order to make sure that the consumers understand and try themselves what is logical for them, and some of them are already doing, but sometimes they do not know whether they, they are illegible to do it, or they are confident enough to do it. So this helped us a lot, and this, this communication helped us a lot in order to make sure that this, this message is clearly, is clearly delivered. So on the activation, we found out that there are also lots of channels. It's not only one channel, and it's not one channel that fits all. So in such context, sometimes the communication is happening on pack. There is, and, and there are people who read the label, but we need to understand that in today's world, not everybody reads the label, not everybody reads what's on the pack. So in such context, there is also an online platform of communication. And last but not least, the, a very important channel, of course, of communication is at the point of sale, where people are, are, uh, are asked and challenged, and some discussions are happening uh, in order to discuss about this, this food waste and how much it's to Yogurt is too tasty to waste, as you see. In, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the picture. And at last, as I said, some sort of dashboards that allowed us today to say, after two years of starting this journey, that we are almost at 97% target of the migration uh, within Europe, within the European CBUs, of the migration from the UBD to the BBD for the designated categories. And we are on track to, as we said, to do a risk-based approach for the rest of the categories where we need to, to move forward. So in conclusion, I want to leave you basically with, with uh, those three main messages. Uh, the first one is that tackling waste is key for all food operators. Why? Because it is really from what we saw, it is what the consumer want. Second, date coding is only one of the effective levers that we are having, but it is an important one but it mandates really a disciplined process in order to be applied. Third, you cannot do it on your own. You need your, uh, your, your, your uh, environment to be working with you. You need to partner with the important uh, uh, 
bodies who can help and support to realize this. So effective partnership with key stakeholder really helps. And with that, I would like to, to thank you and, uh, and uh, leave the floor back to, back to you, Robert. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, uh, this is, uh, for me as a food technologist, a very interesting presentation. The other ones are also interesting, but this is really something I can uh, empathize with because I see you as a uh, dairy processor and many things you can control, like the technology that you use for your yogurt and the packaging and the organization of your business and the marketing. But some things you cannot control, and that is, for instance, the national legislation the, related to food safety and, and, and the labeling requirements and so on. And therefore, what you also said in your last words, you need to work together, you need to get support from the national legislators. And that is what we have been talking about in session one. And then you also, I'm very happy to see that you are also collaborating with uh, the civil society uh, initiative, Too Good To Go. Uh, with regard to messaging to consumers, which we are going to address more in detail in session five of this uh, conference. So your, your whole presentation really illustrates the need for the different sectors in society, public and private and academic and, uh, and uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, non-commercial, to work together in order to, to, to get to uh, effective uh, food loss and waste uh, reduction. Then, now we proceed uh, with the next speaker, which is uh, Ms. Eugenia Carrara, Secretary General of the World Union of Wholesale Markets. Eugenia, the floor is yours. Eugenia, I can see you speaking, but we cannot hear you. Sorry, Robert. I'm like uh, really happy to be here and thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be with all of you today. And I'm like really sorry that I couldn't go. We're going to have our forthcoming um, conference in two weeks. So I'm, <laughs> I'm planning everything there, but I'm uh, really grateful to have this opportunity. And I want to um, uh, address all um, all, all, all my congratulations to the FAO Regional Office and thank you for the invitation, of course, to the Turkish and Netherlands government and the Economic Cooperation Organization. So uh, I can share my screen. I will do it. Okay, so can you all see it? Yeah. Perfect. Can you all see the screen? Yeah. So um, the first thing that I will do is uh, I will give you like a little bit like uh, what is WUM in a nutshell, because a lot of you probably you don't you don't know what is the World Union of Wholesale Markets. So WUM is the largest network of wholesale markets and fresh food actors uh, of the world. So we gather around two hundred twenty. Um, about two hundred twenty fresh food actors were uh, located in. Sorry, but I, I have my, someone is using, I, I, I need to read my, my, my notes. That's why I'm, I'm not putting it in, in big. Is that okay? So, uh, but can you see it well? Or is small, is small maybe. So we're located in, in, in 43 countries, in five continents, and around 50% of all the fresh food that is distributed in the world goes through our infrastructures. So something that uh, I always like to say, because a lot of people don't know it, is that 80% of wholesale markets, uh, and in Europe this is going uh, up to 90%, uh, are uh, semi-public infrastructures. So uh, a lot of them are completely public, uh, uh, some other ones are 80% public, so with a multi-stakeholder engagement coming from Ministry of Finance or Agriculture, and then with local uh, collectivities as the city hall or um, or maybe a metropolitan area. What makes um, wholesale markets what we call the operational ally of governments to, to ensure food security? So um, about food waste. 
So uh, what is the, uh, the impact and why it's so important uh, to reduce food waste? The first thing is like today, uh, we know all of us were in a really complicated situation uh, in terms of like land, land degradation, climate change, uh, productivity of, uh, of um, land that is decreasing, population that is of course growing, but still today we have uh, enough food to feed uh, 10 million people. Uh, one third is thrown away and then we still have almost 900 million people suffering uh, from hunger. So of course uh, this situation is uh, really non-acceptable and uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, different um, indicators showing us why it's really important uh, to tackle uh, food waste and actually um, the good news about it is like we have today uh, real and concrete solutions that of course uh, as my uh, colleagues from uh, Copa Cojeca and, and Danone were saying needs a lot of multi-stakeholder um, engagement and what we call um, uh, a systemic approach uh, in order to be uh, solved but we have already like uh, several uh, several cases that can show us solutions. So what can wholesale markets do uh, and what is the, the role in terms of uh, food waste reduction? Okay, so like, um, as you know, uh, probably like fruits and vegetables, because of the specificity of these kind of products, they are uh, fra fragile, really perishable. They need a lot of, um, a lot of, of let's say, of, um, uh, support in order to to have a longer uh, shelf life in terms of packaging, cold chain, etc. They are today, unfortunately, the most wasted products. Okay, so inside of wholesale markets, the waste average is not that high, but of course we can still decrease it down. So a fusion, uh, a fusion. Um, um, a, a fusion study that was uh, released in 2016, uh, and this is pointing out again the need to have uh, now more data and to to have the support of the European Commission uh, in order uh, to um, to have more like actualized data show that in in average just in Europe five percent of the food that is uh, that comes through wholesale market is wasted. Okay, but this change, of course, amid the markets. Some markets are unfortunately going to twelve percent, and some other markets are going to zero point one three or zero point five percent. What is like really much lower than twelve percent that that we're saying. So uh, in this in these regards, of course, our infrastructures because they are trading mostly these fresh products. They have a role uh, in order uh, to reduce uh, the quantity that is like wasted. And even if, as I was saying before, uh, most of the time we are not um, the segment that is producing the most uh, the most waste. So. Um, um, why um, why also when we, we have this difference of 12 percent no um, what is same I say same same but different um, wholesale markets are today uh, infrastructures that are a little bit recognized they can have like um, a, a way of functioning that is similar to an airport so of course cultures can vary uh, the seasons can be different the weather conditions and geographical conditions have, can be different but uh, Air, like airports have a protocol and have a way of operating that has shown to be secure, efficient, to uh, transport people in a secure way, a lot of amount of people. So it's the same with wholesale markets. So that's why uh, today I want to uh, I want to share with you three uh, cases that can show actually that this can be scale up. Uh, we don't need uh, sometimes to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we have uh, we, we have um, enough data now to try to uh, understand what are the major pain points uh, that wholesale markets uh, are um, are having when they need when when they want to develop these kind of strategies and. Uh, how can how, how can we solve it i will say it really fast but then you will see through the, the examples so of course uh nowadays like the major pay points are like uh, financing access to finance uh, to a specific specific finance to develop these kind of initiatives because of course it's not inside of uh let's say uh the uh, the the, the the structure of wholesale markets to deal with this uh like 
this 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 food that has not been sell, sell uh, by the wholesalers that they are like professional wholesalers so we need like uh, of, of course and particularly for a lot of wholesale markets that as i was saying before they are public so a lot of times they don't have uh, a, lo a lot of revenue so they need a, a support in order to develop like uh, specific uh, strategies towards the reduction of food, food waste the second one is capacity building because again a lot of management in wholesale markets they don't have this um, this vision or the tools maybe to do it and then we need like what we call this multi-stakeholder engagement of course the first engagement should come from uh, the direction of the wholesale market because they are the one that will be piloting of the whole strategy but then because it's a it's a cross-sector uh, infrastructure where with wholesalers association food banks also as i was saying before stakeholders are coming from national government and local government we need need all these stakeholders to come together to really uh, bring uh, bring like a, a complete solution. So I'm going to give now um, some some cases that have proven impact and that I think that today we we can say that they could be duplicated in other wholesale markets. Of course, that we need to make like a, a studies and to see the way that uh, things are functioning, but they are easily adaptable as we will adapt a, 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 a specific protocol to an airport, as I was saying. So the cases are Rangis market, that is a market from uh, uh, Paris region, the Centro Agrilimentare de Roma, that is the, the wholesale market from Rome, and then Mancabarna, that is the wholesale market of um, Bar Barcelona. Okay, so the first case is Le Potage de Marianne, that is uh, Rangis wholesale market. So uh, briefly about uh, the, the market of uh, the uh, Russia's wholesale market. So it's located in Paris area and it's the biggest wholesale market on the world, like with 234 hectares. Uh, so it's bigger than Monaco. And this is managed also by like this company called Semaris, that is, as, as I was saying before, also a semi-public company. Uh, the public sector is owning 75 of, uh, of, of, of the shares of this wholesale market. So they take care of the development operation and, and of course, uh, of the, the development of, of infrastructure also within the market. So Semaris in this in this way, because also it's a really strong wholesale market, they have the economical possibility of developing an inside project after many years of working mostly with associations that were uh, holding um, all, the, all the food waste. So they partner with um, an organization. So it's, this is not a, an association. This is what we call um, a social social economy uh, enterprise so they are making profit and they have employees they don't have volunteers what is making it also much more sustainable so they partner with this um, this company called Le Potage de Marianne that is owned by uh, a really big group of social economy in France called SOS uh, and they uh, they gave them a specific place within the wholesale market so it's, uh, it's an, a, a space in the wholesale market with cold chain and storage capacity in order uh, to uh, help them to co coordinate all the wholesalers that in a daily basis are throwing uh, or they, they, they have a surplus of food that's still consumable uh, uh, for, for, for humans. Uh, why this is super innovative? Is it innovative because uh, as uh, the, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my colleague from Copa Cogeca was saying before, uh, sometimes when you have uh, food banks, but you have volunteers and uh, you have a wholesaler that can give, give away 500 kilos of tomatoes, but like the volunteer cannot come before three. He doesn't have the truck. He doesn't have a storage place. He can take 200 kilos, but not the 500 kilos. So like for the wholesaler, uh, that is this person is uh, like doing business and he have also limited amount of like uh, staff. It's really it's really hard to coordinate with multiple uh, multiple associations and coordinate also delivery at, at different hours so to have this company operating directly inside of the market and going through at the same time through all the different wholesalers for uh, just just to say the wholesale market of of, of uh, Rangis of Paris has uh, 1,000 wholesalers so 1,000 different uh, wholesalers that can potentially have things to give away 
So it's a lot of coordination. And of course, it is a, a big responsibility that needs need investment in terms of tracks, a cold chain of the tracks and everything. So uh, this project is working really, really well. It's uh, been a success. So uh, in 2021, uh, if we see the numbers, uh, they they distribute around uh, 2.5 million meals to vulnerable families. So uh, as I was saying before, like what is Le Potager de Marianne is doing, they are taking everything uh, to um, to their infrastructure, and then they are making the in between with all the different associations. It could be Resto de Coeur, it could be uh, Saint Little Association, it could be also the Food Bank, and they are giving back to them. Sometimes they are giving them at free. Sometimes they are like also charging a little bit in order to have like sustainability in their operations. Um, yeah, and in this way, uh, the the Ranchis market have managed to reduce uh, food food waste till 0.01% when it's like really nothing. So uh, it's uh, really good in this, in, in less than three years, uh, the impact is uh, is really good of this project. But then uh, Ranchi's market is not just doing this uh, in terms of like the, the, the food that is not consumed by, by humans, the food that is not able for human consumption. So they are doing, um, there is use for other things, showing also how to rethink our operations through a circular economy and uh, understanding that actually this food uh, that is uh, today unfortunately wasted uh, can also be a, a solution to create new businesses. So um, the food that is not consumable, 63% uh, is used as a source of energy. Inside of the horse market, they created a methanization bio gas facility uh, so they are using this uh, to create biogas showing also a really good uh, opportunity for a lot of uh, different infrastructures as, as this one so i will go now with a uh, mercabarna uh, case that is also um it's also like a re really really good so it's just launched launched it was launched in march uh, 2000 uh, of, of this of this year um and 2021 and um and 2022 sorry and it's um and it's really good. So it's also a really multi-stakeholder initiative. There are more than 23 different organizations that are participating in this food bank. Of course, the municipality uh, of Barcelona, then the region of Catalonia, uh, a lot of different uh, food bank association, Caritas, wholesalers association uh the the uh the wholesale market and uh the idea what is it is to have also an infrastructure on site uh, that is gathering uh all the produce and then we are like also like um making the division of uh where of the potential of each product so then to redistribute it so the aim is also uh to um, uh, reduce uh food waste uh, drastically as i was saying before like wholesale markets particular mercabarna has a really modern facility with really really good cold chain a lot of like upstream also uh procedures in terms of certification so they don't uh the 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 percentage of things that are is being that are being wasted is already Really, really low but they can still lower it and the objective is to go to in 2025 to zero point uh zero five percent uh what will be uh again um like really halving uh uh uh, by two what, what is wasted today so again uh answering back to uh to to the the sdgs um objectives the third um the third case that i will what, that i will give is the case of car car is uh the wholesale market of of uh, rome and uh this project so it's also a really really big uh, infrastructure so they have this uh this other project that was um actually at the at the at the initial it was an initiative a call to project of the ministry of agriculture of italy at the beginning that uh wanted to finance 50% of a project uh, that will um, uh, enlarge the shelf life of produce. So CAD came with this project that was to create on-site um, a, a, a transformation unit. So it is really a, a unit to create uh, something, to transform 
fruits. So um, what they are doing is like, so this project was uh, accepted by the, uh, the government. So they won and it was half financed uh, by, um, by the Italian uh, national government and half financed by the wholesale market of Rome. And uh, they created this facility where today all the fruit that is not sell uh, during the day they, is taken to this facility and is transformed into cans. Uh, of uh, smash fruit or marmalades without sugar. And then this is redistributed in, uh, in solidar um, grocery shops and it sell at really low price. So it has two different uh, impacts. One is uh, the impact in terms of like, of course, reducing food, food waste and enlarging the shelf life of fruits because this fruit, uh, um, the, the idea is uh, also to have to have to still have the nutritional value and quality of, of fruits, but with a, a longer shell life. So the fruit comes from having around a couple of days of shell life to have uh, around six, seven months in this in this can. And then the second objective is to uh, also uh, foster the consumption of fr fr uh, fruits in uh, lower uh, lower income households because we know that sometimes uh, this is difficult in terms of revenue. So so uh, by creating these cans that are like really accessible to the large public, they can also improve um, the consumption uh, of fruits in this in, in this uh, kind of population. So uh, what um, what like uh, the car was saying us that one of the um, uh, things that will foster because they want to they want to reproduce this project in other um, in, in other wholesale markets in Italy and also they want to foster the production of these cans and make it more sustainable again in terms of the financing because now they are like quite dependent into like uh, the public sector finance so the idea will be also to create uh, companies out from this to make it really long term sustainable and uh, one of the, the things that they are expecting now is to have this level from, uh, from the government that is a, is a kind of fair trade level and will enable them to sell this in, uh, in normal uh, grocery stores and other retail markets, showing again the impact and the importance of legislation of multi-stakeholder, again, um, mobilization, where like uh, governments can engage not just in terms of like a pilot and financing concrete projects, but also of redefining um, the, the actual legislation in order to foster or sometimes also make compulsory uh, um, to reduce uh, the food waste and also to have legislation that will facilitate afterwards donation or creation of these kind of added values new products and they will give an incentive in order uh, to to make them more uh, uh, let's say, grow better uh, within the population. So um, why um, the conclusions that we can ha have, and I think out of these three examples, is like we don't really need uh, a new recipe. Sometimes we're speaking about, uh, OK, let's try to find out like a new idea. But we, we do already have really, really concrete cases that, as I was saying before, we have similar procedures within wholesale markets. So these concrete cases, they can actually be scaled up and the difficulty the difficulties to do it is uh, as i was saying before mainly in trying to have like more capacity building more multi-stakeholder engagement and cooperation and then of course this uh, financial support because the three cases that i said these are really su successful wholesale markets they are like they're really big and they have uh, today let's say financially speaking uh, like quite good outcomes uh, in terms of uh, the administration of the wholesale market so they have already an economical surplus to uh, be capable of developing this uh, this kind of projects, what is really not the case of most of <laughs> of uh, other wholesale markets. So in this in th this is uh, where like uh, the European Commission, uh, international uh, development banks can come, uh, and of course uh, national and local governments to uh, to bring uh, the financial support needed in order to develop better. What is uh, a bigger picture of also of the sector? Because I was saying uh, the idea, uh, of course, uh, this is where we're tackling one segment that is.
is the food coming to the wholesale market. But as we were saying before, this is uh, this is uh, the whole sector that must be um, actualized. And how can we find value in waste and promote really a circular economy strategy within the whole uh, the, uh, the the whole food system? So in this in these regards, uh, wholesale markets can also have and have shown to have in countries what they are like really modernized and upgraded. Uh, they have um, an, um, a level up upgrading of, of the inbound uh, inbound uh, capacities so re reducing as we were like seeing all this linkage in between the post harvest so farmer level to uh, the distribution centers so we when we have um, uh, wholesale markets that are like this in between actor in between the the farmer and the um, the consumers we can also have uh, better logistics better companies ensuring uh, cold chain uh, regulation also ensuring like better packaging and better uh, better better storage so actually um, we can work together uh, towards um, these kind of strategies and they are and develop a real systemic approach to food systems. So I I I, I quote some of the things that are like today missing. Uh, so I was saying like upgrading infrastructures is quite basic and upgrading together these infrastructures and these linkages that uh, reside uh, between the different segments and actors of the of the food system. We need of course more transparency and, and product traceability. This will give us also the possibility of developing like uh, new tools and uh, and digitalization uh this this is really important and nowadays when we see also the the impact of like uh, the rise of, of fuel uh, of course the, this have a direct impact in 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 food in, in the food prices but not just in the food prices and the food transport became really expensive and of course when this transportation needs to be uh, refrigerated with the cold chain is even more important to have an efficiency and we have also some startups that are doing a great work in order to reduce the time of, uh, of, uh, of distribution and logistical one from one point to the other and by reducing this time of course uh, we're giving more possibility more life to the products when is uh, when this product is being sold so this is like really uh, and of course uh, as i was saying before we need a uh, uh, innovative legislation so it's different incentives uh the 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 law firm of france uh in this in the I think the name is EGALIM, uh, is really good in this regard. And I know that now uh, the European Commission with the farm to the fork and with the different um, with the different supports as for instance, the code of conduct of responsible business, they are doing a really important work in order uh, to make this an European frame. So uh, what are we at WOM doing? Because of course we're not operating directly the wholesale markets. So we are, um, uh, the way we, we think that we can work because of course, as I was saying before, uh, wholesale markets are um, are most of the time really in in the daily operation. So sometimes they don't have time to look outside what what is being done to make networks with a really like a big uh, big organizations working in this uh, in this field. So WOM as an organization of fresh food actors aiming uh, to foster uh, the transition of food systems, we are providing this really important network of expertise, uh, which we exchange ideas, we uh, share all the best practices, we share, we create capacity, capacity, capacity building, not just for uh, the wholesale, wholesale markets themselves, but also for uh, other actors not knowing really well what is happening within a wholesale market. We have done capacity buildings that and, uh, and expert sessions with uh, different organization of cities like uh, ECLE or uh, Euro cities. Uh, now we work with the European Co Commission. We have partnered also with the food banking network and universities as the MIT uh, Farol, that is uh, the, the logistical um, lab of 
of MIT uh, in order to bring uh, more tools to the to the entire the, the entire sector. So uh, this is uh, this is the things, and this is why I think that it's really really important now uh, to gather forces and to join together. And as uh, to finish, I want to thank again uh, to all of you. If you have any questions or you have any project that you would be interested in developing, you can uh, you can contact me directly. And um, I want to make a small invitation to uh, everyone that is present so in the the from the 19th till the 21 of october we're organizing a womb co annual conference in abu dhabi so in the emirate arabs and you can visit uh, the website to see the whole program but we have the general director of the fao the general uh, secretary also of uh, un habitat and, and a lot of like a really high uh, stakeholders coming and the idea will be like really to bring uh, um, like so this super systemic and, and cross-sector um, approach in order uh, to, uh, to to exchange and develop these pathways in order in order to ensure the transition and foster the transition to um, sustainable and resilient food systems with uh, of course one of the the, the course of, of this transition that, that is food waste reduction because if we don't reduce the one third of food that we're wasting today we cannot really consider that our food systems are sustainable or resilient thank you so much thank you eugenia i, I just noticed there is an, some new entrant in the room who did not register but uh, that should be okay I guess. Um, Eugenia, this is, uh, this is really nice. Uh, I must uh, say that in, in the past 10, 12 years that I've been working on food loss and waste, I have a bit of the guilty feeling that we have always overlooked the wholesale uh, markets uh, in the value chains. Um, and, and that is not right, because uh, as you clearly demonstrate here, um, the wholesale markets have a pivotal role, uh, being a link between the producers uh, the farmers and the processors on one side of the value chain and the uh, retailers and the consumers on the other side of the value chain. And uh, the action that the wholesale markets can take to reduce food loss and waste have a clear effect on the same food loss and waste at, at producer level and at retail and consumer level. To give one example from the, the previous, one of the previous speakers from Copa Cojega, we heard that uh, farmers have a problem if there is a last minute cancellation of their orders. And then the food that they cannot supply to the retailer anymore is going to be wasted. And the waste will be on the account of the farmer, but the actual cost is with the retailer in that respect. And therefore, uh, it is clear that we always have to consider the whole uh, food supply chain when analyzing uh, food loss and waste and when uh, trying to find the right solutions and actions to reduce food loss and waste. And as I said, the wholesale markets uh, really can play a very crucial role in that. And I promise you that we will pay more attention uh, to that. So. Okay, then the, the next speaker I'd like to invite to take the stand um, is Mr. Nicholas Hamilton, Global Director of Sustainable Impacts at Sodexo, one of the biggest um, Next slide. Uh, Next catering slide. services in the world. Nicholas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Robert. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas Hamilton. Uh, I'm here today representing uh, Sodexo, and I'll present our approach to food waste, our Waste Watch program. Um, for those who aren't familiar with Sodexo, we're a food services and facility management services company. We're present in more than 50 countries around the world. We have 400,000 employees, and we're present on 30,000 client sites. And one of those countries is, is Turkey. We've been present here for, for more than 30 years. Um, so the first thing to say about Sodexo is that we aim to have a positive impact through and beyond our business and everything we do. Um, this has been part of our founding mission since the beginning, still present uh, today, and we aim to embed sustainability in all of our activities. Um, and as a major food services company, we of course recognize the importance of food waste. We view it as one of the most important environmental actions 
uh, that we can take directly as a company um, every day. We, we heard the, the, the statistics um, earlier today. Um, and indeed, we've been focused on this topic and prioritizing it for a number of years. Back in 2017, we made a global commitment uh, to reduce food waste by 50% by 2025 across 85% of our food sites. And we link this uh, concretely to our carbon target, which is also for 2025, 34% um, reduction, and this is a science-based uh, target. Um, and it, food waste, we view it as a key scope three reduction uh, lever. We heard the statistics several times today, eight to 10% of GHG emissions are, can be linked to, to food waste. And beyond these commitments, um, we heard it mentioned earlier today by Robobank, um, we have tied our financing directly to our progress on this commitment. So our interest rates are dependent on making progress against our food waste commitment, which means um, each year we report publicly, but we also report directly to, to a series of banks um, related to this credit facility. Um, so how do we make progress on this commitment? Um, our big Waste Watch, uh, our big program is called the Waste Watch. This is a global program uh, to take action uh, on food waste. And to explain the program, I brought along a video. I think it's best to hear about the program directly from our front lines, the people who are implementing the project. And this year we are featured um, by the BBC in their Age of Change series. Uh, which is a series that highlights inspiring sustainable development solutions around the world, and our Waste Watch program was featured. So I'll play this video for, for a few minutes so we can learn about the program. cooking started when I was just a child. I would create wonderful dishes on my own and I was so happy that I can create something so unique and that was the beginning of, of, of a long, long journey and I'm still here. I'm still here. Running a kitchen in a hospital takes passion. It takes an eye for detail and it also takes compassion. Compassion for the patients that you're feeding. Being in a commercial setting, commercial industrial setting, there is a lot of food waste, but however, that is relative to the amount of education that your associates have. Each day we have a huddle, we all get together as a whole, and we go over different areas, and a lot of that has got to do with food waste. Yesterday's top waste, we had uh, 19 pounds of, of waste. Our biggest uh, obstacle was hot cereal. Hot cereal. We have a thing here that we use as a tool, and that tool is called Waste Watch. The Waste Watch program that we implement here is an analytical program. With the associates, with the pan in their hand, with the products that are in that pan, they have to distinguish at that point, is this a product that we're going to use? Is this a product that we're going to throw away? It gives you accurate data that you can use for production. We implemented Waste Watch here in August of 2020. I was very surprised and intrigued with how easy that was for installation. It was plug and play. I was even more intrigued with the support team, the, the amount of reporting and data. It just continues to get better. We look at it and we say, okay, we've had this much amount of leftovers, we threw away this amount. We need to adjust our forecasting numbers. Food waste is a major and significant issue in our world for ethical, economical, social, uh, environmental reasons. To fight against food waste, Sodexo has developed a program. This program is called Waste Watch. It's about processes, tools, software, and awareness. We track the waste, we measure the waste, and we communicate about it. We try to educate our employees, our people, but also, and mainly, our consumers. When you start tracking, you get data. When you have data, you can change the way you produce in the kitchen, and you can start talking with the consumers. 
letting them know what is it they are wasting. And the good thing with food waste is that you can combine a business objective and also a societal and climate impact. 10% of our GHG emissions are caused by food waste. We have only one planet. And as individuals, as institutions, as companies, we all have a role to play. As much as we are impactful because of our size and global impact, we are only as good as the people we work with and the we partner with. We have several partners, WWF is one of them, on food waste strategy and carbon reduction actions. These partnerships give us a better understanding of the reality and how we can influence this reality. During the prep time, we count everything out because we know how many we need. I'm hoping the education that we are giving will give someone a conscientious decision of saying, hey, I've got the choice to either throw this product away or I don't. And I try to take the, what I learned here and take it home so the kids understand where we're coming from as well. I'm a mom of four. I do the four orders, and then I do my husband's order, and I do that to cut back on waste. I use that at work, at home, and do it the same way. I'm helping the environment. I'm helping the company not waste. So it's a beautiful program, and I'm happy. I'm happy to come to work every day and do what I do. This is our time, and that's what I told our team. This is our time. We are all here for a reason, right? I think that reducing our waste together and understanding that we're doing that and training our teams and has helped engage I think we must do more for the future generation. But also I'm very optimistic because the awareness is there. The actions are coming. More and more people are acting. I think there's still work to be done here. And I think there's good work to be done here. And hopefully it helps out future generations to come. So what I like about this video, in addition, in addition to giving a nice overview of the program, I think it's, it, it really show, and showing the potential for impact, I think it shows the, the people impact. Um, it shows um, when we implement this program, people at work are proud to come to work. They take what they learn home. So this is a, an, an aspect of the video um, that, that, that I really, really think is powerful. Um, but in terms of what the team explained um, and what my boss Patrick um, was explaining about, about this program is that, like has been said many times today, measurement is key. It makes the invisible visible, and this is the first step towards awareness and ultimately behavior change. And that's what um, reducing food waste in a restaurant environment um, is all about. I've put the summary of the program on the screen so you can see it visually, but I, I won't repeat uh, what, the team, what the team just said. That was an example of one site. We have this deployed on thousands of sites in dozens of countries. I'll come to um, our KPIs and, and progress um, in more detail in a moment, though. Consumer engagement, employee engagement um, is an important aspect of our program. Um, as I said, we have 400,000 employees and we reach 100 million consumers every day. And restaurants are a great atmosphere uh, for, for behavior change. So we're at a point in the value chain where engagement is extremely important, um, and, we, and we take that responsibility seriously. Um, one example um, is our Wasteless Week campaign. So this is every year in the month of October, so it just started, uh, just started this week, um, is our global campaign uh, to engage consumers um, and our employees on waste. Um, all types of waste, uh, so sites are able to, to tailor it for the types of services that are delivered on their, on their site, but the global focus is on food waste engagement. And on the screen you see posters and stickers, but this program is about much more than just that. Uh, we, we develop recipe books, wasteless recipe books, we organize learning sessions at all levels of the organization. We have on-site campaigns. We organize regional level food waste reduction contests, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this is um, uh, an example of how, of how we engage consumers. And we've been running this engagement for, for more than 10 years. 
Another key stakeholder for us were a B2B services company, so clients are extremely important. Um, an intervention like food waste reduction, as you, as you saw from the video, it's not a one-time intervention. It requires ongoing day-to-day -day efforts by our team. So to have that effort valorized and recognized by our client is extremely important. So what we do here is we several things, but for example, um, as early as the sales process, we already begin to bring this topic to our clients. We bring the various significant reasons to take action on a subject like food waste to begin to understand what are their priorities, what's resonating, so we can, we can find the one that works and then go further into seeing how we can work together and then get that into the contract um, because that's, that's what we see as the most effective way um, uh, to make progress. Uh, transparency and reporting is fundamental for Sodexo across sustainability topics. For food waste, we have two uh, key indicators that we report on externally every year to show our progress. The first is our deployment KPI. So we're committed to deploy our WasteWatch program to 85% of our sites. As of Q3 uh, this fiscal year, we made it to 38% of our sites. We're going to release our full year results uh, next month, and we made significant progress this past month. So the number we'll report in November will be significantly higher. So we have a lot of momentum in terms of deployment, and we, we feel that we're on track uh, to, to reach our target um, by 2025. The second one, in terms of reduction on sites that have set their baseline, this figure is at 45%, uh, which is fantastic. We actually anticipate that this number will go down as we continue to deploy at scale this program. As we bring on more and more new sites, that'll bring down the average. But as we see the impact of the program, we expect this number uh, to go up um, in the coming years. I think every single presentation has mentioned it uh, so far today. This topic can't do it alone. Um, it, it requires an ecosystem of partners. Uh, WWF was mentioned in the video, um, but we have uh, partners that help us in the supply chain. We have uh, food bank partners. We have food reselling partners. We have technical partners, um, coalitions. Um, I'll, I'll just mention, mention two. Um, Champions 12.3, um, our CEO, Sophie Bellon, is present. She was at the, uh, the meeting during Climate Week last week or two weeks ago and was very positive and energized by this, by this meeting. And having that level of engagement and buy-in from our CEO is really helpful in terms of um, maintaining the momentum on a program like this um, over the long term. So that's, uh, we appreciate that. The other one I want to mention is the International Food Waste Coalition, um, who will, who's present here and will actually speak uh, later this afternoon. Sodexo led and co-founded this, um, this coalition, and it's a coalition of primarily hospitality and food service uh, companies um, working together to, to tackle um, food waste across the value chain. One example uh, of an initiative is the Doing Good, Save Food, or School, School with a K program. Um, and this was resources that were developed to tackle food waste um, in a school uh, environment. So this, this is a brief overview of what we're doing at, at Sodexo. I'm very happy to, uh, to take questions if we have time for the Q&A or, uh, or throughout the day. I'll be here today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, I don't envy your position as uh, Sodexo, as caterer. I always thought they have the most difficult job uh, with regard to food waste reduction. Because think of it, they have to deal with their customers, the consumers, who are the real food wasters often. They have to deal with fresh, perishable produce. They have to deal with planning the meal preparations. Uh, a lot of the products have to be prepared in advance, while you never can be sure how many customers are going to be there and how much they will eat. So it, is, it seems to me like a nightmare. But, uh, I really, really appreciate what you shared with us and how you are uh, trying to handle this. When I came here two days ago, I had lunch at Amsterdam Airport and I ordered the fish and uh, the menu said it comes with a bowl of rice. So I told the waitress, don't put the rice because I won't eat it. She said she will 
tell the kitchen, but normally the kitchen is very busy and they may not see that note. And indeed, after 20 minutes, I got my food and the rice was there. And that was uh, going to be wasted. So, um, so uh, what, you, uh, what you are sharing with us was that indeed simple, better communication between the kitchen and the, the customer can, in a very simple way, prevent a lot of food waste. Uh, the customer, if, of, uh, of, of course, at Schiphol Airport, they had no idea who they were dealing with, but most uh, customers are not aware of uh, this type of thing. And if many more could communicate this type of messages to the kitchen, reduce the size, don't add this, don't add that, and the kitchen also takes their time to be alert on such feedback, then uh, in a very simple way a lot of uh, food waste can be prevented and there is no technology or difficult action uh, required uh, for that or so. Okay, we go to the last speaker. For, um, for this session, and that is um, Mr. Ferru Gurtas, Public Affairs and Government Relations Director at Tetrapak, representing the packaging industry. Thank you, Robert. And being the last speaker between you and lunch is not the best thing. <laughs> so I'll try to keep my presentation as brief as possible. So let me start uh, first by introducing uh, Tetra Pak and what we do. Does it work? How do I move to the next slide? So uh, I'll start with Tetra Pak and then move to how, te how Tetra Pak contributes to food waste and loss in terms of its processing solutions and packaging solutions. Uh, so first, Tetra Pak is part of the Tetra Laval Group, and uh, Tetra Laval Group consists of three different companies. Uh, the Laval provides uh, world-leading milking equipment and services and solutions to the dairy industry. Uh, CDL provides uh, packaging product equipment and services in PET, can, glass, and some other materials. And uh, Tetra Pak provides uh, processing solutions and also packaging, but specifically uh, predominantly formed of you know, fiber. Uh, so there's the main difference between CDL and Tetra Pak. Tetra Pak focused on fiber. Now, many numbers were shared to show the importance and the, the significance of the problem, and I'll just show a few of them here. So first of all, you know, one uh, third uh, of the food that's produced is lost, which is a huge number, and that was mentioned. Uh, 1.3 billion uh, billions tons of food was wasted in 2019, which contributes to $1 trillion. Uh, and then, according to the FAO, 14% of the food valued at $400 billion is lost from harvest up to you know, the retail uh, chain. But what is really most important or most interesting is if food loss and waste was a country itself, it would contribute to, uh, to the third largest you know, greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas emitter in the world. Uh, so as a country, you know, it will be the three, third biggest country that contributes to that. So the, these numbers are just showing you know, how important and how big the uh, issue is. And, uh, we need to get together, you know, as uh, academia, as governments, industry, to address this problem. Now, these numbers are also from uh, the FAO, uh, because I want to make a difference between you know, what is food loss and what is food waste, uh, waste, and how these are differentiated. So, food loss is caused by inefficient growing, uh, processing, and preservation. So, mainly, uh, these are happening at the in terms of supply chain, you know, the farming and growing stage, handling and storage, and processing and packaging stages. And as Tetra Pak, our processing and packaging solutions can provide some contribution to this 12% of the solution, but at the same time, uh, the right packaging can also contribute to food waste, which happens at the uh, back end uh, of the food chain, which is mostly on the distribution retail side, as well as consumption by uh, households, which is the biggest part, you know, 34% of the total, and also food services, uh, which was actually just uh, presented by Sodexo here. Now, uh, it's really important to address the issue as the industry, but it's, of course, very important to have 
a framework on the policy side and regulation side to be able to uh, bring the industry together and have some you know, common numbers. And also many speakers before me talked about the SDGs and uh, how the EU is approaching to this by setting some you know, targets and uh, changing you know, the date marking. Uh, so what is really important here is you know, uh, we need to make sure that as industry, we work together with uh, the policymakers to be able to first agree on common and achievable goals and then work together uh, to address these goals. Now, uh, if I want to talk about what Tetra Pak does in terms of our solutions, uh, first I want to focus on the processing side. Because today, uh, once raw ingredients arrive at the factory, uh, there are many factors uh, that are impacting uh, whether they make it you know, to the retail or to the end users. And these factors, if can be tackled in the right way, can really you know, have a positive impact on reducing food waste and loss. So first of all, you know, modern automation systems, uh, such as Tetra Pak's Plant Master, can enable uh, food and beverage companies and manufacturers you know, to track all the product movements in the factory so that they understand, first of all, where the problem is, how much food loss, uh, loss is happening at the factory, and what are the reasons. And then this data will allow them, of course, to create the right solutions. Uh, on the other you know, way, to understand, uh, the, uh, to understand and reduce food loss and waste, it's important to implement some uh, methods like total productive maintenance. In total productive maintenance, uh, it's a holistic approach that can be used by the factory operators to understand uh, where the interruptions are happening, what are the, you know, the stops and losses that are happening at the factory, and by using that data, they can also uh, minimize their food loss and waste. As an example, a plant operator may find that they are having too many stops and starts during a packaging processing, which then is really uh, causing a lot of uh, uh, loss of uh, the product that they are packaging. So by optimizing their stops and uh, starts, or by having a planned maintenance, they can really minimize uh, these starts and st uh, the, the food waste and loss that's happening at the start and stop stage. As Tetra Pak, we offer very specific solution. I'll mention two of them. We have a Tetra Pak blender VCC. It's a vertical blender that's optimized for producing cottage cheese, uh, and it's reducing the losses that's, that's happening during uh, you know, uh, production by 90% compared to conventional uh, horizontal blenders. Another solution is the low loss balance tanks that are mainly used uh, in the design of pasteurizers and UHT units, and these enable uh, to remove the maximum amount of water before the product enters the tank, thus reducing the mix of water and the product. So with this, we can also have a reduction of 50% uh, in uh, the, the loss of you know, uh, the liquid that's used in, uh, in the process. But what is perhaps more interesting is to reduce you know, the waste uh, by enabling the food and beverage manufacturers uh, to create uh, a nutritious ingredient or food from a potential waste. So I'll give two examples here. We are working with the Swedish startup uh, Angelzyme uh, to explore opportunities to reduce the food waste uh, and turn the uh, byproduct uh, to a usable you know, uh, ingredient itself. So uh, currently the collaboration is focusing on uh, converting large volumes of acid whey uh, that's produced from fresh cheese and turned it into an ingredient such as fiber. Another interesting uh, area is where we work with the breweries uh, and focus on the brewer's spent grain, SPG, uh, BSG. Uh, so BSG is a side stream of the brewing process, and uh, every year, 40 million tons of BSG rich in fiber and protein either ends up in landfills or uh, they cannot be used because of its uh, rapid spoilage. So by working uh, and utilizing our technologies, uh, such as uh, heat uh, treatments, we can preserve uh, the BSG longer and we can turn it into a product that can be used in either breads or uh, milk based, uh, plant based milk usage. So, from the processing side, if I move to the packaging solutions, on the packaging side, uh, there are multiple factors uh, that can have an impact uh, on the overall uh, preservation of the food. So, first of all, I mean, while food and beverage manufacturers have limited control, uh, on the logistics side, the logistics operators, they can definitely choose the packaging that they will be using, which will have an impact on the shelf life of the product. And by providing long shelf life to the products, we can make sure that the food is preserved longer. Uh, 
So at the most basic level, uh, the, the, the package must you know, protect the food, uh, pro make sure that it's safe and it's free, free from bacteria and you know, some of the other contaminants. Uh, a package uh, can uh, become a physical barrier uh, to, uh, that keeps oxygen, you know, water, vapor, and some of the other particles out. But at the same time, by combining packaging with a processing solution by using heat, for example, you can also provide shelf life longer than uh, more than uh, six months. Uh, another packaging consideration is whether the food needs to be uh, chilled throughout the you know, value chain. Uh, so packages that require refrigeration throughout you know, the transportation will be, of course, uh, susceptible to more spoilage if something goes wrong in the process. And that's why if we can provide a shelf-stable uh, solution that won't require refrigeration, then that will have an uh, important play uh, in uh, reducing the food loss during transportations. And our founder, uh, Dr. Ro uh, Ruben Rousing, firmly believe that a package should save more than it costs. That's our motto in our company. And we, we believe that by using, uh, by pioneering certain technologies like the aseptic technology, uh, we can combine the use of you know, packaging solutions, the shelf stable solution and heat treatment and can provide uh, sh uh, shelf life to uh, certain you know, uh, uh, food items that are more than six months. And that will really help reduce the food loss uh, that will be taking place as food loss uh, that will be taking place especially at the consumption stage as well on top of the packaging it's really important to also offer uh, the right uh, closures and also sizing and uh, by with our packaging solution and our equipment uh, we are offering a diverse uh, range of packaging sizes and closures uh, which means that you know the food manufacturers can choose the right fit for their customers and also consumers by using the closures in the right way uh, they can extend their uh, uh, they, they extend the, the food life longer and uh, they can avoid any spoilages. So overall, in summary, as Tetra Pak, uh, we are uh, on, on the packaging side, uh, we provide equipment and processes uh, to our customers that's helping them to uh, either prevent the food at the processing stage at, the fa at their factories or you know, by uh, applying the right packaging solutions like aseptic technology, uh, they can provide longer shelf life uh, to what they're uh, manufacturing. And then by using a, a range of portfolio items and, and the packaging and the closures itself, uh, we also make it possible uh, for our customers to offer the right solution for their consumers and for the consumers you know, to be able to uh, use the closures uh, to extend uh, the, shelf, uh, the usage life of their products. Uh, as uh, Nicholas also mentioned, collaboration is key, and uh, all the speakers before me also talked about collaboration. So what I want to talk to you here is also beyond the packaging and processing solutions, how we collaborate with the uh, rest of the market uh, to provide some innovative solutions. The first one is the Dairy Hub model. In the Dairy Hub model, uh, we work around the world with 54,000 uh, smallholder farmers in 16 different Dairy Hub locations. So the smallholder farmers to uh, our uh, packaging so to our uh, milk pr providers, our, uh, which are our customers, and uh, by signing up them to this dairy hub model, we ensure that uh, the smallholder farmers uh, can, sell their, can sell, sell their product to the uh, producers, and the producers have access to high-quality milk. As an example, Albania, for example, is one of the markets where we provide the dairy hub model, uh, and it's in operation. And in Albania, the interesting thing is 70% of the milk uh, that's produced uh, out of the 1.1 million tons is not processed. So in Albania, this is exactly where the dairy hub model can help. To the dairy hubs, the small holder harm, uh, the, the small holder farmers can get access to training, to uh, uh, financing, to secure markets, and with that, the dairy processors that are involved in the in the hub. Uh, they commit to the transportation and, uh, of course, the buying of the milk. And with that, we increase the overall uh, productivity uh, of the, the small farmers and uh, reduce the, uh, the loss of milk that can happen. So a couple of examples that I can give around the world are we have dairy hubs in Bangladesh, Kenya, Nicaragua, uh, Pakistan, Senegal, uh, Rwanda, Sri Lanka, Uganda, and the list goes on. Uh, as an example, in Bangladesh, for example, uh, the milk yields increased by 143% with the dairy hub model, and the monthly income of those farmers, the small farmers, increased from $100 to $144. The second example is our collaboration with POCA. POCA is a company that's offering digital solutions to the factories uh, to enable the factory workers with the right tools, technology, and data that they can use. 
So by working with POCA, we are creating a unique solution for food manufacturers so that the food manufacturers, the factory workers in, in the food manufacturers can use the right technology tools so that they can obtain the right data uh, they, they, and then they use that data uh, to prevent uh, the potential you know, of uh, food loss that's happening in their factories. So with that, we are, we are going to be expanding that solution to more uh, users. Uh, and currently, we are doing a pilot with POCA uh, to ensure that you know, the uh, solution works uh, in, the, in, a, in a very common uh, f uh, food or beverage company. And in conclusion, I really want to thank you for your uh, you know, presence here uh, and for those that are coming from abroad, welcome to Turkey. Uh, and I'll be here also uh, most of today and tomorrow and we'll be uh, able to you know, answer your questions if you have any of them. Thank you. Thank you, Feru. Um, I, I like this, this uh, last slide in particular to show how um, your industry is uh, organizing the workers and the labor force and other employees to set up the organization in such a way that food waste is uh, being reduced. Because this is coming close to what is currently being going to be developed an ISO standard on uh, minimizing food waste, which particularly indicates how the industry can organize everything that they are doing in such a way that food safety and quality is guaranteed and uh, food waste is being uh, minimized. The, the other aspect of packaging, which I, I don't think you mentioned, unless I'm mistaken, in that case I apologize, is the, the, the issue of the packaging size or the, the, the portion size in which the food is packed, uh, which is of course is also very important uh, with regard to um, uh, food waste at consumer level. But I can imagine that this is more the choice of the retailer who determines that and not so much the packaging industry itself or so. Okay, then, then we have reached uh, session two and I apologize for the delay. We are about three quarters of an hour uh, late and we are going um, for lunch and then we will, um, we will catch up uh, with the time uh, after lunch. Uh, so I hand, hand back to uh, Rushen for uh, lunch announcements, including the, the Robert. Location, location. Thank you, Robert. Now it's time for the lunch. We have a one hour of break. Uh, the restaurant is at lobby level, so it's just two stages uh, above us. Let's meet in one hour in this meeting room. And for the online participants, uh, it is better that you remain connected so you do not have to go through the waiting room. So, afiyet olsun, bon appétit, and see you later in, in this salon in one hour.
We're always together with our dear moderator, Robert. And the speakers of this session include Juba Marouashvili from FAO, Senior National Policy Advisor, Marit Nises, Economic Affairs Officer, Charge of Market Access from UNESE, Christoph Dixens, Global Public Affairs Director, Too Good To Go, Chris Desmet, Team Leader, Food Hygiene from Health and Food Safety Directorate General, Angela Frigo, Secretary General from FEBA, Özlem Hidjan, Technical Expert at the Economic Cooperation Organization Regional Coordination Center for Food Security. So I'm giving the floor to our moderators and panelists. It's up to you, Robert. Hello, Shane. Um, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you had a good lunch. Um, and we are uh, refreshed, continuing with uh, the last session of the last technical session of today. And after that, there will still be an, um, a panel discussion, a roundtable discussion. In this uh, session, we are going to talk about challenges and opportunities for food loss and waste reduction and zoom in a bit on the, the, the practical uh, implications of policy and legal changes, agricultural marketing standards, the, the rules on date marking and food security, etc. So. And the first speaker in this regard is uh, Juba Marouashvili, Senior National Policy Advisor of uh, the uh, FAO program in Georgia. Juba, the floor is yours. Thank you, Robert. Um, previous presenter mentioned about the difficulty uh, of uh, being a last uh, presenter. I had all of us had uh, a good coffee, and uh, I will try also to deserve your attention um, uh, 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 in my presentation. Um, it, is, it is really uh, uh, my pleasure and honor to speak today about the progress the, that uh, Georgia has uh, made on the way of uh, improving the legislative um, environment for the establishment of the food loss and waste reduction system and also making steps forward to support the uh, food donation uh, in the country. Uh, we can say that we are in the final stage, uh, final stage of the uh, drafting the uh, legislation that will be soon initiated in the Parliament and approved by the Parliament of Georgia. Before uh, we touch the main aspects of the legislation, allow me to describe the process of how we got there and what challenges have we faced during our work. For this, I have to bring some facts and also describe the baseline situation in the country, the con contextual uh, existing uh, context. Uh, what do we have in terms of the uh, legislation, in terms of the awareness uh, of the um, uh, consumers and the society? Um, prevention of the food loss and waste uh, is the topic where we need the full consolidation of the uh, consumers and the society. Without this, it will be difficult to build and develop the system. So there is a certain homework that we still need to do in Georgia in order to improve the uh, behavior of the consumers uh, and uh, uh, have more consolidation of the society around this topic. Um, in terms of the regulation, waste management code uh, regulates the biodegradable uh, waste. And there is no uh, definition in the code of uh, what is food waste, for example. Uh, donation in the country is the subject of VAT tax. Of course, uh, the charity organizations are operational and there are uh, governmental programs uh, providing the free meal uh, for the people uh, in need through the private companies. 
but this doesn't say much about the existence of the food loss and waste reduction and food donation system as such. That's why it is crucially important to accelerate the process and to uh, support the establishment of, of, uh, uh, of the system that will be supported by the uh, legislation. Uh, why Georgia needs the system to be on place? I think this slide clearly demonstrates and explains the urgency and importance of having food loss and waste reduction and food donation system uh, in the country. Uh, around 21% of the population living below poverty level, 9% undernourished, approximately 600,000 tons of food is wasted uh, the, by consumers, FPOs, retailers, Horeca sector representatives, and you can see the drop down of the food wasted by uh, different sector. Of course, the majority comes on the uh, consumers and the households, uh, the food service providers, Horeca sector, and also uh, the retailers. Um, plus, the state budget is spent to somehow the overcome the hunger and to provide a free meal uh, for, for uh, the people. But without this, it will be difficult. Without the system, it will be difficult to keep the sustainability um, of the process and to decrease or to stop the wasting um, of the food in the country. Actions taken by the FAO Georgia. Back in 2019, uh, we have started the process uh, and we have published the report with support of our colleagues from the regional office as well as the uh, legal department um, uh, of FAO. Uh, the, we have published and prepared the uh, report, uh, uh, comparative analysis and assessment of the food loss and waste and donation policies and legislation in Georgia. This report became a basis for starting wide range policy consultations within the Ministry of Environmental Protection and Agriculture of Georgia. Within these consultations, we organized a series of meetings. We were privileged to host the uh, European Food Bank Federation, Federation management uh, in the country and uh, to uh, share the first, let's say so, initial thoughts to each other, how uh, uh, Georgia could organize the system. Uh, the process was resulted in the establishment of the task force within the ministry. And um, as long as we saw clear need of having the legislation, at a later stage, the process was handed over to the parliament, namely to the Agrarian Issues Committee of the parliament. Uh, and the uh, legislative uh, dialogue and the consultations continue uh, uh, in the parliament. The preparatory process of the draft law that appeared really interesting and participatory uh, with participations of, uh, participation of the all relevant stakeholders from the private sector, non-governmental sector, the governmental institutions from the executive body, um, it was important for us to understand the possible consequences of uh, uh, having the legislation and what impact could this uh, legislation have on the different sectors of the country. So that's why we conducted the regulatory impact assessment to measure possible economic, social, fiscal and environmental impact of the, uh, of the uh, legislation. At certain stage in the process of the developing the law, we had a feeling that it would be much more effective and it would accelerate the process of developing the law if we could organize the study visit of Georgian delegation to the countries where the food bank systems operate effectively, where the legislation is supportive to the donation, and where the government is uh, f having the clear long-term policy 
how to overcome uh, the challenges related to the food loss and waste and how to support the food donation. Therefore, the uh, study trip was organized um, in Belgium and France and representatives of the executive as well as the legislative uh, body of the government, the private sector uh, representatives uh, had an opportunity, uh, mostly these were the decision makers uh, from the Ministry of Finance, from the Ministry of uh, uh, Environmental Protection and Agriculture, parliamentary committees, uh, the city hall, the Carrefour uh, uh, as, as one of the um, um, supporter of this uh, process. And um, it was important to see how the systems work in practice and what are the practicalities and how these uh, uh, practicalities could be um, replicated to uh, Georgia's reality. Of course, the study tour appeared as a booster of the process, especially when the delegation was given opportunity to see the different models, the regulations in France, in Belgium, to see the practical operation of the food banks, to see the role of the government, the, how the legislation works, um, and to agree, of course, that it is important to have the uh, uh, donation and uh, food loss and waste reduction system. Um, it is important uh, fiscal incentives to be guaranteed by the uh, uh, legislation. Um, it is important to have a support from the government and to have certain um, adequate role and in involvement of the government in the process. And we saw two models where, for example, in case of France, there is a strong direct financial support provided to the ba food banks from the government side, where uh, in Belgium uh, we, uh, we see much more uh, diversified, uh, uh, let's say, so source of funding coming from different donor organizations, uh, private sector uh, donations, and etc. Of course, we one of the findings for us was to see the role of the sectorial associations um, in the uh, effective op operation of the uh, food banks, and these findings were. Um, already reflected in the uh, draft law, in the final version of the draft law. Um, we have practically revised the um, draft version of the law based on the findings and conclusions that we made uh, um, uh, after this study tour. A brief overview of the law itself. The objectives of the legislation and the law is to improve the food security and nutrition and the progressive realization of the human right to adequate food, increase the distribution of the food, reduction of the food loss and waste, and prolonging the life cycle of the food to limit negative effects on the environment and the natural resources, to elaborate and implement the policies uh, supporting the uh, reduction of the food loss and waste, um, implement the awareness rising program uh, for all food supply chains participate, uh, uh, chain participants in the system. Um, the main actors uh, of the legislation are, of course, the um, donors of the food, uh, sectorial uh, representation of the, uh, from the horeca sector, from the retailers, um, uh, from the food service providers, um, of course, the charitable organizations and food banks. Uh, of course, the government and the parliament will have its role and final beneficiaries that will accept the uh, uh, donated food. Desired outcome of the law uh, is the following. People and vulnerable groups benefiting from the safe and quality donated food products and desired output is that is the following food donation in the, uh, uh, is commonly used and it is desired among all food supply chain participants food waste has been reduced and food security has been improved in the country the adoption of the law will be followed with the number of actions uh, and this is already planned and prescribed in the draft bylaws um, uh, that will be followed uh, 
uh, by the um, uh, approval of the law. We are uh, going to initiate number of changes in the tax code, in the food safety code, in the um, um, waste management code. This is mostly related to the um, uh, VAT release. Um, we are discussing some additional uh, steps to be made in terms of uh, reducing the um, uh, income tax and also improving the um, uh, waste management code and food safety code, of course. Now challenges and the lessons learned. What we have learned and uh, what challenges have we faced uh, during this period. It definitely was not easy and it took us more than three years. I see my colleagues here and we clearly, we, we remember the process very well. When it was really difficult to convince and to explain different actors in the process uh, about the, um, uh, let's say so, effectiveness of having the system, then that system could really work and about the possible benefit that the system could bring uh, to the country. Of course, one of the biggest challenge for us is to increase the awareness of the um, uh, consumers and change their habit. It is important that we have seen the political will supporting the process. Because without political will, um, it would have been practically impossible for us to initiate and to somehow develop the process. And we clearly see the strong support from the parliamentary as well as the executive wing uh, of the government. Uh, integrating and replicating the uh, international models, what we have seen in a Georgia's reality. Usually we see that um, models that are well demonstrated or, or presented uh, by the, um, uh, gov uh, by the con different countries, they are copy-pasted and uh, then, then there are a lot of difficulties uh, followed uh, by this copy-paste. So for us it is important to adopt uh, the, uh, whatever is it taken from as an example from the Belgium or France to adopt it to, to the Georgian reality, to the Georgian context and to uh, reflect it uh, uh, in the process. Um, it is clear that we need to ensure the sustainability of the food banks. And sustainability, of course, the financial, but not only financial, the, uh, the managing food bank requires special knowledge, special expertise, um, and we saw uh, this very well in Belgium, in France. So here we uh, uh, rely and uh, we look forward to continue the cooperation with the uh, European Food Bank Federation to uh, have the strong technical assistance and support to somehow uh, to see the um, uh, effective management of the food banks in Georgia. Uh, mobilization of the actors involved in the system, including consumers, organizing awareness raising campaigns, uh, consolidation of the donors um, uh, to support the operation of the food banks, and of course the continuation of the regular policy consultations, important, which is, uh, it, it is needed, because uh, we often see the legislations approved, adopted, but then the challenges starts with the implementation of the legislation. So that's why we uh, see the need uh, continuous uh, uh, policy and legislative consultations to ensure the effective implementation of the law. Uh, of course, the first um, task and first expectation that we have is the approval of the, um, firstly the initiation of the law, uh, then the approval, uh, continuation of the cooperation with the Food Bank Federation, um, changes 
uh, in the tax code, in the um, uh, waste management code, developing the food loss and waste guidelines, um, and also um, starting the policy consultations on the elaboration of the uh, national food loss and waste strategy. Well, derived from the above mentioned and the, uh, the role that uh, uh, we have passed uh, to, uh, to uh, reach to this, uh, uh, let's say so, uh, reality, what we have now, of course it was full of uh, challenges, it was full of uh, uh, difficulties, however, we now clearly see consolidation of all actors involved in the process, starting from the government, uh, executive and legislative wing of the government, uh, continued with the private sector, which is crucially important, the non-state actors, uh, NGOs, and plus we see also the uh, consolidation of the society as well, that uh, the system needs to be uh, uh, established um, which will definitely have an um, impact on um, defeating the hunger in the country and reducing the food loss and food waste uh, in Georgia. Thank you very much. Um, this was briefly my presentation about the road that we passed uh, uh, till the uh, approval of the legislation. We will um, inform uh, colleagues and all of you when the law will be um, approved and this will be I think the great achievements uh, we are there is a lot to do still uh, from our side and um, the cooperation that FAO Georgia has with the Parliament with the uh, Ministry of Environmental Protection and Agriculture and other ministries uh, makes us uh, to think that uh, we will have the results very soon thank you very much Thank you to Juba. Um, I am uh, extremely happy with uh, uh, the case and the progress in Georgia because Georgia is, apart from Turkey, which is a special case anyway, Georgia is the first uh, country where they actually start to implement uh, certain actions from the national strategy on food loss and waste reduction, which we developed together in an FAO project. And, um, and for instance, the, the study tour that you took to Belgium and France, to food banks and certain um, uh, policy departments, uh, that show again uh, how uh, we, uh, these countries like Georgia and others can make a good use of the advanced experience that already exists in those countries in the European Union and just replicate it or, and adjust it and adapt it to the national conditions uh, to, to uh, become operational uh, in Georgia in this case, and I hope that this example will make many other countries follow the, uh, the same approach. Then now I uh, proceed with the next speaker, which is uh, Marit Nielsis from the UN Economic Commission for Europe. Um, she is the Economic Affairs Officer, Market Access Section. Um, Next slide. So, Marit, please, the floor is yours. My pleasure. Okay. It's on. Thank you, Robert. And thank you, everyone. A big thank you to the organizers for this excellent conference and for inviting ECE to present our work on food loss and waste and the practical tools developed. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's very inspiring to hear all the examples mentioned, uh, not the least uh, the Georgian example that I'm just having the pleasure to follow. Um, so let me see if this works. Yep. Uh, so the case for food loss and waste is clear. Uh, we've heard these numbers already today. I mean, not, not only does it help increase the amount of food available, but it helps reduce the use of other resources. With a third of food lost, which is of course way too high, it means that one third of all the water, fertilizers, land, fuel and labor that 
is used to produce that food is also lost, and that has, of course, dramatic impacts. And, and it's conversely a big opportunity, because if we can uh, reduce food waste by half, we can kind of have emissions that come from agriculture or from the production of that food if we stay at the same amount of food produced. So, or we can feed better a growing world. Uh, so, to not dwell on that, um, fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, we've heard before today, they're much more amenable to uh, being perished. And because of that, it is critically important to ensure optimum handling of produce at all stages of the supply chain. Uh, it's of course also important to ensure rapid trade procedures, I come from the trade division, uh, awareness raising to sensitize consumers we've heard a lot about today, and, uh, and avoiding excessive orders, uh, cancellations, uh, so basically all all different actors along the supply chains has a critical role to play in reducing food loss and waste, in particular for fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, so what, what we're talking about and, and what I, the tool I'll be presenting to you is, is keeping quality. So basically it, it's about ensuring good keeping quality throughout the supply chain from production planning to harvest, transport, retail and on to consumers. Uh, so just a few words about uh, the organization I work for. I work for the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, and we have a working party on agricultural quality standards. And that's the work that, that I support. The working party has uh, four different groups that works on creating standards, developing standards on uh, fresh fruit and vegetables, dried fruit and nuts, meat and seed potatoes. And this work that I'll be presenting comes from the work, uh, the group that works on fresh fruit and vegetable standardization. So we have around 100 quality, commercial quality standards. And, and the standards are used by authorities to check products against rules, by producers to improve production, reach new markets, and by traders and retail chains to order confidently. Uh, they are voluntary standards. Um, but relating to this work, we have also been working on food loss and waste. And uh, so just a couple of words around the standards. So they define minimum quality requirements at export control. Um, and they're intended for adaptation or adoption in national standard setting. And it applies for produce for direct consumption. So that's why fresh fruit and vegetables. It does not apply for industrial processing. And they're developed in these, under this working party and the specialized sections that report to the working party with input from stakeholders, including from industry. And they go through a consultative and a trial process. And the benefit of such standards is that they provide a language to facilitate trade and prevent technical barriers to trade and increase transparency. So, so basically they provide a harmonized language allowing uh, commercial parties to order products with confidence and thus decrease risk in, in ordering and reduce uh, the, increase the understanding between the different parties in commercial contracts. Uh, they're also um, enshrined in, they can be used in national standard setting as, as uh, explained and they're uh, linked to EU legislation as EU standards for the 10 most traded produce uh, in fresh fruit and vegetables is harmonized with ACE standards and the EU standards for other products refer to choosing between the, EC, the, the EU general marketing standards or using the relevant ECE standard if the commercial parties so want. So relating to this work, we've been working around food loss and waste for the past seven to ten years. And um, the working party, or the, the specialized section on fresh fruit and vegetables, which includes experts basically on fresh fruit and vegetables, import and export, decided to work on developing a code of good practice for ensuring 
optimum handling of fresh fruit and vegetables along the supply chain. So these are voluntary guidelines uh, for all interested parties to work on be giving basically practical measures that can help them reduce food loss and waste in the supply chain. And it focuses on four segments, producers, traders, transporters, and retailers. Originally developed in 20, or the, it was first adopted in 2019, but during 20, 2021, uh, the working group worked already on, on the second edition of this, which is about to come out. It will be printed later this, this fall. And the chapter on transporters is new in that. And the, uh, so compared to the p image that you see here, that's the 2020 version. Uh, the 2022 version that will come out has this new chapter on transporters and it has also been adapted so that it takes into consideration the conditions in, in markets, not only in Europe, but, but in, in developing world also. So that's the, the, the aim of the second position, uh, edition. So it's a, applicable at producer level, trader level, transportation and retail as mentioned, and all countries and types of markets. And, and it's basically guidelines and recommendations for what these actors should think of. And the four chapters can be read independently, so one could see it as some duplication between the, through the, the different chapters, but that's, there's basically some repetition because some things need to be repeated in, in different, for different actors. Uh, but when you look at the code, if you see that, you will, that's because of ensuring that it can be read only one chapter per target group. And uh, to complement this code, we have been working over the past year to develop uh, on a pilot basis some illustrated leaflets. So the code is pretty pra practical. It goes down to um, practical steps on, on things like uh, temperature, storage, handling, things like that. Um, but we've been working on illustrated leaves, as I show you an example later, to bring that to even more practical level. Uh, so what are the key reasons for food loss in fresh produce value chains? Just to run some of them through. Uh, unfavorable weather conditions in harvest, damage during harvest, inappropriate handling, storage, and especially temperatures is a critical thing. Uh, that there's a bit of focus on, on in the code. Uh, inappropriate packaging, logistic and transport issues, last minute cancellation of orders can be a big problem in the sector because it could be difficult to reroute the produce and, and therefore sell it on time. Um, planning production, distribution without knowing the market demand, uh, stringent buyer requirements, price fluctuations, and uh, natural overproduction, referring to perhaps bigger, bigger than planned harvests. Um, so the code goes into all these different, uh, different issues like planning and giving advice around planning, around ordering to uh, avoid land late cancellations, things that can, can impact, that can impact, increase food loss and waste further down the line. And a an, critical thing is uh, optimal transport conditions. Uh, the code has um, annexes that outline, for example, the, 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 uh, the minimum temperature and, and the relative humidity that is uh, ideal for different types of fresh fruit and vegetables. It talks also about maturity requirements and about, uh, for fruit, for example, there are climateric fruit and non-climateric fruits, and, and if they are stored together or transported together, they can impact each other, they, meaning they can speed up the mature, ma maturation process. So basically, the product can spoil quicker if it's, if it's transported or, or located too closely to each other. So it has an advice around that, around harvest time, cooling, cooling before you go into transport, for example, because the transport cannot bring the, the temperature down, uh, not moving things, not repacking, reloading. So it's very, very practical, basically. Um, around stacking, ventilation, moving between, and also about planning for alternative outlets. So if, if there is, for example, uh, 
an overproduction or, or if there is uh, too much goods left, how to have a plan in place on, on where to uh, where to give that to or how to use that in the best way. And uh, around measuring, of course, also, because as we've noticed here today, if you don't measure, it's hard to manage it in the long run. And here's a small illustrated example from the uh, leaflets that are forthcoming. So you will see that it's, it's uh, it providing basically advice around the harvesting and post-harvest handling of different fruits and vegetables in groups of fruits and vegetables. So bringing it even to a more uh, specific level. Here you'll see an overview of the different tools that have been created. So the good practices leaflets and post harvest and post harvest handling are of floral vegetables, immature fruit vegetables, leafy vegetables and rich vegetables. So it's, it's for industry actors basically uh, to use as a practical tool for them uh, in, within their supply chains to reduce food loss and waste. Because if you, for example, have temperature damage to a product early in the chain, it might mean that it looks okay all along the way to the retail, but suddenly when put on the retail table, it doesn't last very long, for example. So that's why it's, it is more important than it might appear at first instance. And a final word on the first bullet here. The working party also developed um, in 2020, adopted something called minimum quality specifications for fresh fruit and vegetables. So while there are easy standards for the different fresh fruit and vegetables, um, that are used uh, in, in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, the idea with this is that for some markets that want to have a specification to refer to in trade, but are not able to have the, uh, or, or are not used to the standards, or are not able to have the, the kind of abide by these standards that are the normal fresh fruit and vegetable standards, this is a, a specification that allows for trading of to, to basically specify that it's of good eating quality, but it does not follow these class one, class two types of, of grading of produce. So it's, it's a kind of specification that could be used in perhaps more developing markets. And EC is also working finally on, on some related activities uh, that are related to trade facilitation. I mentioned the importance of facilitating quick trade. So EC has a a division that works on, or a section that works on, on trade facilitation measures and e-business standards to speed up, to help speed up trade. And for example, one uh, tool that has recently been developed is, is a functional specification for electronic conformity certificate management. So, so these are, are some of the tools that are being developed by colleagues in other parts of the division. So. Uh, with that, maybe just a, a quick slide to show that EC is an economic commission for Europe and it's one of the five regional commissions under the UN and it's the only one that actually works on agricultural quality standards. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be here tomorrow also, so I'd be happy to speak to you. And the code is available, the 2020 version of the code is available online and the 2022 version is available in text form and it will come out later this year in a nicer looking shape and I'll be happy to share it then. Thank you. With a, yeah, it was not my fault. I'm particularly interested in um, these activities from UNECE with regard to quality standards and code of good practice. And also that you zoom in on a specific sector, fruits and vegetables in this case, where, where indeed good practice uh, with regard to food loss and waste reduction is uh, very critical because of the perishability of these producers. Um, I'm saying that because myself I'm an, um, a great supporter of the, the concept of total quality management, uh, which is uh, using a lot of the ISO standards to, in, in the food industry in general, ISO standards uh, in order to um, secure a consistent um, 
quality uh, management in any food business operation. And I'm very happy that at the moment, um, or was somewhere last year, the ISO has started to develop a new standard for minimizing food waste. I think I mentioned it earlier uh, this morning. And uh, this type of initiatives, like the code of good practice that you have developed, uh, should feed into that. Uh, the, uh, you should, uh, if you are not already, then you should get in touch with ISO and uh, share your experience with them or so, because otherwise they're going to duplicate the efforts. The same what we are doing in our project in, um, in Turkey and in Central Asia. Um, we already have, or we are in the process of developing also good practices uh, developed by the retail sector themselves with our guidance and by the, I think it is the Horeca sector. Also those ones we, we need to uh, link up with you and with ISO uh, and put our uh, minds together so that we don't uh, duplicate uh, unnecessarily and uh, start reinventing the wheel um, each other. So it is, uh, in my view, our role of our project to facilitate and to make this coordination happening and so on. And I will definitely uh, take action on that. Okay, then I uh, go to the next uh, speaker, which will be Mr. Christoph Dirksens, Global Public Affairs Director of Too Good To Go. Christoph, go ahead. Thank you, Robert. We are supposed to start with a quick video, if you have it. Use by best before. Is there really a difference? Well, paint me green and call me a pickle. It turns out there is, and it's a pretty big difference. But half of us have no idea what it is, which means we're throwing away perfectly good food every single day. It all adds up to 9 million tons of food wasted every year across Europe, which is the weight of 1.5 Egyptian pyramids. Ooh, well, that's a lot. So, for those of us who don't know best before dates, simply tell you when a product is guaranteed to be at its very best. Store it right and it's safe to eat it long after. But we know it's not always easy to remember. That's why at Too Good To Go, we're on a mission to demystify date labels to prevent all that food from going to waste. Now to do this, we've teamed up with some of your favorite brands to create a new label. Look, smell, taste, don't waste. You'll see it on products with a best before date to remind you that when the date has passed, you should look, smell and taste the food. Then decide whether it's good enough to eat rather than just relying on the date shown. You'll often find it's perfectly edible. So walk the path of a waste warrior. And when you see a best before label, remember, look, smell, taste, don't waste. Thank you. Um, very glad to be here today and thank you to the FAO for the invitation. Thank you to previous speakers for um, some very interesting insights. We've been talking a bit about date labeling earlier today already, and uh, we'd like to add another layer to this and talk to you about this campaign we uh, have initiated. But first, let me very quickly tell you about Too Good To Go, in case you uh, haven't heard about us. Um, Too Good To Go is most known for its application, for the application we've created to save surplus food. It functions as a um, marketplace for surplus food, linking consumers to businesses that have surplus food. And through the application, consumers can go to their favorite stores and rescue magic bags of surplus food at discount price at the end of the day. It's really the simplest solution to fight food waste on a day-to-day -day basis. In terms of where we are and the impact we have as a company um, in the countries where we are, we're based in we're active in 17 countries at the moment, 15 of them in Europe, plus two in North America. We've saved over 166 million magic bags of surplus food to date. 
we have over 65 million consumers that have the app on their phone and nearly 100, 120 sorry thousand stores work with us on the app to allow surplus food to be rescued so talking about data labeling we know that there is a significant problem with the understanding of the difference between a use by date label and a best before date label which leads to significant amounts of food waste at consumer level so we went into this campaign with really looking at this one problem that there is is that as they are in the market today date labels are unclear they're misunderstood by consumers and they're also not harmonized for example a single product a similar product can have different types of dates depending on the country in which you are buying it so those problems lead to confusion with consumers and therefore food waste we heard about some numbers earlier today it's actually 10 percent of food waste in europe is caused by confusion over date labels and half or 50 percent of consumers don't know the difference between a use by and a best before dates so as we set out this campaign we designed three objectives for it first of all what you saw in the video was to design a label that can be introduced on the package to explain to consumers that best before products are perfectly safe to consume beyond the date if they've been stored properly and that they should rely on their senses look smell taste before throwing them away second objective was to encourage changes in retailer and producer practices um, to improve their practices uh, linked to date marking we've seen some examples earlier from uh, Ahmed from Danone some companies are shifting product lines from use by dates to best before dates we're also working with retailers on communication and activation campaigns to get the messaging that you saw out inside the retailers and the third objective is to use and harness the data and what we get the results from this campaign and really use it to advocate for change in legislation and law from the European Commission earlier was telling us that European rules on date labels will be revised shortly today I'm going to talk only about the packaging change show you a little bit the breadth and the depth of this campaign and how it or how we've been able to scale it across Europe in the last two three years so talking about that reach that campaign on date labels that seeks to introduce a moment of pause a moment of reflection and increase awareness with consumers over should this product really be thrown away or not is now active in, in 13 countries there are the, the orange countries that you uh, you see on the map and you see some of the executions of the of the labels that are now implemented on on products in uh, on shelves in supermarkets the slight variations between the different labels because we entered into of course discussions with local policymakers or national policymakers to make sure first of all we had the backing and the support and secondly to understand what wording worked the best in each specific country so in some countries we have a memorandum of understanding with the food authority or the or the ministry in some countries we have video statements from these same authorities supporting the campaign it really depends from country to country but it was important for us to get that that backing right now we have 462 brands that have joined this campaign the logos here are not arbitrary um, it's just to show you that it ranges from large food businesses like Danone, like Savencia, Kellogg's, Lidl, you name them, to very small, well, these are not necessarily small, but to local brands that are really more, that have more of a national remit within, within their country. We hear sometimes that it's a challenge for brands, for companies to implement uh, these visuals, these awareness labels on packs with this we want to show that it doesn't matter whether it's a, uh, a large global company or a small national company companies that want to introduce meaningful change to reduce food waste find um, the way to do so so 462 brands and this is more of an estimate um, to be honest but an educated estimate we think that around 1.7 billion individual packages 
contain this label now. It's impossible to show you that on a slide, obviously. Um, these ones, hopefully, you can see the labels a little bit. Um, we've tried in many ways to see. I mean, it's impossible to display this on a, on a, on a slide. Um, but what we want to stress is that it, that it is that it doesn't matter, sorry, if the packaging is square, circle, round, if the product is made of glass, of plastic, of metal, um, the label has been implemented on different types of packages of different sizes, different shapes, um, no matter the, 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 the execution of the, of the packaging. Turning briefly to, to impact, um, we did a, um, or we uh, asked an external organization to do an impact study based on consumer questionnaires um, for the impact of the, of the campaign with over 12,000 respondents. Um, when we did the study, we were only active with the campaign in 12 markets, not 13 yet, and we wanted to have a minimum of 1,000 representatives, sorry, respondents per country in order for the, the study to be representative. It was conducted um, between uh, mid-February and the 1st of March of, of this year. So 12,000 respondents, of which 16% have noticed the label on products. Now, 16% may seem like a very low number, but remember that this label is only active or available on a very select number of products, on a very select number of brands on shelves in stores. So if you take that into account, we think that 16% is actually not bad at all. It ranges to 20% for the highest countries, which are the UK and, and Germany. So 16% have noticed the label on, on products. Again, you see an example here. And of those who have noticed the label, 71% um, said that they're inspired to look, smell, taste the product before wasting it. And we conclude from that that there is a real willingness to actually do something at consumer level to avoid food waste and to really take a new behavior and a new habit and a new understanding of what date labels really mean. And also 67% say that the label makes them more aware of the food waste problem and are actually now willing to reduce food waste. So again, this goes to the willingness of consumers to do this and you know, what they need is to have the information and the awareness for how they can do it. I'm going to conclude with three takeaways to leave you with, which is, first of all, that unpack visuals really inspire consumers and raise awareness, but they're definitely not a silver bullet to solve uh, consumer food waste or even uh, food waste linked to date marks. It needs to go hand in hand with communication, with messaging, with awareness raising, with information. Secondly, these unpack visuals are suitable for food businesses, whether they're large or small, and thirdly, the unpack, vi the unpack visual is really implementable on all types of packaging, no matter the material, no matter the shape, no matter the size. Thank you very much. Thank you too, Christophe. Both the app to save surplus food as well as the date labeling campaign um, is an interesting way of combining consumer awareness raising with actual practical solutions to reduce food waste. Uh, and, and so that will, be, uh, that will have, uh, reinforce itself, those two, two actions. Really, really very interesting and I also uh, like to see that these type of initiatives come um, from uh, concerned civilians from the civil society uh, and then are um, uh, uh, well adopted by the, the private sector and uh, if necessary also supported by national uh, uh, policy and, uh, and uh, legislation if, if necessary. Okay, the next speaker that we are going to have now is uh, Mr. Chris De Smet, Team Leader, Food Hygiene, Health and Food Safety Director General of the European Union. Chris, the floor is yours. You come from online. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Are you going to upload my presentation or shall I do it? Uh, 
I guess uh, you, you can present yourself. Do you, you see my screen or, or not? Not uh, right on. I, I'm afraid. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Maybe you can enlarge it a little bit. Um. I, I will try again. J just a moment. Sorry, perhaps easier if you, if you could share my presentation. Okay, we are working on that. Okay, thank you. Um, so my name is Chris Smet. I work for the European Commission, uh, mainly on, 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 on food hygiene. And of course, there's a close link then to insurancy, ensuring safety of uh, food donations. Uh, probably most of you are aware, but actions or any initiative legislation related to food safety are decisions at EU level, so um, they apply to uh, all the 27 EU member states. Next next slide, please. So I will focus on my presentation on, on, on food hygiene and the link with food uh, donations. Uh, this is indeed a, a quite challenging link since uh, food is often donated at the end of the shelf life. And, and we know that this includes a certain risk. Uh, for example, the risk of listeria and rare to eat food is increasing with uh, at, at the end of the shelf life. And still, I mean, we want to give the same level of food safety to the people that uh, may uh, and joint food donations or, or, or get food. So we have to keep in mind that we have to keep the same level of uh, safety. An additional challenge is that uh, food banks of uh, charity organizations have limited resources. So they may not have um, the money to have, for example, quality managers to ensure uh, the safety of the food. And also uh, food business, and especially retailers may have to adapt their model, their business model, to contribute to redistribution of food as part of this uh, of, the, of the food business. Uh, so therefore, in the EU, we considered that uh, there was a need to give support to the sectors and to clarify certain uh, provisions. In the next slide, you see that already in 2017, um, we developed uh, broadly uh, guidelines on food donations. So there were, this was more broader than food hygiene. This uh, contained all kinds of experts with regard to food donations. It was developed in consultation with the European platform on food losses and food waste, um, which represent member states, but also food banks uh, and uh, all kinds of uh, private stakeholders organization. And the purpose was to facilitate uh, people for uh, not willing to, 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 to donate food because often they were a little bit reluctant because they did not know how to implement the relevant EU requirement on, on, on different aspects, food safety, of course, but also traceability, liability, and so on. So by doing that, by providing these guidelines, uh, our intention was to help them and also to have a common interpretation of EU uh, rules related to redistribution uh, of food. 
An important role in that was to clarify the responsibility of the food business operators and to draw their attention that they have a certain responsibility. They are a food business operator, and that means that certain provisions uh, on assuring food safety, which are laid down in the general food law, are uh, uh, applicable then. We, we we had to draw their attention also to food banks that they have a certain responsibility uh, in the safety of the products uh, that they uh, are, are handling. Next slide, focusing on, on food donation uh, specifically, a, a number of initiatives have uh, been taken. So when I refer to food hygiene, I refer to the prevention of hazards uh, rules in the EU, which are general, which are perhaps known at global level as the Codex Alimentarius General Principles of Food Hygiene. So we have rules that reflect this uh, global uh, principles or standards. So one of the things we did, or the, the things we did, was starting with scientific advice from the European Food Safety Authority, that that's a risk assessment body. To uh, we asked them to identify which potential additional assets we have to take into account in the case of uh, food donation. Uh, another thing we try to do is to promote food donations or so redistribution compared to disposal as food waste. Um, we also identified possible gaps, meaning uh, additional good hygiene practices that may have to be taken into account based on the EFSA advice uh, that we obtained. And we also looked at existing legislation to see if there were certain issues that were creating constraints for uh, food donations. So for each of them, I will give uh, examples. In the next slide, so the first point is this EFSA opinion was published in 2018. In fact, um, we had asked EFSA to make a kind of hazard analysis on for retail establishment. Now, in the EU, retailers are obliged to have principles uh, of procedures based on the hazard principles, which is not evident for them because sometimes they are very small business. Uh, and what we expect from this business is to do at least the first step of the hazard, hazard procedure, which is a hazard analysis. And a hazard analysis means that each that we expect our retailers to be aware of the possible hazard linked to their activity, uh, linked to a butcher shop, a fish shop, supermarket, uh, for example, to be aware that poultry may be a source of salmonellosis uh, and so on, and to be aware of possible control measures they may apply. These possible control measures are, are good hygiene practices. So the initial initiative was to help the retailers, but while doing that, we realize that it may be useful to uh, also ask advice to EFSA what if there are additional measures, additional good hygiene practices to uh, be taken into account in the case of food donations, typically by uh, at the level of the retail sector. And indeed, EFSA has indicated or, or um, proposed three additional good hygiene practices, one related to shelf life control, uh, another one with regard to handling of returned food, and a third one on the assessment of the remaining shelf life. I will, I will come back to each of them in the next slide. Uh, next slide, yeah, okay. But first, what we first did is um, we have a regulation which is mentioned here, 85T 2004, on food, general food hygiene. Again, this is mainly legislation laying down in general, for all businesses, so it's not sector specific, good hygiene practices and, for example, the need to have a procedure based on, on the hazard principles. So the, the good hygiene practices that were already in there since the beginning, since 2004, are typical good hygiene practices you find again in this general principle of food hygiene and you find in, I think, in, in every uh, guide for good hygiene practices. Uh, uh, certain recommendations of requirement on the construction, on the transport, on on water supply, personal hygiene, and so on. And what we wanted to do, we, had, we have introduced a new uh, good hygiene practices, which is specifically on food redistribution. This had two purposes. First of all, you see that we had already something on the management of food waste. We wanted to make clear and, and increase awareness that there is an alternative, an alternative for food waste management, which is food redistribution, 
Of course, we wanted to be sure that this happens in a safe way, and therefore we have introduced this section with a number of details that you uh, can find on the next slide. So, um, the principle of, of, of this new requirement on uh, food redistribution at retail had the purpose that the food business operator must ensure that the donated food is still fit for human consumption and is not injurious for uh, public health. Uh, they must do that by uh, taking some uh, actions. Uh, one of the things that you find there is that they should not go beyond uh, the use by date. Uh, well, the, I, I heard from the previous presentations that you already had some discussion about uh, the clarity of this 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 different nomination for uh, for dates. Um, the and the you the use by date is something that is very strict. Uh, you should never consume or redistribute or whatever food when there is a use by date. This is for food where there would be a substantial food safety concern. Like, for example, uh, fresh meat, you should not go beyond that or uh, you have uh, you may have a problem. The, al the alternative we have or the other possibility instead of use by is the best before or the minimum durability. Here there is more flexibility and, 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 and um, this is not just date issues for products like, for example, dry pasta. Um, where there's not, there would not be a food safety issue if you use it beyond the date, but rather perhaps a quality issue. And, and we have other foods in Europe where there is no date marking, and these are foods where it's obvious that uh, the consumer can see that it's no longer uh, uh, fit for human consumption, like for example, fresh uh, fruit or, or vegetable and so on. So we made clear, we if a product has used by date, you should not dis redistribute it beyond this date. We also focus on the integrity of the packaging that should be checked, on proper storage and transport conditions like the temperature. When the food for donation is, if it's frozen, the date of freezing should be marked, attention should be paid to organoleptic conditions and traceability has to ensure. So this, this is brief, put briefly uh, into, into legislation. In addition to that, we developed a specific commission notice uh, on uh, the food safety managers at retail, including food donations. It contains or it develops, in fact, the three additional good hygiene practices that were identified by the European Food Safety Authority. So for this three, I already mentioned them. The first one is on the shelf life control, where we try to explain to the consumer what I just uh, try to explain on the difference between the use by date, best before uh, date, and, and, and foods with no date marking, what it means in practice, how he should uh, take that into account in the case of uh, uh, redistribution of food. Um, there is also something developed on the handling of return food. So these are uh, often recommendations, for example, for food banks or for distribution centers. Um, I think in Europe, the practice on food donation is often that you have supermarkets uh, which have distribution centers and they collect food which is intended for redistribution. It goes back to the uh, distribution center and then it is redistributed from there. So there are, there are some recommendations there how to do that in a safe way. And then there's also something on the assessment of the remaining shelf life, and this has to do with uh, checking uh, visual checks of the food and uh, looking at the integrity of packaging, for example. Next slide. So apart, uh, you may not have seen the difference, but the previous legislation I mentioned is 852-2004, which is general hygiene. We also have a regulation 853-2004, which is specifically for food of animal origin. So we have a number of additional specific hygiene rules for food of animal origin, because this is considered as uh, a higher risk than, for example, fruit and, and vegetables. And then we had a number of rules where we, in fact, revised because of uh, food donation. Two examples here. Uh, in this regulation, in general, uh, meat or fresh meat that is intended for, fro for freezing must be frozen immediately after slaughter and cutting, because our consumers expect that if he buys frozen meat, frozen food, that it is frozen when it's fresh. 
our intention was to pre put, to prevent that at retail meat that is close to the use by date is frozen because it's not sold quickly enough. So therefore, in principle, we have uh, prohibited that because it would be misleading for the consumer. However, in the case of food donation, we realize that if you want to ensure redistribution of food, it may be more safer to to to, to freeze it instead instead of trying to redistribute it fresh because it takes uh, a few days a certain time so therefore we have introduced this uh let's say this derogation to allow freezing at retail uh, for the purpose of uh, food donations another issue that we saw is that we had an obligation to sell the axe within 21 days after laying we have extended that to 28 days so that is more time for uh, retailers to uh to uh sell uh, the X. So, in, in the next slide, as, as a conclusion or, or, or to, to sum up, what um, I would like to indicate that the, this is just an example of the approach we took uh, in the EU. Uh, it may be um, we don't have, as, as mentioned by, by Georgia, we don't have a specific legislation on, on food uh, donations or food waste reduction. We try to integrate it. Uh, in existing uh, rules like on, on food hygiene and so on. And we did that by checking possible gaps in legislation, for example, to introduce some new hygiene, food hygiene practices for specific for this uh, purpose of, of food redistribution uh, and by checking whether there were not specific restrictions to be considered to facilitate food donations. And the example I've given is, for example, the, the, the freezing uh, of food. So um, I, I think this conference is, is, is very useful for exchanges of experiences and uh, share views on certain issues. So I hope with this few examples that I could uh, contribute to that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you too, Chris. Um... One, one remark uh, I would like to make, which I find interesting here, is that um, I mean, when you start talking about um, uh, rules and regulations with regard to food safety, then I'm always very afraid that nothing will be allowed because the lawmaker uh, cannot afford to take any risk because if there is an, an outbreak of a food poisoning, then it fires back uh, at them or so. Uh, but still, uh, you, you, um, you showed a few examples where some kind of uh, reasonable flexibility is built in. So that, that gives a bit of hope that uh, also within the, the, the strict limitations of the, the law with regard to food safety, uh, the lawmakers are prepared to, to give some leeway without, of course, um, uh, compromising the, the risk of food safety. And I hope that this uh, can be built upon further so that it also can become more compatible with the, the voluntary codes of conduct and good practices that we already have been hearing about uh, uh, so, so that they can be allowed to implement their good practices without violating the, the official laws. And this is definitely something uh, for further discussion at some, some later stage. Okay. Now I'm um, uh, going to uh, the next speaker, which is uh, Ms. Angela Frigo from the European Federation of Food Banks, FIBA. Um, uh, she's going to talk about some important aspects of food recovery and redistribution and the pertaining challenges. Um, Angela, the floor is yours. So, first of all, uh, I would like to, to thank you very much, uh, Robert, for the introduction and to thank you uh, for this invitation and the opportunity to, to share uh, the experience of our uh, organization. Um, so, first of all, uh, a few words about the uh, European Food Banks Federation. Um, our organization was established back in 1986. Uh, we are based in Brussels, 
uh, and we are a European non-profit organization um, working in collaboration with 24 full members and six associate members. So in total, uh, we are working with um, food banks in 30 European countries. Um, some of them are uh, EU member states, but also European uh, in the uh, with a broader meaning. Um, and FIBA, uh, which is the acronym of our organization, um, is the only uh, EU and Europe-wide organization which coordinates and supports the work uh, of a network of more than 340 food banks uh, in Europe. Uh, as we already uh, heard uh, this morning, uh, well, the, the, the topic of food waste uh, is very uh, important and relevant today. Uh, we know that 1.3 billion tons of food are wasted every year uh, at worldwide level, and that 20% of the total food produced in Europe, uh, in the EU, is wasted or lost uh, along the food supply chain every single year. Um, so we know that food waste is also uh, a huge environmental problem. Uh, and uh, at, the uh, at the same time, um, according to Eurostat, uh, 27 million people in 2021 were uh, severely materially deprived, um, materially and socially deprived, um, meaning that they couldn't afford a quality meal uh, every second day. So we have uh, the scandal of food waste, uh, the environmental problem, but also uh, the social aspect of this problem. And our mission is um, a simple, uh, and I mean, it's not an easy mission, but it's simple. We want to contribute to this paradox of abundance and scarcity. And in this way, we want to give our contribution to the objectives of the European Union and also to the achievements uh, of the SDGs, in particular the SDG um, number two and the SDG 12, uh, the target 12.3. Um, so we daily contribute to reduce food insecurity uh, through the, the prevention of food waste and um, especially um, supporting and developing food banks in countries where they are most needed uh, in Europe. Um, so since, uh, as I said, and we started in 1986, um, our mission consists in supporting our members, first of all, representing uh, our members with European institutions uh, and also with international organizations. Uh, we are a member of the EU platform on food losses and food waste and uh, also of the subgroup on food donation. And uh, we contributed to the uh, EU guidelines of food donations that were uh, released and published in 2017, uh, as uh, Chris Desmet was mentioning before. Um, we are also supporting our members uh, sharing uh, information, uh, sharing good, good practices, best practices, and sharing knowledge. Um, we, are, we contribute to build their expertise and their skills, and also um, establishing partnerships with the private sector at European level. Uh, and uh, we are also um, trying, we try to also to, to grow our network. So fostering the creation and the development of new food banks uh, in European countries. And uh, I'm very glad that um, in the previous presentation, um, Zuba from the FA mentioned the visit of the Georgian delegation to France and Belgium uh, and uh, the opportunity that they had to visit uh, food banks and to better understand how they work uh, and to see uh, their activity in practice. Um, this is uh, the journey of our organization. Uh, so as I said, we started in 1986 with the uh, first food banks in France and in Belgium. But as you can see, the, the family of food banks and the network of food banks has grown uh, quite quickly and also broadly uh, across the continent. And um, here you can see the impact uh, of our network in 2021. 
Um, so uh, as I was saying uh, before, what we daily do uh, is really to respond to the double challenge of recovering edible and perfect surplus food uh, from food business operators, such as farmers, uh, but also food and drink manufacturers, retailers, the Oreca sector and the catering sector. Um, and then um, this food, uh, and this is the second challenge, is redistributed to charities, to a network of charities that uh, are providing uh, food aid to the most deprived in Europe. Um, as food banks, we are uh, a food business operator, so uh, we have to ensure the same level of hygiene and food safety of all the other food business operators of, the, uh, of the, our food system. And um, so we, we really uh, ensure hygiene and food safety because we want to, to give, um, because we, we want to take care of the food that is donated by uh, food business operators and that uh, we are redistributing to charity. So because for us, it's really important that this food is safe and edible for the final beneficiaries that will receive it. Um, the food is uh, recovered then, um, from the food business operators, is stored, sorted, and sometimes it's also repackaged in the warehouses, so in our food banks. Um, and then it's redistributed, as I was saying, uh, to charitable organizations that are, um, for instance, like uh, food pantries, but also soup kitchens, uh, social restaurants and shelters. And then from there, the food uh, ends up in the plate of people in need. Uh, so you can see here in these charts um, the figures of 2021. Uh, so a network of 341 food banks uh, that redistributed more than 900,000 tons of food. 60% of this food was uh, surplus food, so it, it was saved from becoming uh, food waste. Uh, for uh, It was saved from uh, ending up in, in the landfill. Um, and then uh, in addition to surplus food, we also have some complementary um, sources of supply, let's say. Uh, so for instance, the Fund for European Aid to the Most Deprived, uh, but also food collections in the supermarkets where customers can buy some foods uh, and donate these foods to food banks. And also the uh, EU Fruit and Vegetables Withdrawal uh, Scheme, uh, which is uh, a measure um, within the Common Agricultural Policy of the European Union. And it consists in withdrawing fruit and vegetables when there is um, an excessive production of uh, fruit and vegetables. Uh, these products can be withdrawn from the, from the market uh, and they are redistributed for free to food banks and other charities. And in this way, um, there is, uh, we can stabilize the, the prices um, on the market. So these are the different sources of supply. Um, and um, as I was saying, that the, the food is redistributed to a network of more than 45,000 charities uh, across the continent. And in 2021, uh, we supported uh, 11. 8 uh, million most deprived people. Uh, what I would like to also to mention is that um, this activity, which is really a daily activity, um, is possible thanks to almost 40,000 uh, co-workers and 83% of these co-workers are volunteers. So uh, what I think that it's important to mention is that, uh, well, our activity is possible thanks to volunteers. And most of these volunteers are people that are using the expertise and the competence that they um, acquired during their uh, professional career. Most of them um, worked in the, uh, in the food sector. Uh, and once they retire, they want to uh, continue and to uh, put their um, expertise and knowledge uh, at the, um, for the benefit of the food banks. Um, now, what I would like also to, to share with you today, um, it's a bit, uh, I would like to share some insights about the uh, current situation uh, of the food banks uh, today. 
Um, at the beginning of September, we circulated a survey to uh, our members to assess the situation uh, and in particular to assess the impact of COVID-19 in the period from the 1st of July to the 31st of December 2021. And uh, also we assess the impact of external factors such as COVID-19, the Ukraine crisis, inflation, uh, raising prices, uh, food availability, and also climate change like flooding, the heat waves that we had uh, last summer, and also wildfires in the first semester uh, of 2022. Um, the survey was um, filled in by 29 out of 30 members, so we have really a good uh, picture and overview uh, of what happened in the different countries um, in these periods. Uh, and the um, reports, so um, we analyzed the results and then we drafted a report which is available online and I invite you to, to read it because it's full of interesting insights and, um, and topical information. Um, but in, in a nutshell, um, and this is what I would like to, to share with you today, um, you can see uh, the evolution of food redistribution, but also uh, of the number of charitable organizations and the number of end beneficiaries that were supported by our members uh, from 2019 to 2021. And you can see that um, if we consider the figures referring to 2019 as uh, pre-COVID and 2021 as uh, COVID, um, you can see that we had we increased by 18% uh, the total amount of food we distributed. So it means that we managed uh, more food. We were able to manage more food. Um, and at the same time, we also had an increase of 24% of final beneficiaries. So uh, it means uh, that if we want to simplify a bit, um, we, uh, we were able to redistribute more food, but the demand from the charities was so high that we were not able to uh, respond and to um, to fill in the gap um, of this demand from the charities. Um, coming to um, to the, the present situation, um, what we uh, we have analyzed is that uh, in 2021, well, already in 2020, but then also in 2021, uh, due to the pandemic or let's say. Thanks to the pandemic, our members were um, um, had to uh, adapt their activities. Um, so they faced a lot of challenges. Uh, they faced uh, a growing demand for food, also an increase in the number of people in need, um, unstable food donations, the disruptions uh, in the logistics and in the transport processes, the lack of personal protective equipment, and also lack of volunteers and uh, unexpected costs and um, drop in financial resources. But at the same time, they were also able to uh, provide a concrete response to the pandemic. So they remain, first of all, they remained open and running um, even during the, the lockdowns. Uh, they engaged a lot of new and young volunteers. Um, they uh, launched fundraising activities, uh, especially online fundraising activities a lot of new collaborations and also advocacy activities uh, for public support. And uh, they innovated some uh, traditional models, also including the use uh, of um, technical support or IT tools. Uh, so they uh, digitalized uh, some of the traditional uh, activities. Um, then if we consider the period from the 1st of January to the um, end of June 2022, uh, what it's uh, important to highlight uh, is that, um, of course, more than half of our food banks um, have been affected by the war in Ukraine. And um, about 50% of the respondents to this survey identified the, uh, the rise in inflation as having strong uh, repercussions on their daily activities. So both in terms of uh, increased demand for food from charities, but also um, in terms of increased uh, running costs. So it's more expensive today to run a food bank than uh, six months ago. Um, 
at the beginning of 2022, what we can also see um, is that uh, the trend uh, in uh, quantities of redistributed foods by FIBA members has been deeply affected by the uh, Ukraine crisis. And we can see uh, really a gap in Europe. So um, the food banks in Eastern Europe uh, increased the quantities of food redistributed as a result of the solidarity uh, that they received from many food banks and also from many um, companies of the private sector that decided to help uh, Eastern Europe and uh, well in particular also Ukraine of course but at the same time food banks in Western countries uh, already experienced a decrease um, as regards the quantities of food redistributed um, and this decrease was mainly due also to uh, volumes of fruit and vegetables that dropped due to the crop failure caused by climatic events, uh, but also the fact that food donations from food business operators are falling due to problems related to cost and also availability of raw materials. Uh, so we can really see this um, big discrepancy between uh, food banks in Eastern Europe and in Western Europe. And we can see that um, today the situation, uh, let's say in, in general terms, the trends uh, as regards the quantities of redistributed food is decreasing uh, across, the comp uh, across the continent. So both in Eastern Europe and also in Western Europe. Um, at the same time, uh, what we also um, C is that, um, and this is another result of the survey, is that two out of three FIBA members, so 66% of our members, have experienced an increase in the amount uh, of food requested by the charities. Uh, so the food uh, which is requested is uh, higher. Uh, and uh, the, main, um, uh, the, the, the main groups uh, at risk are uh, families with children and also single parents, then followed by uh, elderly people uh, and refugees uh, from Ukraine. Uh, so this is a bit um, just to, to share with you in a nutshell the, uh, the results of this um, survey that we conducted and uh, that is published in the report. Um, and um, just to, to, to come to the, the conclusion and to share some, uh, some thoughts with you, um, we believe as European Food Banks Federation, we believe that, uh, well, for sure today we are living in a, in a context of uncertainty. Um, and uh, well, from our perspective, uh, food availability, but also food uh, affordability uh, is at stake. And so we should ensure uh, that no crumb uh, is wasted uh, while protecting the most vulnerable citizens from food insecurity. And to ensure at the same time that everyone uh, can afford uh, a sufficient amount of healthy and nutritious food, especially those vulnerable groups, uh, such as families and children, elderly and also low income persons. So we believe that food donation improves the resilience of the food system, uh, and we have seen how the food banks can support the food banks through food donation can support uh, the food system in a uh, in a, an extraordinary situation like the COVID nineteen pandemic, but also today uh, with the um, uh, war in Ukraine. At the same time, food donation is also uh, can also help our planet uh, and. Uh, contributes to food insecurity. So we should try to facilitate as much as possible uh, economic and social instruments that could uh, announce this um, virtual circle uh, and um, could also have a positive impact on our society and our community uh, in large. Uh, and so that's why we believe that while well, food banks and uh, food donation uh, is uh, definitely um, um, an environmentally sensitive and also socially responsible alternative. And it can really offer a win-win situation uh, to handle both the occurrence of surplus food, but also the support uh, to people in need uh, and uh, the, um, a better place for, for our planet. So I thank you again for your um, invitation and I remain at your disposal for any um, questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angela. Um, 
I must say I'm a bit surprised uh, by your last uh, comments in a way that I always assumed, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure about that, that food banks in first and foremost are there and established in the first place to provide food to food insecure people and that as an additional benefit there is also an opportunity to reduce food waste instead of the other way around. So uh, let's, let's keep an eye on that. And I, in this respect, I also would like to say that uh, uh, sometimes uh, the mistake is being made by uh, claiming that, uh, okay, uh, we send food waste to food banks. That is not true. We never send food waste to food banks. We send good food, surplus food, but good and healthy food fit for human consumption to food banks. Uh, to prevent it from getting wasted. So, and, and, and this could be sensitive, so we have to be clear about this. And at the same line, I also would like to uh, make a correction on, on what people have been saying in the past, or maybe still are, or, or may not been saying, but that, they, that the prevention of food waste, it, it is almost the same whether you send the, f the food to, uh, to a food bank or you send it for animal feed. That is also definitely not the case, because as I just said, to a food bank, only good food goes, and to animal feed, that is where wasted food goes. So, and, and this can be sensitive, and therefore we have to be, the, be very alert on that. But, but Angela, uh, you, you have clearly illustrated the, the, the widespread role and function of food banks in Europe, and how they indeed uh, can contribute to uh, reducing food waste. Then I go to the last uh, speaker of, uh, of today, of this presentation, of this session, uh, which is uh, Ms. Oslem Hikan, technical expert at the Economic Cooperation Organization, in particular the Re Regional Coordination Center for Food Security. Oslem, the floor is yours. Thank you, and good afternoon to all. Uh, first of all, I would like to state that as ECO ICCFS, we are very honored to be a co-host of this special organization and to be a part of this excellent organization. Uh, well, today I will give you information about the food loss and waste in the countries of ECO and the efforts of ECO ICCFS in this regard. Uh, but before starting presentation, uh, let me give you some brief information about ECO and ECO ICCFS for those not familiar with them. Uh, Economic Cooperation Organization is a uh, regional intergovernmental organization uh, encompassing countries from Europe, Caucasus, uh, Central Asia, Middle East and South Asia with more than 460 million inhabitants and over 8 million square kilometers. And ECOICCFS is the ECOS Regional Coordination Center for Food Security located in Ankara. Uh, as an organizational outcome, we aim to contribute to the eradication of hunger, malnutrition, and of course, food insecurity. In par uh, particular, I can say that we aim to contribute to the region's achievements towards SDG2 to targets, actually. And, uh, of course, we focus also to food waste and lost issues, which affects all dimensions of food security. Uh, well, I would like to begin with the sentence that you heard a lot, uh, I think, in this conference, and you will uh, hear. Uh, it is estimated around one-third of the world's food is lost or wasted every year. This fact also remains for the eco-region as well. In fact, uh, food losses and waste in most eco-countries are higher than the global average. As recent reports have raised concerns about the high level of food loss and waste in the eco-countries, especially in the food supply chains. As an example, uh, a rough estimate indicates that cereal losses in eco-countries reach about 30 million tons during the period 2000 to 2013. Uh, which is an uh, incredible uh, amount equivalent to sufficient food for an additional 3 million people each year. Uh, actually, the amounts of serious loss indicate the potential for significant gains if post-harvest activities were organized more effectively in the region. 
Uh, when we look at the food waste, it is mostly linked with the food retail, food marketing, and food processing activities. Uh, the scale of land degradation, water scarcity, natural hazards destabilize the agricultural production and yields, while the inefficiency along the food supply chains leads to large scale of food waste. As I stated, supply chains in the region tend to create large volumes, large amounts of uh, food loss and mass. Uh, in 2020, uh, situation monitoring in some eco member states reported an increase uh, in unharvested food left in the field with reduced uh, access to livestock feed and slaughterhouse capacity due to COVID-19 containment measures. In here, short supply chains uh, maybe uh, seem like a viable option to minimize loss and mass. But these chains are against hygiene rules as they rely on informal and open air marks. Uh, the underlying causes of food loss and mass vary depending uh, on country specific technological, economic, and social factors, including farmers' access to post harvest equipments or technologies. Uh, the state of transportation, communication, storage, uh, and in infrastructure, and consumer eating habits, uh, and access to food storage to technologies. For the region, uh, the bulk of losses in middle and low income countries, it is observed at the agricultural production, post harvest, and storage uh, stages of food supply chain. Production losses and food waste in ecoregion indicate a non-uniform pattern uh, in terms of the state of food supply chain development. And the regional trend for uh, food loss and mess reflects country-specific differences in the incidence of loss. And when we speak of individuality of the countries, uh, this graph illustrates the extent of available data on food loss and mess by country and commodity. Uh, for the years 2000 to 2017. And as you can see, the color uh, changes based on the amount of information available. Uh, so anyone can tell uh, what is being described of this uh, graph. It's a curial uh, truth for the uh, region. Actually, it is uh, described in Christ of data for the region. Country level data in most of the eco countries are so limited, uh, and this leads to a poor understanding of the scale of food loss and waste and its impact of food security. Only for two member countries, data are available for four out of five commodity groups, and uh, for the rest of the eco countries, it is for only one or two commodity groups, and it's mostly cereals or uh, potatoes. So what I would like to say is uh, having robust and updated data on food loss and mass is essential in order to prioritize efforts to address this issue. Uh, as you know, food loss and mass is an issue of great public concern at all regions and all levels. Uh, the issue not only encompasses the message of food, or agricultural production, but also the vestige of resources used in their production, and the degradation of natural resources, and also the environment on which production is based. Uh, so for the region as well as uh, the world uh, also, food loss and mass are an obstacle to the sustainability of the uh, food systems. And reducing food loss and mass is key to improving economic, social, and environmental performance of the food systems. Uh, for the region, ecoregion, and also as well as the world, food losses uh, and waste occur as part of production, distribution, and consumption activities. So it is critical first to understand the underlying causes of food loss and waste in each country. Then second, to quantify the actual losses and losses incurred. And to third, uh, developing and implementing solution-based strategies to reduce losses at farm, food chain, and macro levels. And uh, most important of uh, all, I think, uh, exchange relevant experiences among eco-countries, particularly good practices and innovations, should contribute to the establishment of strategies and mechanisms for uh, reducing food loss and mass. 
Uh, well, the challenge lies uh, riding the economic, social and environmental cost and benefits of different strategies and mechanisms and in determining the approach that best ensures food security, improves environmental sustainability and strengthens resilience to climate change in eco-countries. Uh, before ending my words, I would like to give information about Eco-Regional Food Security Program, which we have released this year in collaboration with FAO and the Eco-Secretariat. Uh, very briefly, in this component, we have four thematic components, uh, and each component have uh, priorities under it. And one of the priority is to reduce loss that food loss and mass throughout food supply chains in the Eco-Region. Uh, RCC's food loss and mass reduction priority incorporates the six areas of action. Uh, and uh, I would like to state that it uh, involves a holistic approach uh, with uh, all relevant stakeholders in the participation of all relevant stakeholders in the region for an effective solution. Um, well, the necessary actions require regional collaboration with regional priorities, in some cases uh, necessitating the assistance of national gov governments and institutions as part of a regional cooperation plan for enhanced food security and nutrition. At last, I would like to share eCrisis CFS interactive data portal address and uh, our social media address and mail addresses, so uh, please do not hesitate. Uh, to contact with us information records or uh, questions at any time. Thank you for the kind attention. Uh, thank you, Oslem. Uh, you, you showed us some, uh, uh, some information. You gave us some information about the, the countries in ECOSC, Central Asia plus uh, Iran, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. And um, that is exactly the region. I mean, the Central Asia region is the one where our project is now uh, developing national strategies of food loss and waste reduction. And we hope that this will um, lead to an, 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 uh, resolve this problem of data shortage that you mentioned with regards. It's very important indeed. Because one of the first actions to take once the national strategies are approved is to, to get better data and, uh, and do the measurement, et, et cetera, so that we also know where to take the, the right action. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, uh, we are going to have a slight change of thing, but first we take an, uh, a very short uh, break of five minutes, so please don't go anywhere or don't go far, and, and then we resume. So, sorry. Uh, uh, Rushen, uh, you are already there to, to say that, but uh, we'll, we'll uh, resume after five minutes.
Let's start. Okay. Distinguished guests, hello again. As we are approaching to the end of the day, uh, now we will organize the Q&A session together with our moderator, Robert. So we have some questions for Luciana Delgado, for Ms. Zeynep Özkan, Nicola Hamilton, Ahmed Suleiman, Thomas Kandeal, and Christophe Dirksens. So it's over to you, Robert. the audience, right? If there will be questions. Yeah. Hello. Is this, is this okay? Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, sorry for the change since we are uh, running uh, so late, uh, quite a few of our panel participants 
that were supposed to um, participate online, they, they had other uh, programs already. And therefore, now we decide to change this panel discussion rather into the, uh, the Q&A uh, uh, to answer the questions that have come up during the, the, the day. But before that, I would like to uh, give uh, uh, a bit five minutes time to, to Mark Candiel from the International Food Waste Coalition uh, to introduce himself and the International Food Waste Coalition and uh, uh, speak another, uh, talk a bit about another things that uh, he was expecting to do here. Thomas, you can uh, speak out. Hi everyone, um, so I work as a project manager for the International Food Waste Coalition, which is a non-profit uh, that is uh, working with uh, hospitality and food service sectors uh, since uh, 2015 now to reduce uh, food waste. And so the goal uh, of the creation of this organization was to uh, really enable this organization to collaboratively uh, tackle some common issues around food waste, like uh, measurement, like consumer engagement, and also work with their entire value chain. Uh, so to adopt this comprehensive approach that uh, maximize uh, your chances to, to reduce food waste. Um, yeah, so that's the presentation for IFWC. It's uh, focused on uh, European countries, and uh, we have uh, 10 members, uh, 10, 12 members now. We are working uh, together also with an entire ecosystem. For example, we have worked a little bit with Too Good To Go. Uh, we work with uh, organization like FAO, for example. We have uh, implemented a project together. Um, that is the good safe food and I've seen some materials that uh, are printed there to help uh, reduce food waste in schools. Um, so I take this opportunity also to uh, thank uh, Robert, Oksana and all the team uh, of FAO that organized the event and uh, allowed me to be here after COVID. It's uh, quite uh, appreciated to, to be able to travel again and, uh, and discover Istanbul. Um, but today, um, I, I started working in the field of uh, food waste reduction uh, back in uh, 2016, 2015 actually, and um, I've seen really uh, some development. At that time, uh, the main focus after the FAO study of 2011 was to be able to uh, uh, gather some accurate uh, food waste figures to understand uh, the issue uh, and also be able to identify the, the right levers and the priority issues upon which uh, we should act. And now I see that uh, we, we still talk about figures, of course, and we need that and it's uh, ongoing work uh, to improve data quality and so on. But I've seen also uh, this whole uh, discussion driving around collaboration and collaboration at that time was not operational at all. And, and now when you have someone that is uh, presenting um, uh, here on the stage, uh, for example, today, the initiatives that has been uh, run and the project launched and, and, and what is being developed, they almost never uh, say that uh, it has been done on their own within their internal um, um, borders and, and uh, organization that they have, they have uh, uh, worked uh, together with the stakeholders uh, to, uh, to work as a, an ecosystem. So I think it's uh, yeah, the most uh, first, uh, let's say, uh, takeaway from, from, from this uh, day uh, together. I, I understand the way we approach this issue uh, we've been maturing and, and actors are now able to really build scheme and build collaboration and, and bridges to yeah, tackle, address this issue uh, together. Thank you, uh, Thomas. You have been very modest because uh, I also like to mention that uh, with the IFWC, um, uh, what did you say, in 2016 or 2015, 
we already started uh, two projects, and uh, the one that was developed by the IFWC with their members uh, was a very strong um, methodology or uh, approach to reduce uh, food waste at catering services, um, uh, which, which has provided guidelines, technical guidelines, which are available and for anybody to use. And for us as FEO, very important was the development of the children education package to reduce food waste at home by educating primary and middle school children at school. And the package is called Do Good Safe Food and it is being rolled out now in an increasing number of countries, not only in the EU, but also, I'm very happy about it, in some countries of non-EU Eastern Europe and hopefully a few uh, Central Asian countries will follow soon. So this is all thanks to the, to the, the great initiative that the IFWC uh, took in those, that time and that is still uh, paying off at the moment. Then now I would like to uh, go through a few questions that came up uh, during the day. And the first one, and also the most difficult one, is for Luciana Delgado. Um, uh, and that is, um, the, 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 the Oscar says, thanks a lot for such a great overview of the definition of food loss and waste. And then the question is, why are wholesalers included under food losses and not on food waste? Or are, wholesaler, are wholesalers those that provide food to retail included under food waste from retail? Um, okay, uh, the definition uh, was made by FAO. Uh, so, yeah, why why they put it uh, in the food loss index and not in the food waste index? Uh, I think it's because uh, the wholesalers are at some point more connected to the producers and the intermediaries, uh, and the retails are more connected by the consumers. That would be my answer. Um, very good, very good. Uh, I'm happy that you say that because now I can um, provide the, the, uh, an expansion of that answer. Uh, indeed, uh, at FEO, we at first, uh, ten, ten, ten years ago, we developed an original definitional framework for food loss and waste, in which case food loss is accidental, something goes wrong and food gets spoiled, unfit for human consumption, and for that reason, uh, it cannot be eaten by people anymore and it will have to be discarded or sent to animal feed or so and we call that food loss. Food waste is a rather uh, modern phenomenon, especially in high income countries and that means that food which is still fit for human consumption is gone away, uh, throw, being thrown away due to um, economic costs. Sometimes throwing away is cheaper than uh, trying to save it and uh, send it to alternative sources, but also due to carelessness, neglect, or unawareness, especially at consumer level. However, for practical reasons, and, and because food waste mostly occurs at retail, horeca, and consumer level, and food loss mostly, but not exclusively, at uh, uh, food production, processing level, and probably wholesale level, for that reason, um, the term food waste was used for the, the, the latter part of the food supply chain and food loss for the earlier part. But strictly spoken, if farmers have surplus food and they decide not to find an alternative source for it, but they decide to plow it back into the land or throw it away, then that is food waste at farm level. And if in, in a small retail market in Africa, where there is no electricity, uh, the food stays too long and uh, gets spoiled. That is accidental. That is food loss at retail level or so. This uh, is all meant to confuse you all a bit more. Then, um, Sorry, Robert. It's me. Can I ask something? Yeah, Just sure. to jump in. I know I'm supposed to answer questions, not ask them. Do we not make this unnecessarily complicated? I mean, because we distinguish between food loss and waste, and then afterwards we talk about food waste, but we never know if it includes food loss as well or just food waste. Is it not just much simpler to just talk about food waste for the whole value chain? Um, if we enter this discussion, we have to add another two days to the conference. I, I agree with you. 
maybe at the cocktail we can talk a bit more about it. But I agree with you. And it is, it is something that we as safe food community at large, uh, the FEO, the EU, and, and the other partners, we have not been able to sort that out. I have so my ideas about it. And, but let me put it like this. It doesn't matter whether you call it food loss or food waste. And it doesn't matter whether you say uh, food which is sent to animal feed instead of eaten by people is not food waste. Uh, or whether you say that the inedible parts like the skin or the bones of a chicken and the skin of a banana, if you also call that food waste, well, it is not food in the first place. It doesn't really matter. Everybody working in their sector in their country or in, in their uh, supply chain, they should determine what, do they wa what is un unwanted, what do they want to improve and, uh, and, and try to reduce it, it over there or so. And if some people then use the terminology to say, oh, we don't have food waste because uh, all the good food we send to animals, so it is not food waste according to the, okay, but then you are a bit fooling yourself, I think. So. So that should be the focus that everybody should determine what are they going to improve and how, and whether that is then called food loss or food waste or organic waste or agricultural waste or loss or so, it doesn't really matter so much. So. Okay, um, for Zainab. And, and Robert, o yeah? also just uh, to be aware also of the um, organizational burden of uh, carrying out this uh, uh, screening of uh, food loss and food waste worldwide has been shared between FAO and, and UNEP with the food loss index and food waste index you presented. And so it's why also by kind of necessity we have two indicators that are handled by two organizations and so it's I guess easier to split to follow that uh, accurately. Yeah, that's true, but at the same time, these indicators, the, the SDG 12, uh, under 12.3, they are uh, not very, um, they don't have a very strong target. They should, should halve food waste and you should reduce food losses. So this gives everybody every um, opportunity to do the, the, the right thing and still say, okay, we have complied with uh, what the indicator uh, demands or so. Yeah, but you're, you're right in that. Anybody else would like to say something on this topic? Okay, the question for Zainab. It would be really interesting to know about the process by which it was developed. What kind of behavioral scoping, user testing, or other techniques were used to design Gidani Koru? What kind of research was done to test the power of this messenger? Uh, Zainab, I, I should say that the, the small joke I made at the end, that in my childhood time, little green men were used to scare children, say they were aliens from Mars, that was in no way intended to criticize the, the mascot you, you chose. So, so please be, uh, be, uh, be certain of that. Also. And uh, why did you feel that you have to make this explanation? You can also criticize because people, I posted uh, some photos of it in, on Instagram and people were asking, why do you call, named it as Jano? What does it look like? What was your intention, etc." So my friends are telling this type of thing, so no worries. No, uh, we, we, we showed that it was successful with the, <clears throat> with the communication with children, so we're cool with it. Okay, for the, for, for the question, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the, the person who asked this question, although I don't know uh, her or him. Um, <clears throat> first, I mentioned in my presentation that uh, what we did uh, was a kind of a field survey with the help of our provincial directorates. Uh, but it was on the, all along the uh, food chain, actually, from producers to consumers. And then afterwards, I mentioned two tests. Before beginning the campaign, it was the pretest. Uh, the pretest was a phone survey all around Turkey. It was uh, carried out by an independent uh, consultancy firm, who were, who was, uh, which was experienced in this uh, kind of um, surveys, actually. Uh, so uh, they have, I'm not a statistician, so uh, I'm not going to explain you how do they pick people, but they were people who were uh, above 18 and uh, they were asked some questions. For example, I'm going to give you some examples of those questions. 
uh, for example, like, uh, do you shop planned? Uh, do you read the date labels? How do you store your food? What was the late last food that you put in the trash? Uh, how do you evaluate your food, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Do you freeze it, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So, uh, those were the questions which were answered uh, by the consumers uh, in in the phone survey. Let me check if I miss anything. And then afterwards, after one year, and those questions we we actually. Uh, define the foundation of those questions. Of course, uh, the people in the firm also put on it because uh, we were working on food waste. And uh, what we saw also, FAA was also behind, uh, about, um, actually in front of us because there were those nine easy tips which you mentioned before, do good, safe food materials. Uh, nine easy tips to reduce food waste. So. Uh, from those tips, you can understand uh, what to, the questions to ask to the consumers. And then afterwards, I say, like uh, one year later, uh, we ask the same questions plus questions about the campaign. Do you heard the Save Your Food campaign? What do you think about it? Um, whom do you think? Ah, there was this question in the protest, which was also uh, asked in the, the second test, also post-test also. Whom do you think? Uh, the responsible body to tackle this food loss and waste issue. The government, the consumer, the, I don't know, the president, schools, etc. But mostly it was like Minister of Agriculture, which was uh, chosen by the consumers. So in the post-test, uh, I'm going to come back. Uh, in the post-test, there were, there were the same questions in the pre-test. And then to see the change, change in the behavior, and also a few questions, like four or five questions added to the post-test about the campaign. Do you find it successful? Do you find it useful? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then afterwards, another information. This is the thing that we uh, designed and assessed the success of the campaign, but also Turkistat, Turkish Statistical Institute, uh, in parallel has, um, has inserted um, food waste questions in the uh, uh, household budget, household budget, the budget survey. So, but they couldn't do it uh, due to COVID because it was the, you know, they, they were going to begin that year. And uh, now they are implementing this survey in the households. Uh, this survey will be also crucially important because it's not a phone test. It's a survey which, the, which our statisticians, national statisticians, go to the households and uh, carry on this household budget survey with the food waste questions. And it's going to be not only once, not only twice, but it will continue throughout the, uh, throughout the plan for many, many years so that we could see the, we see the, we could see the change in the behaviors. And then afterwards, I mentioned about the National Inventory Report, which the numbers come two years behind. So we have the number 2020. We will have the number 2021, which, the begin, which was the beginning of the campaign in the next uh, April of 2023. So uh, we have some tools to assess uh, the campaign or our actions which, to, which we combat. Uh, and prevent food loss and waste in Turkey. I hope it clarifies. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, there was another question for Anne Lohr, uh, who is not here, but it's about date marking. So I think that maybe Ahmed, you can say something about that, or otherwise maybe Christophe, you can complement that. Um, the question is, great to hear that the EU is actually thinking about abolishing the best before concept. I would be greatly interested what the implications would be on date marking in general and on consumption and on consumption behavior. Are there any studies or sources on this? Because I think Ahmed in your presentation you also referred to the date marking on, on yogurt and other products. Yes, I mean I, I cannot of course uh, comment on, on what the EU in, I mean intends to do regarding that, but I would, I would comment on it from our point of view, because in such context, uh, we, were, we were clearly explaining the big 
the big difference between the use by date and the best before date and how the consumers understand them sometimes in a different way. I think it was highlighted by, by many. So, I mean, if, if the reason why this is going to be abolished is, is to remove this confusion, then we can, we, can, we can start a discussion about how can then uh, this can be utilized to the best of a consumer message that we can, uh, we can go, on, go on with. But if the discussion is about, is about abolishing it for replacing the best before date, which is today uh, uh, a very clear indication of the quality of the product, because we are trying to, to save the food safety part, and we are saying food safety is non-negotiable, but as well the quality part is important, and the consumer has the right to take a decision whether this quality is the quality that they want to utilize as well, yes or no. So in such context, uh, it's a bit of uh, what would be the alternative in such case. Christophe, you have anything to add? Um, yes, I, I agree, first of all. Um, the key is, is consumer understanding, first of all. So, you know, consumer deserve to have accurate information on the products that they, that they buy and that they consume. And, and so it's a question of has, that, has the consumer been sufficiently informed and is the con consumer sufficiently aware of which behavior to adopt in function of the product that he or she is consuming. You're asking about EU legislation. There is actually right today in the, the EU legislation in question an, an, an annex called Annex 10, which also lists a certain uh, number of products on which no date label uh, is required. Um, there is also a question of should that annex be extended to include longer shelf life products, um, for example, uh, pasta, rice, uh, I think coffee, uh, products like that, products from which we, we know or we think we know that consumers are sufficiently informed on the fact that these are products that can safely be consumed for a very long time and so they don't necessarily require an expiration date. Um, and finally to mention, I would uh, maybe also mention that it's worth seeing that in the UK we see retailers, uh, some retailers are now consciously removing best before product, product, uh, dates from uh, fruit and vegetables for example. Because again, fruit and vegetables uh, are deemed to be products where consumers can for themselves see when uh, a fruit or vegetable is good to eat or not, um, and so that don't require a, a date specifically. The, 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 the question was also, if there exist studies or an investigation, uh, what would be the impact on consumer behavior or let's say on consumer food waste if this uh, best before date was removed? I don't know if there are studies, but I think it's the wrong way to go about the problem. It's, it's, it's wrong to remove the dates and then assess uh, what has been the impact on behavior and, 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 and on product safety. Uh, it's the other way around. It's first consumer awareness and behavior, and if that is deemed sufficient, then you can remove dates. But to the question, I don't know if there are studies. Okay. Um. Then a uh, question for Is somebody online raising their hand. Apparently there's, I can't, I can't see it here, but make, there's somebody online raising his hand. Can we let, no. Yeah, I did Chris Smith from the European Commission. Um, I'm not familiar, or I don't know the details what my colleagues are doing on uh, uh, date labeling, but I can assure you from the hygiene point of view, there must be a misunderstanding and we will never accept a total deletion of the use by date. I mean, there are a number of foods where we really have to protect the consumer and clearly indicate that something can be used a certain date and not one single date longer. So there, there must be some misunderstanding there. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for this um, addition. Um, and thank you, Nick, for uh, pointing me to it or so. No, 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 that's why now I'm going to get the next question. Um, 
the Sodexo employees in the video are genuinely motivated and that's really inspiring. Uh, they have what we call an intrinsic goal to reduce waste. They associate this effort with something central to who they are and what they believe in. Can we say the same thing about the consumers? Some certainly yes, but for those who are not intrinsically motivated to reduce food waste, it would stand to reason that education efforts would be less effective. Thank you. I think it's a, it's a great question and a great comment. Um, certainly, if all food service employees and food service consumers were as motivated as the employees we saw in the video, we'd be well on our way uh, to, to achieving our, our goals here. Um, to really answer that question in terms of where our consumers are at, I, I of course, can't give a, um, a, a data-based answer here today. First of all, we can't speak about our consumers um, as a single unit because of the diversity of context where we provide food services. Um, and certainly the answer is um, it depends and it's a spectrum. In some, in some contexts, I'm sure the consumers are just as motivated and aware as we saw um, the employees and in others much, much less so. Um, but I think I would like to give an answer and an idea that um, I think relates to the comment. This applies to food waste, but it applies to other sustainability topics if we, uh, Sodexo as a food service provider, want to promote any sustainability initiative on site, today it's food waste, um, having employees like that, being that motivated and that bought in and understanding, that's the first step to having consumers to be that, that bought in. Um, and I say this because in our context, those employees are seeing the consumers day after day. They're, they're friends with them. It's at your office canteen. It's at your school canteen. They have a relationship. So if they believe in sustainable diets, food, food waste, um, this is the first, then they're a credible source to bring that message. Um, and then it's, it's not just asking uh, a, a site manager to, to put up some posters. We'll never get that level of intrinsic motivation through those kind of interventions. So I think um, first engaging employees and getting this level of buy-in and belief um, is the first step to, to achieve the, um, the vision of the comment. I agree that this is an, um, a great point that the, the question asker brought forward. Um, and it also illustrates that in the whole food supply chain, including the consumers, everybody must be on board. Otherwise, we are not going to reduce food waste. We are going to relocate it from one place in the value chain to the other. So if uh, the caterers do everything to reduce food waste, but their customers, they, they neglect all this, then, then there is no, no, real, no real impact and so. And, and that is how, why we have this type of conference with all sectors represented and this type of programs where we really follow the, the integrated food supply chain approach uh, in this context and so. Um, the, I would like to check if uh, Bruno Menne is still online. Can somebody tell me that? Because there's a question for him, also a an, an difficult one. Not online. Anyway, the, I can say something about it, or maybe somebody else in the audience or in the online audience. Uh, Bruno was explaining, uh, if you remember well, uh, that from, from uh, Copa Cochega, the farmer cooperatives, um, was explaining that the, they would like to uh, have shorter supply chains in order to reduce the risk that food is getting wasted. For instance, farmers supplying directly to the retailer, uh, skipping the, the trader and, and the wholesaler and, and other, uh, or even supplying directly to the consumer uh, as well. Then the question, which is very good, is what to do with the other supply chain actors who might be left behind when we are moving for, to a direct supply chain from farmer to consumer. Does anybody here online or on the panel want to say something about that? I think that um, 
it's a, a long way before all consumers get to uh, source their product uh, directly, their food directly uh, from producers. So this question, we have time to prepare a, a, a concrete and pragmatical uh, answer. Um, and I also think that uh, it's uh, uh, very good to have both system uh, evolving uh, together so we don't uh, rely on um, one single model. Uh, we develop the more diverse models we, ha we have and I think the, the more, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, sustainable and, and um, uh, the more we can resist to different shocks that we don't expect that come. Uh, so, yeah, it's a, a way to, to have different systems coexisting and, and complementing each other, learning from each other. It's, a, it's good for transition. I, I fully agree with that. Um, uh, unfortunately, in our current food systems, and the increased urbanization where less and less farmers have to provide food for more and more urban dwellers. It's, an, uh, uh, it's not possible that uh, even a significant part of these uh, consumers can be uh, supplied directly by the farmers. I would rather uh, look at shorter supply chains in a geographical context, uh, that there is less uh, long distance export for instance uh, the Netherlands uh, is producing uh, uh, dairy products and pork meat for China that does not make any sense this type of huge uh, distance so if the supply chains can be shorter in geographical context uh, at least within the boundaries of a certain country if they have the, the resources to produce this food then you will still have an, a trader and a retailer to get to the consumer, but the, the long transportation distance uh, will not only reduce uh, the risk of food loss and food waste, it will also uh, reduce the climate impact of all this uh, transportation also. Okay, then um, there is the, the last question, which I think uh, should be said to all panelists, but I think that uh, I can also answer that to a large extent. It's from... Um, the National Farm Association of Tajikistan um, is asked if National Farm Association of Tajikistan submitted a proposal related to food loss and waste, will you support them in the implementation of the project? I, I can say yes, um, with a reservation of course, uh, I should not say yes too, too quickly. We, we have started just a, a project to do, uh, undertake a national food loss and waste reduction strategy in Tajikistan. We're going to start right after this conference next week with that work, like we have been doing in Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Azerbaijan, and Turkmenistan. We're now also going to do it in Tajikistan. Uh, and the project that provides the, the funding for this national strategy uh, could look into a proposal for Tajikistan to already start implementing some activities. Uh, so we can definitely take a very serious look at that. I cannot really promise anything at this stage, but uh, there, there is um, uh, from our side as FEO and uh, the donor from, for this project, which is the government of Turkey, uh, a strong interest to uh, expand this work into Tajikistan. And, uh, Tajik government has actually requested that uh, as well. Okay, then I would like to conclude with um, asking all six of you if you have some final remarks or things to take home for the night. Tomorrow we have another day, so uh, uh, there are still other opportunities. But um, if anybody still would like to, to add something, to say something that you didn't have a chance to yet, then uh, please let me know. Well, everybody is now eager for the, the cocktail reception. Yeah. All right. Then I, 
I just, uh, oh, okay. just, just one word on the global philosophy of uh, food loss and waste reduction. It's, uh, it's always a way to reach more sustainable food system and so a way to provide uh, everyone with uh, good, healthy uh, food. And uh, so when we are into the field, we, uh, we sometimes tend to uh, forget, uh, because we specialize, specialize on a specific issue, to forget that um, reducing food waste, it's a way to get this quality food that we uh, all want and to get this uh, sustainable food system. So yeah, it's always good to keep that in mind when we uh, invest a lot and, and work to reduce food waste. Uh, yeah, maybe a closing remark as well, and it ties a little bit to your last question on, on Tajikistan, is to say that um, legislation or through legislation on food waste, you can actually achieve a lot of um, change in behavior, in practices, um, in the area of food waste reduction. So since there are apparently countries considering this approach, I would make to please, um, the first one being to please consider the food waste hierarchy as a central system in any food waste legislative strategy being, being considered. Um, basically making prevention of food waste and redistribution for human consumption the top priorities and also the most easy and the cheapest ways of dealing with surplus food and making um, disposal and incineration really more difficult and more onerous um, as disposal mechanisms. That's the first one. The second plea is to please consider the importance of data. Without data, we can't measure. Without measure, we can't reduce food. Without measurement, we can't reduce food waste. So only with the data that you get on uh, food loss and waste, can you actually take meaningful measures? So food, wa food waste hierarchy and food loss and waste data. Thanks. Thanks, Christoph. Ahmed, go ahead. One, one last comment as well from my side. Uh, applying, applying what we tried to apply at Danone reminded me of when we started the safety, the human safety program. So I would like just to make the analogy that it started very shy and it required lots of buy-in from the people as we are moving forward. And as I, as I was saying, from our internal stakeholders, so from, our, from within even. And once this starts to, to roll, uh, it starts to really gain momentum. And uh, so it's, it's, it's always something, I mean, whenever we started a system, safety was one, quality was one before. I look at this and I'm seeing lots of resemblance to that. And, uh, uh, as, as we start step by step, it starts to really gain momentum as we are moving and it opens the door for other ideas to, to really improve food waste. So it's important to think about those baby steps at the beginning that we really need to walk before we run. And this is, this is, a really, uh, this is really the way we need to tackle it uh, because it, it, we, we, have, we have evidence that this worked with us before. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, okay, then now I would like to ask to put on the last slide uh, with my three points uh, to give you some homework, all of you. I see it here, but not yet here. Okay, uh, tomorrow on the second day, the last session is called The Way Forward, Plans and Perspectives. And we were going to take ample time of that, probably more than is in the agenda. Because what, I would like, what we would like to achieve with this conference is that uh, all of you, participants here in the room, participants online, um, make plans, action plans, what you are going to do next in the coming months, year, uh, to address food loss and food waste in the sector where you are working, in the value chain where you are working, in the country or municipality where you are working, 
whether you're a policy maker or an academic or a farmer or a food processor or a retailer, we, we, we like to know about your plans and uh, your action. And whether that is directly related to this conference or whether you, 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 you probably already had them for a longer time, that doesn't matter. But we are interested to know more about it. So I would like you to share with us tonight, tomorrow, any time that you have it ready, an answer to these three questions. Your uh, action plan or your ideas for an action plan to reduce food loss and waste in your country, sector or value chain. Two. For this action plan, what are the opportunities and what are the problems that you face or that you foresee in order to implement this plan? And then three, what support or collaboration do you need or seek from the safe food community, from the other people here and broader who work on food loss and waste? And then non-financial support, please, because we all need money, but that is something we cannot uh, provide in the context of this conference. We like to hear... If you want to implement a, an action to reduce food loss and waste, what support do you need from other people in the food system? The legislator, the farmer cooperatives, the, the wholesale markets, or anybody, the food banks, or the, the, you name it, the researchers. So if you can note down these questions, and you can respond in Slack, or you can uh, send us an email, or you can put it uh, tomorrow in the, in the uh, Zoom uh, question and answer chat box. Anyway, let it get to us, and then uh, in the course of the day tomorrow, we make a selection, and uh, we are going to ask you uh, if you could uh, present your plan during the last session, and we probably can have some further talk and questions and discussion about it. Maybe we can select four or five people who submitted. And I'm sure that more than 100 people are going to submit something, so we have to make a very uh, strict uh, selection in this, in this respect or so. Okay, and then now I would like to give back to uh, Roshane um, for the, uh, the closure of the first day of this conference. Thank you, Robert, for the privilege. Honorable delegates, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, our panelists, our moderator, and of course our online panelists and uh, people who stayed with us until this time. Uh, we would like to extend gratitude. Uh, the day has been packed with very dense information, ideas, and food for thought this time. So. Your enthusiasm made the day a success, and I would like to invite you all to join us uh, in a cocktail reception in the foyer of this building from 7 o'clock onwards. So in a half an hour, it's just uh, the foyer uh, next to this meeting room. So the day one of this conference is now over, and we, will, we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow in the same time, uh, in the same meeting room. And see you all tomorrow, and have a nice evening. Thank you.